Che. A memoir by Fidel Castro. Contents. Echo Beto Che Guevara. Fidel Castro. Note for the second edition. Chronology. Preface. Jesus Montaigne. Introduction. David Deutschman. Chapter 1. On Che's Absence. October 3, 1965. Chapter 2. Confirmation of Che's Death in Bolivia. October 15, 1967. Chapter 3. Memorial for Che Guevara. October 18, 1967. Chapter 4. A Necessary Introduction. 1968. Chapter 5. On the Publication of Che's Bolivian Diary. July 4, 1968. Chapter 6. Reflections on Che. Chile 1971. Chapter 7. I Still Dream of Che. 1987. Chapter 8. 20th Anniversary of Che's Death. October 8, 1987. Chapter 9. Interview with Dimash Borga. 1992. Chapter 10. On the Return of Che's Remains to Cuba. October 17, 1997. Chapter 11. An Extraordinary Personality. Argentina 2003. Glossary. Echo Beto Che Guevara. One of Time Magazine's icons of the century, Echo Beto Guevara de la Serna was born in Rosario, Argentina, on June 14, 1928. He made several trips around Latin America during and immediately after his studies at medical school in Buenos Aires, including his 1952 journey with Alberto Granado, on the unreliable Norton motorbike described in his travel journal The Motorcycle Diaries. He was already becoming involved in political activity and living in Guatemala when, in 1954, the elected government of Jacobo Arbenz was overthrown in a CIA-organized military operation. Echo Beto escaped to Mexico, profoundly radicalized. Following up on a contact made in Guatemala, Guevara sought out the group of exiled Cuban revolutionaries in Mexico City. In July 1955, he met Fidel Castro and immediately enlisted in the guerrilla expedition to overthrow Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista. The Cubans nicknamed him Che, a popular form of address in Argentina. On November 25, 1956, Che Guevara set sail for Cuba aboard the yacht Granma as the doctor to the guerrilla group that began the revolutionary armed struggle in Cuba Sierra Maestra Mountains. Within several months, he was named by Fidel Castro as the first rebel army commander, though he continued ministering medically to wounded guerrilla fighters and captured soldiers from Batista's army. In September 1958, Che Guevara played a decisive role in the military defeat of Batista after he and Camilo Cienfuegos led separate guerrilla columns westward from the Sierra Maestra, later described in his book Reminiscences of the Cuban Revolutionary War. After Batista fled on January 1, 1959, Che Guevara became a key leader of the new revolutionary government, first as head of the Department of Industry of the National Institute of Agrarian Reform, then as president of the National Bank. In February 1961 he became Minister of Industry. He was also a central leader of the political organization that in 1965 became the Communist Party of Cuba. Apart from these responsibilities, Che Guevara often represented the Cuban revolutionary government around the world, heading numerous delegations and speaking at the United Nations and other international forums in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the socialist bloc countries. He earned a reputation as a passionate and articulate spokesperson for third world peoples, most famously at the 1961 conference at Punta del Este in Uruguay, where he denounced U.S. President Kennedy's Alliance for Progress. As had been his intention since joining the Cuban Revolutionary Movement, Che Guevara left Cuba in April 1965, initially to lead a Cuban organized guerrilla mission to support the revolutionary struggle in the Congo. He returned to Cuba secretly in December 1965, to prepare another Cuban organized guerrilla force for Bolivia. 
Arriving in Bolivia in November 1966, Che Guevara's plan was to challenge that country's military dictatorship and eventually to instigate a revolutionary movement that would extend throughout the continent of Latin America. He was wounded and captured by us trained and run Bolivian counterinsurgency troops on October 8, 1967. The following day he was murdered and his body hidden. The diary he wrote during this period became known as the Bolivian Diary. Che Guevara's remains were finally discovered in 1997 and returned to Cuba. A memorial was built at Santa Clara in central Cuba, where he had won a major military battle during the Revolutionary War. Fidel Castro Fidel Castro Ruz was born in Byron, in the former province of Orient, on August 13, 1926. Born into a well-off Landowning family, he received his primary education in a rural school, later attended private Jesuit schools in Santiago de Cuba and Havana, and graduated from law school at the University of Havana. While at university, he joined a student group against political corruption. He was a member of the Cuban People's Party, also known as the Orthodox Party, in 1947 and became a leader of its left wing. That same year, he volunteered for an armed expedition against the Trujillo dictatorship in the Dominican Republic, the expeditionaries were unable to leave Cuba to carry out their plans. As a student leader, Fidel Castro was in Colombia to help organize a Latin American anti-imperialist student congress and participated in the April 1948 popular uprising in Bogota. After Fulgencio Batista's coup d'état of March 10, 1952, Fidel Castro began to organize a revolutionary organization to initiate armed insurrection against the Usbek Batista dictatorship. He organized and led an unsuccessful attack on the Moncada army garrison in Santiago de Cuba on July 26, 1953, for which he and over two dozen others were captured, tried, found guilty, and imprisoned. More than 60 revolutionaries were murdered by Batista's army during and immediately after the Moncada attack. While in prison, Fidel Castro edited his defense speech from the trial into the pamphlet History Will Absolve Me, which was distributed in tens of thousands of copies and became the program of what was to become the July 26 movement. Originally sentenced to 15 years, he and his comrades were released from prison 22 months later, in May 1955, as a result of a growing public campaign. On July 7, 1955, Fidel Castro left for Mexico, where he began to organize a guerrilla expedition to Cuba to launch the armed insurrection. On December 2, 1956, along with 81 other fighters, including his brother Raul, Che Guevara, Camilo Cienfuegos, Juan Almeida, and Jesus Montaigne, Fidel reached the Cuban coast aboard the cabin cruiser Granma. For the next two years, Fidel Castro directed the operations of the rebel army, in addition to continuing as central leader of the July 26 movement. After an initial setback, the guerrillas were able to reorganize their forces and by late 1958 had successfully extended the struggle from the Sierra Maestra Mountains to the heart of the island. On January 1, 1959, Batista fled Cuba. In response to a call by Fidel, hundreds of thousands of Cubans launched an insurrectionary general strike that ensured the victory of the revolution. Fidel Castro arrived triumphantly in Havana on January 8 as commander-in-chief of Cuba's victorious rebel army. On February 13, 1959, he was named prime minister, a position he held until December 1976, when he became president of the Council of State and the Council of Ministers. He has been first secretary of the Central Committee of the Cuban Communist Party since its founding in 1965. Note for the second edition. Who is in a better position than Fidel Castro to write about Che Guevara the man and the revolutionary? Theirs was a historic partnership that transformed the face of Latin America and had a huge and lasting impact throughout the world. This selection of writings, interviews, and speeches by Fidel, is therefore as close to the classic political biography of Che that can and ever will be published. The campaign to divide the ideas and personalities of Che Guevara and Fidel Castro has never really ceased, and has been reinforced in several recent biographies of the Argentine revolutionary. 
Indeed, every effort has been made to separate Che from the dramatic and audacious project of the Cuban Revolution. Understanding the Cuban Revolution in its own context and recognizing its unique characteristics putting aside any fixed schemes is the challenge facing all those who seek to analyze Cuba today. And understanding the extraordinary bond between Fidel Castro and Che Guevara is also essential to this task. In this respect, this memoir reveals as much about the author as it does about the subject and the relationship between the two individuals. When interviewed in 1987, around the time of the 20th anniversary of Che's death in Bolivia, Fidel acknowledged that there were still many chapters of this history to be written. What is missing is someone to write them, because those who can write them don't have the time to do so. In that interview Fidel revealed the great sense of loss he felt with Che's death. Ten years later, this sentiment was expressed with even greater intensity on the return to Cuba in 1997 of the remains of Che and the other guerrilla fighters killed in Bolivia, see Chapter 10 of this book. Looking at the small casket, Fidel wondered, how can Che fit beneath a memorial stone? How can he fit into this square? How can he fit into our beloved, but small, island? Only in the world that he dreamed of, which he lived and fought for, is there enough space for him? A combatant may die, but not their ideas, Fidel observed. Now he is, everywhere, wherever there is a just cause to defend. Those who wanted to kill him, to make him disappear, were not able to understand that he would leave an indelible footprint in history and that his luminous prophet's gaze would transform him into a symbol for all the Earth's poor in their millions upon millions. This book, above all, helps to recover the revolutionary content of Che's ideas and example, beyond the iconic image on the posters and t-shirts. Since the first edition of this book more than a decade ago, a major publishing project was initiated by the Che Guevara Studies Center of Havana, Cuba, and Ocean Press. The goal of the project is to publish the works of Ecobedo Che Guevara Che in his own words. The project will consist of almost 20 titles, including Che Guevara's classic works as well as thematic anthologies, along with unpublished manuscripts and much unpublished material. It is an unprecedented publishing and political endeavor. Fidel's memoir of Che, in this new expanded edition, is the natural complement to the works of Che Guevara. Neither can be fully understood without the other. David Deutschman, April 2006 Chronology of Echo Beto Che Guevara June 14, 1928 Echo Beto Guevara is born in Rosario, Argentina, of parents Echo Beto Guevara Lynch and Celia de la Serna, he will be the eldest of five children. January, July 1952 Echo Beto Guevara travels around Latin America with his friend Alberto Granado. March 10, 1952 General Fulgencio Batista carries out a coup d'etat in Cuba. July 6, 1953 After graduating as a doctor, Echo Beto Guevara sets off again to travel through Latin America. He visits Bolivia, observing the aftermath of the 1952 revolution. July 26, 1953 Fidel Castro leads an unsuccessful armed attack on the Moncada army garrison in Santiago de Cuba, launching the revolutionary struggle to overthrow the Batista regime. December 1953 Echo Beto Guevara meets a group of survivors of the Moncada attack in San Jose, Costa Rica. December 24, 1953 Echo Beto Guevara arrives in Guatemala, then under the popularly elected government of Jacobo Arbenz. January, June 1954 While in Guatemala, he studies Marxism and becomes involved in political activities, meeting exiled Cuban revolutionaries. August 1954 Mercenary troops backed by the CIA enter Guatemala City and begin massacring Arbenz supporters. September 21st, 1954 Echo Beto Guevara arrives in Mexico City after fleeing Guatemala. July 1955 Echo Beto Guevara meets Fidel Castro in Mexico City and immediately agrees to join the planned guerrilla expedition. The Cubans nickname him Che, an Argentine term of greeting. November 25, 1956 82 combatants, including Che Guevara as troop doctor, sail for Cuba aboard the Granma. December 2, 
1956 the Gran Mariches Cuba in Orient Province but are surprised by Batista's troops at Alegria de Pio and dispersed. July 1957 Che Guevara is selected to lead the second column of the rebel army and is promoted to the rank of commander. August 31, 1958 Che Guevara leads an invasion column from the Sierra Maestra toward Las Villas province in central Cuba. December 28, 1958 Che Guevara's column initiates the Battle of Santa Clara. January 1, 1959 Batista flees Cuba. Santa Clara falls to the rebel army. January 2, 1959 Fidel Castro calls for a general strike and the country is paralyzed. The rebel army columns of Che Guevara and Camilo Cienfuegos reach Havana. January 8, 1959 Fidel Castro arrives in Havana. February 9, 1959 Che Guevara is declared a Cuban citizen. June 12 to September 8, 1959 Che Guevara travels through Europe, Africa, and Asia, he signs a number of commercial, technical, and cultural agreements. October 7, 1959 Che Guevara is designated head of the Department of Industry of the National Institute of Agrarian Reform, INRA. November 26, 1959 Che Guevara is appointed president of the National Bank of Cuba. March 17, 1960 President Eisenhower approves a CIA plan to overthrow the revolutionary government and prepare for a Cuban exile army to invade Cuba. October 21, 1960 Che Guevara leaves on an extended visit to the Soviet Union, the German Democratic Republic, Czechoslovakia, China, and North Korea. January 3, 1961 Washington breaks diplomatic relations with Cuba. February 23, 1961 The revolutionary government establishes the Ministry of Industry, headed by Che Guevara. April 15, 1961 As a prelude to the planned invasion by us organized forces, planes attack Santiago de Cuba and Havana. April 16, 1961 At a mass rally Fidel Castro proclaims the socialist character of the Cuban Revolution. April 17-19, 1961 1,500 Cuban-born mercenaries, organized and backed by the United States, invade Cuba at the Bay of Pigs but are defeated within 72 hours. Che Guevara is sent to command troops in Pina del Rio province. August 8, 1961 Che Guevara condemns U.S. President Kennedy's Alliance for Progress in a fiery speech to Organization of American States, OAS, Economic and Social Conference in Punta del Este, Uruguay, as head of Cuba's delegation. Cuba is subsequently expelled from the OAS. February 3, 1962 President Kennedy orders a total trade embargo against Cuba. August 27 to September 7, 1962 Che Guevara makes his second visit to the Soviet Union. October 1962 – President Kennedy initiates the Cuban Missile Crisis. Cuba responds by mobilizing its population for defense. Che Guevara is assigned to lead forces in Pina del Rio province in preparation for an imminent U.S. invasion. July 3-17, 1963 – Che Guevara visits Algeria, recently independent under the government of Ahmed Ben Bella. March 1964 – Che Guevara meets with Tamara Bunk. Tanya, to discuss her mission to move to Bolivia in anticipation of a future guerrilla expedition. March 25, 1964 Che Guevara addresses the UN Conference on Trade and Development in Geneva, Switzerland. November 4-9, 1964 Che Guevara visits the Soviet Union. December 11, 1964 Che Guevara addresses the UN General Assembly meeting in New York. December 17, 1964 Che Guevara leaves New York for Africa, where he visits Algeria, Mali, Congo, Brazzaville, Guinea, Ghana, Tanzania, and Egypt. February 24, 1965 Che Guevara addresses the second economic seminar of the Organization of Afro-Asian Solidarity in Algiers. March 14, 1965 Che Guevara returns to Cuba and shortly afterwards drops from public view. April 1, 1965 Che Guevara delivers a farewell letter to Fidel Castro. 
he subsequently leaves Cuba on a Cuban-sponsored internationalist mission in the Congo, entering through Tanzania. April 18, 1965 In answer to questions about Che Guevara's whereabouts, Fidel Castro tells foreign reporters that Che will always be where he is most useful to the revolution. June 16, 1965 Fidel Castro announces Che Guevara's location will be revealed when Commander Guevara wants it known. October 3, 1965 Fidel Castro publicly reads Che Guevara's letter of farewell at a meeting to announce the Central Committee of the newly formed Cuban Communist Party. November 21, 1965 Che Guevara leaves the Congo, and begins writing up his account of the mission. December 1965 Fidel Castro arranges for Che Guevara to return to Cuba in secret. Che Guevara prepares for a Cuban-sponsored guerrilla expedition to Bolivia. January 3-14, 1966 The Tricontinental Conference of Solidarity of the Peoples of Asia, Africa and Latin America is held in Havana. March 1966 The first Cuban combatants arrive in Bolivia to begin advance preparations for a guerrilla movement. July 1966 Che Guevara meets with Cuban volunteers selected for the mission to Bolivia at a training camp in Cuba's Pina del Rio province. November 4, 1966 Che Guevara arrives in Bolivia in disguise and using the assumed name of Ramon Benitez. November 7, 1966 Che Guevara and several others arrive at the farm on the Nakawaza River where the guerrilla detachment will be based. December 31st, 1966 Che Guevara meets with Bolivian Communist Party Secretary Mario Monge. There is disagreement over perspectives for the planned guerrilla movement. March 23, 1967 The first guerrilla military action takes place with combatants successfully ambushing a Bolivian army column, after which it is decided to make a public announcement on March 25 of the formation of the Bolivian National Liberation Army. April 16, 1967 Publication of Che Guevara's message to the Tricontinental, which calls for the creation of two, three, many Vietnams. April 17, 1967 The guerrilla detachment led by Joaquim, Vilo Acuna, is separated from the rest of the unit. The separation is supposed to last only a few days but the two groups are never able to reunite. May 1967 U.S. Special Forces arrive in Bolivia to train counterinsurgency troops of the Bolivian Army. July 1, 1967 President Barrientos publicly announces Che Guevara's presence in Bolivia. July 31 – August 10, 1967 The Organization of Latin American Solidarity, OLAS, conference is held in Havana. The conference supports guerrilla movements throughout Latin America. Che Guevara is elected honorary chair. August 31, 1967 Joaquim's detachment is ambushed and annihilated while crossing the Rio Grande at Porto Mauricio, Vado de Yeso. September 26, 1967 The guerrilla group falls into a Bolivian army ambush. October 8, 1967 The remaining 17 guerrillas are trapped by army troops and conduct a desperate battle in the Quebrada del Euro. El Euro Ravine. Che Guevara is seriously wounded and captured. October 9, 1967 Che Guevara and two other captured guerrillas are murdered by Bolivian soldiers following instructions from the Bolivian government and Washington. The remains of Che Guevara and the other guerrillas are secretly buried in Bolivia. October 15, 1967 In a television appearance Fidel Castro confirms news of Che Guevara's death and declares three days of official mourning in Cuba. October 8 is designated the day of the heroic guerrilla. October 18, 1967 Fidel Castro delivers a memorial speech for Che Guevara in Havana's Revolution Plaza before an audience of almost one million people. July 1968 Che Guevara's Bolivian Diary is published in Cuba and distributed free of charge to the Cuban people. It is simultaneously published in many countries to counter the CIA campaign to discredit the revolutionary movement in Latin America. With an introduction by Fidel Castro, it becomes an instant international bestseller. July 1997 Che Guevara's remains are returned to Cuba and buried in Santa Clara along with the bodies of other guerrilla fighters found in Bolivia. Preface Jesus Montaigne
Jesus Montaigne was a leading figure in the Cuban Revolution, both in the 1950s in the struggle against the Batista dictatorship and also for four decades after the 1959 revolution until his death in 1999. This preface was written for the first edition of Che, a memoir by Fidel Castro, and recounts his first meeting with Che Guevara in Mexico in 1955. When Fidel Castro left Havana for exile in Mexico on Thursday, July 7, 1955, because his life was in danger in Cuba, he was about to meet Che. The group of survivors of the July 26, 1953, attack on the Moncada garrison an action with which we had tried to initiate a people's armed insurrection had been confined in the prison on the Isle of Pines, until our release on Sunday, May 15. Prior to his departure for Mexico, Fidel remained in Havana, waging a daring, dangerous political battle through parts of the mass media. He denounced the crimes the Batista dictatorship had committed against those who had attacked the Moncada and Bayamo garrisons, the abuses against those who opposed the oppressive system, the exploitation by which workers were victimized, and the lack of guarantees for peaceful political struggle. He challenged the government to hold a general election immediately. His main aim was to force the dictator Fulgencio Batista to show what lay behind his demagogic statements about a democratic opening in the country. All of that activity was in line with a carefully planned tactic to force the dictatorship to reveal its despotic, criminal nature. It also showed that our freedom wasn't due to any kindly gesture by the regime. The government had been forced to free us because of a nationwide campaign calling for amnesty for political prisoners. Not all of the political forces saw the situation so clearly, however, and not all of them really intended to pay whatever price might be required to solve the prevailing crisis. Former President Carlos Prio Socaraz, who had been overthrown, was preparing to return to Cuba, this implied his renunciation of the use of arms and his acceptance of the rules Batista had imposed for a normalization that, in practice, would amount to the indefinite prolongation of his stay in power. One way or another and for various reasons, the other opposition political parties were also moving toward a line of negotiations that would never lead to a positive solution of the problem. That was the situation in which Fidel waged that tactical political battle. The result was a foregone conclusion, as he knew that the dictatorship wasn't about to allow any real opposition to exist. One by one, all possibilities of normal political struggle were closed off. The police began to harass and arrest some of his closest followers. His brother Rahul was falsely accused of having engaged in terrorism and had to go into exile. Fidel's phone was tapped, he received anonymous death threats, he was kept from participating in mass meetings, radio and television programs in which he was to participate were cancelled, and finally, the daily La Calle, the only paper in which he could air his views, was shut down. He had foreseen this, so while conducting the public political battle right from the day we got out of prison, he also dedicated himself to another, secret task, that of creating the July 26th movement, an underground organization that would bring together the most radical sectors of young people from all over the country to begin a people's armed insurrection. The July 26th movement's function would be to organize, train, and arm the people for that confrontation while a small armed contingent was formed and trained outside Cuba to return, initiate, and lead the revolutionary war. Those were the special circumstances in which Fidel reached Mexico in the first week of July 1955. In that same month, he met the young Argentine Dr. Ecobedo Guevara de la Serna, whom the few Cubans who knew him were already calling Che. Coming from Guatemala, Che had reached Mexico on September 21, 1954. He had completed his medical studies at the University of Buenos Aires on April 11, 1953. On June 12, he received his diploma as a doctor, and on July 6 he left the Argentine capital and his country, never to return. The day on which we attacked the Moncada garrison July 26, 1953, Che happened to be in Bolivia, where, 14 years later, he was to die heroically, once more setting an impressive example as a true internationalist. In the middle of December 1953, Che had his first, 
Chan's contact with several Cubans who had taken part in the July 26 actions. They had gone into exile and were living in San Jose, Costa Rica. But Che really developed an ideological affinity with the Cuban Revolution while in Guatemala City from January 3, 1954, when he met Antonio Nico Lopez. After taking part in the attack on the Bayamo military garrison and operation supporting the attack on the Moncada garrison Nico Lopez managed to escape and obtained political asylum in Guatemala. Over six feet tall and extremely thin, the 21-year-old was one of our best-loved comrades. Since he came from a very low-income family, Nico hadn't been able to study very much, but he was one of Fidel's young followers who had the most radical thinking, he was also very dynamic and brave. He worked sporadically as a porter in a food market in Havana and turned his hand to many other things to support himself and his family. Nico was the first person who talked to Che about our revolutionary movement and about the armed actions that the young lawyer Fidel Castro had led in Cuba. Nico and Che began a friendship in Guatemala which was strengthened in Mexico and ended only with Nico's death on December 8, 1956, after the cabin cruiser Granma had taken us to Orient Province. When Jacobo Arbenz's democratic, nationalist administration was overthrown in Guatemala, Che went to Mexico. Ten months later, he met Fidel there in the home of Maria Antonia Gonzalez, a Cuban emigre, in circumstances which he himself described. From there Guatemala, I escaped to Mexico, when FBI agents were arresting and killing everybody who might constitute a threat to the United Fruit Company's government. In Mexico, I saw some members of the July 26 movement whom I'd met in Guatemala, and I became friends with Raul Castro, Fidel's younger brother. He introduced me to the head of the movement when they were already planning the invasion of Cuba. I talked with Fidel all night. By the time the sun came up, I was the doctor of his future expedition. In fact, after the experiences I'd had during my long trek through Latin America and its finale in Guatemala, I didn't need much persuading to join any revolution against a dictator, but Fidel impressed me as an extraordinary man. He tackled and did impossible things. He had exceptional faith that, once he left for Cuba, he would get there, once he got there, he would fight, and, by fighting, he would win. I shared his optimism. It was necessary to take action, struggle, make things happen, stop crying, and fight. And, to show the people of his homeland that they could believe in him, because he did what he said, he launched his famous slogan, in 1956, we will be free or martyrs and announced that before the end of the year, he would land somewhere in Cuba at the head of his expeditionary army. Excerpt from Jorge Ricardo Massetti's April 1958 interview with Che in the Sierra Maestra. It appears in Massetti's book Los Calichen y Los Calerin, El Fidel Castro K06, Those Who Fight and Those Who Cry, The Fidel Castro I Saw, Editorial Medido, Havana, 1960. Che had turned 27 on June 14, 1955, a month before that meeting, Fidel would turn 29 a few days later, on August 13. They were of the same generation, but their practical ideological identity, which would grow ever deeper with the passing of time, was more important than this link. Che didn't write very much about that period, but a comparison of what little he did write with Fidel's documents of that period provides a key to the fellow feeling that immediately sprang up between them. During those early days after their meeting, Fidel wrote as follows to those of us in the national leadership of the July 26 movement who remained in Havana. The norm governing my actions here is and will always be extreme care and absolute discretion, as if we were in Cuba. I've managed to keep a very low profile. As you advance there, we will advance here. I think that everything can be done perfectly well, as outlined. That's why I didn't make any public statements on arrival. A sense of propriety also kept me from doing so. Nobody has the right to cry about Cuba's troubles anywhere in the world as long as there is a Cuban who can take up a rifle to remedy them. If we were to talk to the Mexicans about our shameful political situation, they might ask us what the Cubans are doing about it. 
as if they had few problems themselves. If worst comes to worst, it may be said of us in the future that we gave our lives trying to do something impossible but never that we cried from impotence. Don't Fidel's statements, made on July 14, 1955, express the same personality and temperament that we later discovered were Che's too. On August 2 of that same year, in another letter, Fidel wrote. I think that I'm carrying out my task fully. In this case, I'm referring not to writing letters and manifestos from this isolated little room but rather to another, no less important task. Simply and discreetly, I'm optimistic about what I've done. I consider what is done outside to be so important and delicate that I endure the bitterness of this absence with resignation and turn my grief into energy, into a passionate desire to see myself fighting on Cuban soil as soon as possible. Once again, I promise that, if what we desire isn't possible and we are alone, you'll still see me come in a boat and land at some beach with a rifle in my hand. That was the Fidel Castro whom Che met in Mexico in the summer of 1955. It's easy to imagine what someone, who viewed the democratic Latin American politicians each one more demagogic than the last with scepticism, who had known the Bolivian revolution as it was turning back upon itself, and who had witnessed and suffered with the crushing of the incipient Guatemalan nationalist project, felt when he met that young Cuban who, like himself, was living in the poverty of exile, who had already attempted to begin an armed insurrection in his country, who had been imprisoned, who spoke of his revolutionary project with faith, enthusiasm and as much confidence as if he had already carried it out victoriously, and who was preparing to renew the war of liberation in his homeland even though he didn't have any great economic resources and was struggling in incredibly disadvantageous conditions. I arrived in Mexico City in the second week of August 1955. It was the first time I had ever left Cuba. I had carried out my instructions to set up a clandestine printing apparatus for the July 26 movement in Cuba, and I went to Mexico to take up my new responsibilities as general treasurer of the movement and aid to Fidel. There, in the very small group of people who had our chief's confidence, I met Che. In a very short time, Che had already demonstrated exceptional political and personal qualities. You have to consider the rigorous security measures under which we did our work in exile to understand the deep impression Che must have made on Fidel for him to be incorporated so quickly in the circle of his most trusted comrades. And Fidel wasn't mistaken. Che would never do anything to betray that trust. A few days after I arrived there, on August 19, Che married Hilda Gitti, a Peruvian economist he had met in Guatemala. Che invited me to the wedding, and I was one of the witnesses, along with two Mexican doctors who worked with Che and the Venezuelan poet Lucila Velasquez, a friend of Hilda's. The ceremony was held in the municipal palace of Tepatzotlan, a small town near Mexico City. When my wife, Melba Hernandez, arrived, our relations with Che grew stronger so much so that Che, Melba and I often went places together, including the library of the Mexican-Russian Cultural Exchange Institute in Mexico City. Much has been said about Che's strong sense of humanity, character, willpower, courage, political ideas, determination to build a better society, and lack of interest in material things, and I can add little to what has been repeated so many times over the years. However, my memories of the time we spent together in Mexico lead me to say that none of Fidel's followers there made a greater effort than Che during our long hikes, exhausting sessions of mountain climbing, personal defense combat practice in the Bucarelli Street Gymnasium, target practice, and classes on the theory of guerrilla warfare in which the group engaged with great tenacity over a period of several months. Moreover, though not a Cuban, he was unconditionally ready to come with us and fight for our freedom, thus contributing to our revolution's inspiring tradition of internationalism. Just as, after graduating, he gave up plans to go to Venezuela, where he could have found a very well-paying job, and went to Guatemala instead to participate in that revolutionary process which was cut short, and as in Mexico, when he had finally emerged from months of economic insecurity and hunger and had obtained a job at the general hospital and a post as a teacher of medicine, 
he renounced those rosy material and professional prospects and the tranquility of family life with his wife and newborn daughter and dedicated himself to the cause of the Cuban people. In June 1956, Fidel, Che, and more than 20 others were arrested. Fidel had put him in charge of training the group of future expeditionaries at Las Rosas Ranch, in Chalco. Of all the group, Che was the last to be freed, and, when he was released, he could not go home. He had to remain in hiding, moving from house to house, until November 25th, when he left for Cuba as one of the expeditionaries on board the Granma. A letter he wrote to his parents on July 6 the first of his documents in which he referred to Cuba and his commitment to the Cuban Revolution described that time in prison. Some time ago quite some time ago a young Cuban leader invited me to join his movement, a movement which sought the armed liberation of his country. Of course, I accepted. Dedicated to physically preparing those young men who would go back to Cuba, I spent the last few months maintaining the myth of my professional post. On July 21, when I hadn't been home for a month, because I was on a ranch outside the city, Fidel and a group of comrades were arrested. Our address was in his home, so we were all eventually caught in the roundup. I had documents accrediting me as a student of Russian at the Mexican-Russian Cultural Exchange Institute, which was enough for me to be considered an important link in the organization, and news agencies that are friends of dads made a hullabaloo all over the world. That was a synthesis of past events, future ones are divided into two groups, midterm and immediate. In the midterm future, I'll be linked to Cuba's liberation. I'll either triumph with it or die there. I can't say much about the immediate future, because I don't know what will happen to me. I'm in the judge's hands, and I may easily be deported to Argentina if I don't get asylum in another country, which would be good for my political health. Whatever happens, I must meet my new destiny, whether I remain in this prison or go free. We're on the eve of declaring a hunger strike in protest against the unjustified arrests and the torture to which some of my comrades were subjected. The group's morale is high. If for any reason, and I don't think this will happen, I can't write again and have the misfortune to lose, look on these lines as my farewell not very grandiloquent, but sincere. I have gone through life searching for my truth by fits and starts and now, having found the way and with a daughter who will perpetuate me, I have come full circle. From now on, I wouldn't consider my death a frustration, but, like Hikmet, I will take to my grave only the regret of an unfinished song. Che wasn't deported to Argentina, nor did he have to seek asylum in another Latin American country. He set out with us on the Granma and, on December 2, 1956, arrived at Bilic, an inhospitable, swampy area in Orient Province. On the December 5, he was wounded in the first battle and, in the retreat that day as he himself described it in choosing the box of bullets instead of the backpack of medicine, he also chose the destiny that would lead him to become known as the heroic guerrilla. He was the first fighter in the incipient rebel army who, in the Sierra Maestra, earned the highest rank of major and the command of a column, and his name appeared many times more in the records of Cuba's liberation in the next two years of the war. Fidel trusted Che so much as a guerrilla leader and fighter that, at the most critical moment of the struggle in the Sierra when the enemy launched its 1958 summer offensive against the rebel army's first front he gave him two extremely important missions involving great responsibility, organizing the first and only school of recruits in that front's territory, and heading the defense of the western sector of rebel territory against one of the three main thrusts of the enemy advance. Carrying out both missions, Che once again proved worthy of that trust. After the enemy offensive had been defeated and the conditions had been created for taking the war to the rest of the country, Fidel named Che to lead one of the two guerrilla columns that were to undertake the difficult march toward the middle of the island of Cuba. Their successful campaign in the final months of 1958 made a decisive contribution to the military collapse of the dictatorship and to the triumph of the revolution. After the January 1, 1959, triumph, Che put all of his talent and energy into promoting the economic, political and social transformation of our country, 
holding a series of important posts in which he did a brilliant job. For six years, up to 1964, he made notable contributions in the spheres of theory and practice of our society's transition from underdeveloped, neocolonial capitalism to socialism, joining Fidel as a spokesperson for the impoverished peoples of the Third World. He was only 39, at the height of his powers, at the time of his death in Bolivia in October 1967. It is impossible to imagine how much his loss has meant to the world revolutionary movement. He set us Cubans an example of the new human being without whom the society of the future, communism, would be impossible. Along with Julio Antonio Mella and Camilo Cienfuegos, he stands as a symbol for our young people, and his is the only name mentioned specifically in our Pioneers Children's Organization pledge, we will be like Che. For all these reasons, we should make everything about him known. I think that Che, a memoir by Fidel Castro will be an important contribution to contemporary revolutionary writings, and that certainty led me to write this preface to this volume for English-speaking readers. In 1987, a Cuban publishing house and David Deutschmann of Ocean Press, Australia, joined forces to publish Che Guevara and the Cuban Revolution now published as the Che Guevara Reader, in association with the Che Guevara Studies Center of Havana. Now, Che, a memoir by Fidel Castro has appeared as a companion piece. I am confident that this new book will also become an important reference work for all who seek to understand Che's life and the fascinating Cuban political experience. It is a collection of excerpts from speeches, interviews, and writings by our commander-in-chief that are related to Che. Nobody could have more authority than Fidel for evaluating Ecobedo Guevara de la Serna in depth. We should recall that Che himself recognized this authority when he ratified his sense of identity with Fidel in his farewell letter of April 1965. Recalling my past life, I believe I have worked with sufficient integrity and dedication to consolidate the revolutionary triumph. My only serious failing was not having had more confidence in you from the first moments in the Sierra Maestra, and not having understood quickly enough your qualities as a leader and a revolutionary. I have lived magnificent days, and at your side I felt the pride of belonging to our people in the brilliant yet sad days of the Caribbean Missile Crisis. Seldom has a statesman been more brilliant than you in those days. I am also proud of having followed you without hesitation, of having identified with your way of thinking and of seeing and appraising dangers and principles. Other nations of the world call for my modest efforts. I can do that which is denied you because of your responsibility at the head of Cuba, and the time has come for us to part. The text of that letter, which was made public several months after it was written, completely refuted the infamous international campaign that the enemies of our revolution had launched claiming that Fidel and Che had quarreled and that this was why Che had left Cuban public life. The countless disinformation campaigns and lies with which U.S. imperialism and its accomplices have sought to harm the Cuban revolution throughout the past 30 years have always been cause for indignation, but this lie was one of the worst, for it tried to besmirch a unique, close friendship between two great figures in our history because it reveals details of how the relationship between two exceptional men began and developed, Che, a memoir by Fidel Castro is a definitive epitaph for that infamous lie. In addition, it is the most complete and consistent document defining Che, his strong sense of humanity, and the reasons why he has become a symbol of revolutionary staunchness for all who struggle for a world of justice, in which the honor of humanity will always prevail. Jesus Montaigne Aropsa Havana, May 1989 Introduction David Deutschmann In the months following the overthrow of the Batista dictatorship on January 1, 1959, the new government led by Fidel Castro began to carry out a series of revolutionary measures. The dictatorship's repressive apparatus was dismantled. Racial discrimination was declared illegal. Rents and utility rates were lowered. An agrarian reform law confiscated all land holdings above 1,000 acres, providing land to hundreds of thousands of peasants. As these popular measures were implemented, the new Cuban government faced growing opposition from Washington and U.S. corporations with holdings in Cuba. 
a growing polarization also developed within Cuba itself. One of the earliest campaigns was centered on the threat of communist infiltration of the new government. The most prominent targets were Ecobedo Che Guevara and Raúl Castro. Argentine-born Guevara was singled out because he had not been born in Cuba, although a special government decree on February 9, 1959, had awarded him Cuban citizenship as a result of his outstanding contributions during the Revolutionary War. When Che Guevara was appointed to head the newly created Department of Industry, which was attached to the National Institute of Agrarian Reform, INRA, a series of attacks appeared in the right-wing daily newspaper El Diario de la Marina. Fidel Castro took this up on September 28, 1959, as part of a television program called Economic Commentaries. We know from abundant experience who will stay through difficult times. We know from abundant experience who will fight to the death and who will jump ship. We know how far each person will go. And we have the right to know which comrades can always be counted on to defend this revolution those of us you would first have to destroy, down to the last person, before you could destroy the revolution. Listen well. You would first have to kill us, down to the last person. Above all, it's good to know who the irresponsible individuals are who have criminally dedicated themselves to the task of diminishing the authority of the revolution in order to lay the groundwork for struggles here inside the country. Such struggles can have only an incredibly tragic outcome for the nation. These individuals have clearly either ignored or forgotten those who defend this revolution those who do so not out of personal interest or ambition but for ideals they cherish, genuinely cherish, and cherish more each day. That's why these individuals cannot lead the country to anything but the worst of disasters, to the benefit of our eternal enemies. This divisionist campaign that is, this campaign of trying to sow divisions who is it aimed at? Without doubt the target is that fighter we Cubans have the most to thank, that fighter who has performed the greatest deeds. Because if there is one comrade who can genuinely be called a hero, it is Comrade Guevara. And I don't say this because of the great things he has done, which are well known to everyone. How in each extremely difficult situation we never had to search for a volunteer, because he would always step forward first. How he showed extraordinary bravery. He was a comrade who never pursued personal objectives. From the first to the last day of the war, he was always ready to die, to sacrifice his life for the cause this comrade who always had to carry medication for asthma, a vaporizer. And to think he led an offensive through swamps. When we objectively assess the feats that have been carried out, it is clear this is a comrade whose stature will never be undercut by a dirty trick of the sort one directed not against him alone, but against all the other comrades, against all those who are pillars of the revolution. It is a systematic campaign, not an isolated one. With what aim? To lower the standing of those like Comrade Guevara who, when the country is under attack, are given the task of defending an area or region and have to be killed before it can be taken. Comrade Guevara is someone who can be given any mission, any post, any assignment with the certainty that he won't hesitate for a second. He is the kind of person this country needs, the kind we need in difficult times. And it is in difficult times that people show what they are made of. It is not always so in comfortable times, and certainly not by slinging slander, infamy and mud about comrades who deserve the respect of all Cubans because they have done only good for the country. Just as the agrarian reform won the support and understanding of the people, we also wanted to promote popular support for industrialization. There can be no question that the process of agrarian reform was understood by the people. So we thought we should also set up a department of industry to talk with the peasants, to help lead them forward, to promote the idea of increasing savings to help buy goods needed for industrialization and also to go to the unions and promote the idea of savings. We sent Ecobedo Guevara to the Department of Industry. Why? Simply because of his abilities. During the war and since the days of the war this has been something I've been thinking about the comrade who took charge of establishing the rebel army's initial industries was Comrade Guevara. And out of this emerged, as you will recall, a series of industries, 
our primitive factories in the Sierra Maestra where we made implements of war, where we were able to manufacture land mines, shoes, a number of different things, in our small industry there. And we said that if under those conditions, lacking nearly everything, without even a lathe to make parts because obtaining a lathe required a tremendous effort, if we could do that under those conditions, we said, imagine what we could do in peacetime. On November 26, 1959, Che Guevara was appointed president of Cuba's National Bank, replacing Felipe Pazos, an opponent of the course of the revolutionary government. Among the key challenges facing Guevara in this new position were stopping the flight of capital and the exodus of Cuba's hard currency reserves, stabilizing the purchasing power of the country's currency, and asserting control over the country's private banks, which had not yet been nationalized. The appointment of Guevara intensified the propaganda campaign against him both in Cuba and internationally. An example was a July 1960 article in the U.S. News and World Report entitled The Red Dictator Back of Castro. Look behind Fidel Castro and his brother Raul for the real Red Dictator of Cuba. Echo Beto Che Guevara is the brains of Castro's Cuban government. Guevara is not Cuban, but Argentine, not an emotional Latin by temperament, but a cool, calculating communist. To Guevara, Castro's Cuba is only a stepping stone to a red conquest of all Latin America. Guevara, not Fidel, or Raul Castro, is at the controls in this fast-moving period when vast U.S. investments are being seized. It is Guevara described as an agent of international communism who must find the means to finance the economy of Cuba. Guevara, among other things, is president of the National Bank of Cuba. His hand is on every bank account, corporate and private, in the island. His are the decisions that determine the direction and the use of Cuban resources. To Guevara, Cuba is only an incident in what he and his communist aides regard as their real mission. This mission, according to those who work closely with Guevara, is to develop Cuba as a base for a communist takeover of much of Latin America. What is taking place in Cuba is regarded as only a warm-up operation. Fidel Castro dealt with this type of attack in a speech he gave to a meeting of the National Federation of Sugar Workers on December 15, 1959. When it is time to make sacrifices, the first things to be sacrificed here will be luxury items. It is luxurious and non-essential goods that must be sacrificed. I know how the poorest peasants live, how sugar workers live, how the workers of this country live. They don't go around wearing French perfume. They don't go around wearing silk and lace. They don't smoke American cigarettes. And they don't spend money on luxury items. I know what poor families consume. We have statistics that show that. So when the time comes to cut back well, that's why we have Che in the National Bank. Who began to worry when Che was named president of the National Bank? It certainly wasn't the peasants the sugar workers, or the poor. Those who were upset began to wage campaigns against Che. They began to slander him, to distort his ideas, to call into question the extraordinary merits he possesses, to make him into a bogeyman. But after making him a bogeyman, it turned out the people didn't see him that way. He was a bogeyman only to those who originated the campaign. When we named Che to the bank a great fear arose, they frightened themselves with the same bogeyman they themselves had created. Some people went to the bank the other day to withdraw paper paper. They went to take out paper because money is money only when there's an economy behind it, when there are monetary reserves, and those are the measures we are taking, defending those reserves. And to be sure, if there's no economy, if there are no reserves, the money is just so much paper. If they withdraw paper from the bank, We'll print new paper. That doesn't mean anything. If they begin counter-revolutionary maneuvers like taking money out of the bank, then we will simply issue orders to have new money printed up. And if that happens, not a single sugar worker is going to lose a centavo. For it is certain that not a single sugar worker has a bank account. No one is going to be fooled into thinking this fear affects the people. 
if those who are so upset had a little more common sense they'd be sleeping peacefully. We aren't going to touch those pieces of paper. On the contrary, to defend our economy, to defend our reserves, we are guaranteeing the value of those pieces of paper. Che was sent to the bank precisely to strengthen our effort to defend our economy and to defend our reserves. Just so nobody makes any mistake about this, Che was not sent to the bank to play the fool. Just as in the past we sent him to Las Villas to prevent the enemy troops from reaching Orient Province, we sent him to the National Bank to prevent our foreign exchange from escaping, and to make sure the reserves we have in foreign exchange are to be invested correctly. Campaign of Speculation and Intrigue Continues On March 14, 1965, Che Guevara returned to Cuba following a three-month trip representing the Cuban government at the United Nations and in a number of African countries. Immediately upon his return he dropped from public view. In April he left Cuba to enter a new field of battle, as he wrote. Traveling in complete secrecy, Guevara's initial destination was the Congo, the African country later known as Zaire. The Congo had been the scene of a civil war after winning independence from Belgium in 1960. Its first prime minister, Patrice Lumumba, was arrested by USPAC forces in December 1960 and subsequently murdered. When Maiz Chambe, who was directly involved in the murder, became head of state in 1964, this conflict developed into full-scale revolt by Lumumba's followers. Belgian troops and European mercenaries with the aid of the United States supported Chambay's forces, slaughtering thousands of Congolese in the process. Speaking at the UN General Assembly in December 1964, Guevara referred to the painful case of the Congo, unique in the history of the modern world, which shows how, with absolute impunity, with the most insolent cynicism, the rights of the peoples can be flouted. All free men of the world must be prepared to avenge the crime of the Congo. With 100 Cuban volunteer fighters, Guevara went to the Congo after he left Cuba in April 1965. There they assisted and helped train opponents of Chambay's regime, staying several months into that year. From the time Che dropped out of sight, speculation on his whereabouts began to appear in media around the world. In response to insistent questioning, Castro told a group of foreign journalists. The only thing I can tell you about Commander Guevara is that he will always be where he is most useful to the revolution. Relations between the two of us are the very best, they're like the days we first met even better. I believe his tour of Africa was very successful. He was also in China as part of our delegation. He is versatile, with an extraordinary understanding of things. He is one of the most complete leaders. Nevertheless, rumors spread outside of Cuba some of them deliberately provocative. The military dictatorship in the Dominican Republic claimed publicly that Guevara had been killed in the uprising that began there on April 24, 1965. Another rumor alleged that Guevara had defected to the United States and sold Cuban secrets for $10 million. In response to the slander campaign, Fidel Castro made the following comments on June 16, 1965, marking the fourth anniversary of the founding of the Ministry of the Interior, Minind. Now that I have mentioned Commander Ecobedo Guevara, who so deserves that applause, you will have to listen to the confused rumblings of the imperialists. They say Comrade Ecobedo Guevara has not appeared in public, that he didn't show up on May Day, that he was nowhere to be seen the week cane cutting began. They are puzzled. Some say he is here, some there, or that there has been a fight, or perhaps problems. Yes, they really are puzzled. We are going to reply to them, what business is it of yours? We are under no obligation to keep you informed or to give you any information. If you are puzzled, you can just keep on being puzzled. If you are concerned, you can just keep on being concerned. If you are nervous, take a tranquilizer or a sedative. Our people, on the other hand, are not concerned. They know their revolution and they know their people. Comrade Guevara hasn't been seen at a public event? Well, then Comrade Guevara must have some reason for not appearing at a public event. There is no news about him. 
he never was someone who sought publicity. Comrade Guevara has always been allergic allergic, to publicity. They say he is in poor health. That's what they would like to see. The imperialists would love to see him in poor health. When there is concern over Commander Guevara it is a sign of respect and esteem for him. When will the people know where Commander Guevara is? When Commander Guevara wants it known. Will you find out? Yes, you will find out. What do we know? Nothing. What do we think? We think Commander Guevara always has and always will carry out revolutionary tasks. I don't understand this ignorance on the part of the imperialists. Why don't they take a photograph with their U2S? Why don't they go find him and photograph him? The fact is that it is much harder to photograph a man, no matter how big he is, than a missile. Well, they can put their electronic brains to work on trying to solve this problem. We, for our part, will remain calm and content. Here no one is puzzled, no one. People don't even ask. Later they may ask. If so, an answer will be given. That's all there is to it. After leaving the Congo in late 1965, Guevara went to Tanzania and then to Eastern Europe. In December 1965, he returned secretly to Cuba. Upon his return, Castro assisted him in beginning preparations for the guerrilla expedition to Bolivia. Guevara selected a group of Cuban volunteers who were veterans of Cuba's Revolutionary War and of the recent mission in the Congo. A training camp was set up in a remote mountainous area of Pina del Rio province in western Cuba. In late October, Guevara in disguise left Cuba, traveling by way of Europe and arriving in Bolivia on November 4, 1966. He proceeded to set up a guerrilla base in southeastern Bolivia, near the border with Argentina, Chile, and Paraguay. Of the 50 guerrillas who eventually took part in the campaign, 17 were Cubans, including several members of the Central Committee. The first several months of the Bolivian campaign were devoted to organizing and consolidating the guerrilla unit. In March 1967 the first combat engagement occurred between the guerrillas and the Bolivian army. At the time, Guevara's presence in Bolivia was still not known publicly, and the speculation and rumors about his whereabouts continued. Reports abounded of his presence everywhere, some had him in Peru, Colombia, Guatemala even as far away as Vietnam. Before leaving Cuba for Bolivia, Guevara had written a message to the Organization of Solidarity with the Peoples of Asia, Africa and Latin America, known as the Tricontinental, which had been formed following a January 1966 conference in Havana. The theme of Guevara's message to the Tricontinental was the need for solidarity with the Vietnamese liberation struggle, under the watchword of Create 2, 3, Many Vietnams. That theme was to figure prominently in the conference of the Organization of Latin American Solidarity, OLAS, that took place in Havana in late July and early August 1967 and elected Guevara as its honorary chairman. Guevara's message was released publicly on April 16, 1967. It was published in a special inaugural edition of Tricontinental magazine, which accompanied it with a series of photographs of Guevara in disguise before leaving Cuba. Its publication created a worldwide sensation and was reported prominently by the world's major news media. On April 19, 1967, Fidel Castro commented on the publication of Guevara's article during a speech commemorating the sixth anniversary of the defeat of the Uspakt invasion at the Bay of Pigs. For the revolutionary movement around the world, for those who confront imperialism in Asia, in Africa, and in Latin America, the message of Commander Ecobedo Guevara has been a dramatic event. We are not going to speak of ourselves, the Cubans. No one here ever believed the intrigues, ridiculous lies, and inventions of the imperialists. Here we all know one another, and we know the truth because we've either heard it or guessed it. The imperialists tried to sow confusion and lies throughout the world. They claimed to have located Che in a number of places, to have killed him at least a dozen times. For the imperialists, above all, this document must have been traumatic. Che's resurrection, his presence, 
must have been deeply disheartening and upsetting. This Che, with and without a beard, with a beard that might be new and might be old you can't tell and with that beret that seems to symbolize something, perhaps a sort of red beret. This Che must have produced deep concern among the US imperialists. This Che, in a magnificent state of health, with incomparable enthusiasm, and with more experience than ever in guerrilla armed struggle this Che must be a source of concern for the imperialists, because he is a source of inspiration for revolutionaries. Where is Che? The imperialists wonder. Organizing a liberation movement? Fighting in one of the liberation fronts? What the imperialists would give to know the answer to that? But even if they find out, it would do no more than simply satisfy their curiosity. Because if they really want to protect the health of their Green Berets, they had better make sure the Green Berets never meet up with Che. For those who sow intrigue and slanders, for those who try to benefit from and take advantage of Che's absence to hurl all kinds of slander against the revolution for them too it must have been quite a lesson, this presence of Che. And they but why waste time on them? They've already been given their punishment. It's the punishment of history, because it's history that takes care of settling accounts with charlatans, slanderers and those who take part in intrigues. That's why the perversity of the slanderers is sad, but of no real concern. History will once again take care of these matters. That is the punishment of the intriguers and slanderers who have played the imperialists game in every way possible in regard to this new stage, begun two years ago by comrade Ecobedo Guevara. Not everything is known, of course. But once again we leave it to history. We all received this document with immense happiness. None of us has the slightest doubt that time whether it be days, weeks, months or years will inevitably bring fresh news of Che. Chapter 1 On Che's Absence October 3, 1965 The rumor campaign surrounding Che Guevara's disappearance continued to grow during 1965. Spectacular stories began to circulate abroad, with the intention of creating divisions within the revolution. They alleged a political falling out between Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, that Fidel had placed a gag on Che, deported him, or even had him killed. These accusations were echoed in certain left-wing circles, often simply reported as fact. At a mass rally on September 28, 1965, Fidel announced that in a few days he would make public a letter Che had written him before leaving Cuba. At that forthcoming occasion we will speak to the people about comrade Ecobedo Guevara, Fidel said. The enemy has speculated a great deal and spread many rumors as to whether he's here or there, whether he's dead or alive. At times they are confused, at times they seek to confuse, and at other times they make insinuations. We are going to read a document from comrade Ecobedo Guevara that explains his absence during these months. This will take place at the meeting I just referred to. Shouts of now. Now, no. Because I didn't bring the document here. I'm simply announcing it. I told you that at that time we would read this document and discuss some of the issues. The meeting referred to by Fidel was a televised ceremony to present the members of the Central Committee of the newly formed Cuban Communist Party. Che Guevara's name had been conspicuous in its absence from this list. This excerpt is from Fidel's speech on October 3, 1965, to that meeting. Che's family was present in the audience. On that date, Che was still in the Congo. Absent from our central committee is someone who possesses in the highest degree all the necessary merits and virtues to be on it but who, nevertheless, is not among those announced as members of our central committee. The enemy has been able to conjure up a thousand conjectures. The enemy has tried to sow confusion, to spread discord and doubt, and we have waited patiently because it was necessary to wait. This differentiates the revolutionary from the counter-revolutionary, the revolutionary from the imperialist. Revolutionaries know how to wait, we know how to be patient, we never despair. The reactionaries, the counter-revolutionaries, the imperialists, they live in perpetual despair, in perpetual anguish, perpetually lying, in the most ridiculous and infantile way. 
When you read the things said by some of those officials, some of those U.S. senators, you ask yourself, but how is it possible these gentlemen are not in a stable instead of belonging to what they call Congress? Some of them come out with absolute nonsense. And they have a tremendous habit of lying, they cannot live without lying. They live in fear. If the revolutionary government says one thing, which is what it has consistently been saying, they see fears, terrible things, a plan behind all this. How ridiculous! What fear they live in! And you have to wonder, do they believe this? Do they believe everything they say? Or do they need to believe everything they say? Or can't they live without believing everything they say? Or do they say everything they don't believe? It's difficult to say. This would be a matter for doctors and psychologists. What do they have in their brain? What fear is it that makes them see everything as a maneuver, as a belligerent, frightening, terrible plan? They don't know that there is no better tactic, no better strategy than to fight with clean hands, to fight with the truth. These are the only weapons that inspire confidence, that inspire faith, that inspire security, dignity, and morale. And these are the weapons we revolutionaries have been using to defeat and crush our enemies. Lies. Who has ever heard a lie from the lips of a revolutionary? Lies are weapons that help no revolutionary, and no serious revolutionary ever needs to resort to a lie. Their weapon is reason, morality, truth, the ability to defend an idea, a proposal, a position. In short, the moral spectacle of our adversaries is truly lamentable. The soothsayers, the pundits, the specialists on the Cuba question have been working incessantly to unravel the mystery, has Ecobedo Guevara been purged? Is Ecobedo Guevara sick? Does Ecobedo Guevara have differences? And things of this sort. Naturally the people have confidence, the people have faith. But the enemy uses these things, especially abroad, to slander us. Here, they say, is a frightening, terrible communist regime, people disappear without a trace, without a sign, without an explanation. And when the people began to notice his absence, we told them that we would inform them at the appropriate time, that there were reasons for waiting. We live and work surrounded by the forces of imperialism. The world does not live under normal conditions. As long as the criminal bombs of the US imperialists fall on the people of Vietnam, we cannot say we live under normal conditions. When more than 100,000 US soldiers land there to try to crush the liberation movement, when the soldiers of imperialism land in a republic that has legal rights equal to those of any other republic in the world, to trample its sovereignty, as in the case of the Dominican Republic, the world doesn't live under normal conditions. When surrounding our country, the imperialists are training mercenaries and organizing terrorist attacks in the most shameless manner, as in the case of the attack by counter-revolutionary Cuban exiles on the Spanish merchant ship Sierra Aranzazu, when the imperialists threaten to intervene in any country in Latin America or in the world, we do not live under normal conditions. When we fought in the underground against the Batista dictatorship, revolutionaries who did not live under normal conditions had to abide by the rules of the struggle. In the same way even though a revolutionary government exists in our country so far as the realities of the world are concerned we do not live under normal conditions, and we have to abide by the rules of that situation. To explain this I am going to read a letter, handwritten and later typed, from Comrade Ecobedo Guevara, which is self-explanatory. I was wondering whether I needed to tell of our friendship and comradeship, how it began and under what conditions it began and developed, but that's not necessary. I'm going to confine myself to reading the letter. It reads as follows, Havana, it has no date, because the letter was intended to be read at what we considered the most appropriate moment, but to be strictly precise it was delivered April 1st of this year exactly six months and two days ago. It reads, Havana. Year of Agriculture. Fidel. At this moment I remember many things when I met you in the house of Cuban revolutionary Maria Antonia, when you proposed I come along, all the tensions involved in the preparations. One day they came by and asked me who should be notified in case of death, 
and the real possibility of that fact struck us all. Later we knew it was true, that in a revolution one wins or dies, if it is a real one. Many comrades fell along the way to victory. Today everything has a less dramatic tone, because we are more mature. But the event repeats itself. I feel that I have fulfilled the part of my duty that tied me to the Cuban Revolution in its territory, and I say goodbye to you, to the comrades, to your people, who now are mine. I formally resign my positions in the leadership of the party, my post as minister, my rank of commander, and my Cuban citizenship. Nothing legal binds me to Cuba. The only ties are of another nature those that cannot be broken as can appointments to posts. Recalling my past life, I believe I have worked with sufficient integrity and dedication to consolidate the revolutionary triumph. My only serious failing was not having had more confidence in you from the first moments in the Sierra Maestra, and not having understood quickly enough your qualities as a leader and a revolutionary. I have lived magnificent days, and at your side I felt the pride of belonging to our people in the brilliant yet sad days of the Caribbean Missile Crisis. Seldom has a statesman been more brilliant than you in those days. I am also proud of having followed you without hesitation, of having identified with your way of thinking and of seeing and appraising dangers and principles. Other nations of the world call for my modest efforts. I can do that which is denied you because of your responsibility at the head of Cuba, and the time has come for us to part. I want it known that I do so with a mixture of joy and sorrow. I leave here the purest of my hopes as a builder and the dearest of my loved ones. And I leave a people who received me as a son. That wounds a part of my spirit. I carry to new battlefronts the faith that you taught me, the revolutionary spirit of my people, the feeling of fulfilling the most sacred of duties, to fight against imperialism wherever one may be. This comforts and more than heals the deepest wounds. I state once more that I free Cuba from any responsibility, except that which stems from its example. If my final hour finds me under other skies, my last thought will be of this people and especially of you. I am thankful for your teaching, your example, and I will try to be faithful up to the final consequences of my acts. I have always been identified with the foreign policy of our revolution, and I continue to be. Wherever I am, I will feel the responsibility of being a Cuban revolutionary, and I shall behave as such. I am not sorry that I leave nothing material to my wife and children. I am happy it is that way. I ask nothing for them, as the state will provide them with enough to live on and to have an education. I have many things to say to you and to our people, but I feel they are unnecessary. Words cannot express what I would want them to, and I don't think it's worthwhile to keep scribbling pages. Hasta la victoria siempre. Ever onward to victory. Patria o muerte. Homeland or death. I embrace you with all my revolutionary fervor. Che. Those who speak of revolutionaries, those who consider revolutionaries as cold, insensitive, and unfeeling people will have in this letter the example of all the feeling, all the sensitivity, all the purity that can be held within a revolutionary soul. And all of us could answer. Comrade Guevara, it is not responsibility that concerns us. We are responsible to the revolution. We are responsible for helping the revolutionary movement to the best of our ability. And we assume the responsibility, the consequences, and the risks. For almost seven years it has always been like that, and we know that as long as imperialism exists, and as long as there are exploited and colonized peoples, we will continue running these risks and we will calmly continue assuming that responsibility. It was our duty to comply with and respect the feelings of that comrade, to respect that freedom and that right. That is true freedom not the freedom of those who seek to impose chains, but the freedom of those who leave to take up a rifle against the chains of slavery. That is another freedom our revolution proclaims, Mr. President Johnson. And if those who wish to leave Cuba to go live with the imperialists, those whom the imperialists sometimes recruit to serve in Vietnam and the Congo, can do it, let everyone know that every citizen of this country, 
whenever they make a request to fight not at the side of the imperialists but at the side of revolutionaries this revolution will not deny them permission to go. This is a free country, Mr. Johnson, really free for all. And that was not the only letter. Besides this letter, and the occasion on which it was to be read, we have other letters greeting various comrades, as well as letters addressed to my children, to my parents, and to other comrades letters he wrote for his children and his parents. We will deliver these letters to these comrades and these relatives, and we are going to ask them to donate them to the revolution, because we believe they are documents worthy of being part of history. We believe this explains everything. This was what fell to us to explain. As for the rest, let our enemies worry about it. We have enough tasks, enough things to do in our country and with regard to the world, enough duties to fulfill. And we will fulfill them. Chapter 2 Confirmation of Che's Death in Bolivia October 15, 1967 Following contradictory news reports on Che's death in Bolivia, Fidel Castro went on Cuban television on October 15, 1967, to confirm his death. As you must have figured out, the reason for this address is the news that has been arriving from Bolivia since October 9th, and that has appeared for the last few days in our press. I must begin by stating that we have become convinced that this news that is, the news related to the death of Commander Ecobedo Guevara is, painfully, true. On previous occasions dispatches have been published asserting his death, but it was always easy to see that such reports were unfounded. When wire service reports about his death began to arrive on October 9, the character of the dispatches and the entire set of circumstances naturally made the news cause for concern. But still there was nothing definite. The news continued on October 10, but the reports clearly contained a series of contradictions. They mentioned, for example, a scar on his left hand, but no one remembered a scar on Commander Ecobedo Guevara's left hand. However, we recalled that he had scars on his neck and leg bullet wounds from the war and, once, from an accidental shot that left a scar on his face. But none of these details were mentioned. Certain contradictions were noted and, above all, there was a general climate of disbelief in the news coming from Bolivia. So much so, that on the afternoon of October 10, any one of us would have expressed serious doubts about the accuracy of the reports. Certain other indications began to appear, however, such as the first photographs. The first photograph, which arrived late on the night of October 10, did not bear a great resemblance that is, many of us who first saw this photo tended to reject the idea it was Che. We nevertheless expected that if it was an attempt to spread false news, or if it was a mistake, the features in the photo would be diametrically different. And we were concerned because there were some very general resemblances that is, it might not be a photo of him, but we could not say categorically that it wasn't. This was the photograph shows a photo. I don't think it can be picked up very well by the TV cameras, and it's also not a very clear photo. However, a few hours later, another photograph arrived that depicted some unmistakable features of his face. This photo is also very dark, but with just a look at it you can make out. When a number of us saw this photo we began to think the news might be true, or, rather, for the first time we began to become convinced that the news might very well be true. This is the photo. Then came a third photograph, in which the entire body is visible, on a stretcher. It too was a photo that could not be considered definitive, it's also a dark photo. The next day more photographs began to come in, until one arrived that was very clear, which is this one shows photo. It is so clear that possibly even when reproduced on newsprint it will still come across clearly. I should explain that it is not simply a matter of our accepting the photograph as definite proof, but rather of the photograph as one of a whole series of circumstances that in our opinion confirm its authenticity, circumstances I will explain in a moment. In the following days, newspapers continued to arrive from abroad, with more photographs, such as this one. Perhaps it is difficult to see this clearly on television, since it is taken from a newspaper, 
and naturally many of the details have already been lost. Along with the photos, a great deal of other information began to arrive. Naturally, our approach was to collect all the facts in order to arrive at a conclusion that, in our opinion, would be absolutely certain that is, an evaluation of the information with no room for doubt. That meant collecting all the evidence, all the photographs those received here directly and those published in foreign newspapers and all of the news was studied very carefully. A few days later we received the first photographs of Che's Bolivian diary that was said to have been seized. Here are some of the photos of the diary, these two photos, which are the ones that have appeared. We did not want to give a definitive opinion until we had assembled all the available facts. At the same time there was the question of Che's family. His father, his brother I'm referring to his family in Argentina who, according to the dispatches, were preparing to travel to Bolivia. We logically presumed that they would have the opportunity to make first-hand observations, and we understandably also waited for them to give their opinion first. So we waited. The trip was made, and a whole series of incidents occurred, many of which you are familiar with. They were not given the opportunity to see the body. We nevertheless faced a delicate situation, with Che's Argentine relatives finding, as they did, a number of strange circumstances such as the news that the body had been buried, and then, immediately afterward, that it had been cremated. In such circumstances any relative would naturally tend to think the news was absolutely false. That is natural and logical. For our part, we were already completely sure the news was true. But we did not want to state our opinion without first informing his relatives, through mutual friends who are in touch with them from time to time. And we were able to learn, moreover, that even now his father and other relatives believe the news to be absolutely false. If it had simply been a personal matter, then unquestionably we would not have thought of insisting, nor would we have publicly stated an opinion contradictory to theirs. But the fact is that it is a question of great public importance throughout the world, and, in addition, a question that affects our people deeply. For that reason we felt it was our duty to state our opinion. If we thought there was the slightest doubt, our duty would be to express that doubt. If we thought the news was false, our duty would be to say that it was false. And if, in our judgment, the news was true, there were various questions that had to be considered. In the first place, as can be imagined, it was painful for us to have to state an opinion based on news coming from an oligarchic and reactionary government, a despotic government, an oppressor of its people, an ally of imperialism, and an enemy of the revolution. Nevertheless, we found ourselves in a position of having to support and confirm the truth of that news. I think that for any revolutionary such a thing is always painful. There was also the consideration of whether there was any benefit in maintaining doubts about the news. Regardless of the circumstances, however even if we felt it beneficial in any way to maintain doubts about it such a consideration would not have kept us from telling the truth. As a matter of fact, we do not believe such a course of action would be in any way beneficial. I simply raise this hypothetically. Even if keeping it in doubt could have been beneficial in any way, the revolution has never used lies, fear of the truth, complicity with lies of any kind as its weapons. We could not do so under any circumstances. Not only do revolutionaries abroad place their trust in our telling the truth, but so do our own people. They have always been sure that they have never been lied to, and that when a truth must be stated publicly, that truth will always be stated publicly. And as people read the news, many were waiting for the revolutionary government and the party, their party, to tell them what was true and what were lies. Therefore, whatever the circumstances, we considered it our duty to express our opinion, although as I said before there was one thing that made this particularly delicate, that was the opinion held and stated publicly by the relatives of Commander Ecobedo Guevara in Argentina. We hope they will understand that however painful it may be to have to make this statement, there is no lack of courtesy much less lack of consideration intended toward them. I was telling you that we had reached this conclusion. 
we had not reached it on the basis of isolated facts, isolated words, or isolated photographs. A photograph can be doctored. But these were not photographs distributed by the government. These were photographs taken by a number of journalists right there in Bolivia, at the very spot where the body was. So there was no possibility of a doctored photograph, the thesis of a doctored photograph could not be accepted. There were other hypotheses, for example a fabricated wax figure. This would be highly improbable, and it would not be easy. This was all analyzed independently of all the other factors to be examined, and it turned out to be absolutely impossible. All this had to be analyzed in relation to a whole series of elements, news reports that had been appearing, and all the other factors. We found, for example, that this is Che's handwriting. It is undeniably his handwriting, which seems to us to be very difficult to imitate. But even if it were possible or easy to imitate someone's handwriting, above all of someone with a personality as distinctive as Che's, it would be absolutely impossible to imitate his style. And it would be even more impossible for anybody except those who knew him extremely well, who had lived with him for many years to be in a position to evaluate his every sentence, his style of writing, his way of expressing things, his reaction to each detail, to each thing. And, finally, a whole series of characteristics not only related to his handwriting but to the content, the style, the reactions. All that is absolutely impossible to imitate. Naturally a diary does not prove the death of a combatant. A diary can be lost on a road, it can fall from a backpack or can be left somewhere for safekeeping. This diary, however, was kept right up until October 7, the eve of the battle in which he was supposed to have been killed. That is, it contains things written up to just a few hours before the battle. It is unquestionable, therefore, that if the diary had been lost, it would have been lost approximately October 8, that is, the very day of the battle. There is another series of elements to be considered. Different photographs of Che's presence in Bolivia had been coming in, published in various newspapers around the world. Some newspapers published this photo shows photograph, which shows him with a bulky backpack, the way he was accustomed to loading them, and with an M2 rifle. Here is another photograph in which you can see him on a mule shows photograph, and this is undeniably Che's erect stance. Probably at that moment he was joking about something with the person taking the photo. And, it would appear, some of these photographs were somehow seized by the enemy. In other words, there were all the indications, and it was generally accepted, that he was in Bolivia. Another series of facts pointed to a strong pursuit of the guerrillas in recent weeks in Bolivia, involving a large number of troops. Among these troops were units specially trained by agents of imperialism in anti-guerrilla struggle. These are some factors that should be analyzed a little to get an idea of things, of how Che's death came about. In our opinion, the diary is absolutely authentic and the photos are also absolutely authentic. It seems to us absolutely impossible in every way, technically impossible, to fabricate all this. And, analyzing all the factors, all the details, all aspects the diary, the photographs, the news dispatches, the way the news dispatches emerged, a whole series of facts we concluded it was technically impossible to fabricate those proofs. But let's probe a little deeper. There are so many contradictions within the Bolivian regime, so many rivalries, so many problems, that it would be absolutely impossible for those within this regime to reach agreement even to tell a lie. They can tell some lie, hand out some news release, report that something happened, that some guerrillas were killed where the bodies don't show up later. Reactionary governments are in the habit of giving out such news, and it has no great significance. That is one thing to consider. Secondly, from the technical standpoint, they would need resources and experience that do not exist there. Thirdly and this is the most obvious why should that regime fabricate such news? What sense would it make to fabricate a report that would be exposed as a lie within 10, 15, or 20 days? Besides, it seemed they were acting somewhat cautiously. 
only 10 or 12 days beforehand they had issued a similar report, but they held to it for only a few hours. A few hours later, the next day, they quickly denied it. But this latest news report began to circulate very persistently, and they refrained from issuing a categorical statement. The first rumors came from various sources, from journalists. Apparently they were trying to obtain evidence that would enable them to issue an official statement without fear of a mistake. We noted all these things. We already have some experience in interpreting news dispatches. We all read many dispatches every day, and we have some experience in evaluating the style and characteristics of every government, the personalities of those in the government. All those things, all those factors, helped us evaluate this news item. They seemed to be acting cautiously. Not even the most imbecilic, the most idiotic of all governments and there is no doubt the government of Bolivia is characterized by its imbecility and idiocy would have resorted to such a senseless, stupid, impossible to invent thing as this, and then attempt to prove it. It would be completely senseless. There is no doubt that the guerrilla movement in Bolivia is in a phase in which the survival of the guerrillas depends, fundamentally, on their own abilities, it depends on their own resources, let us say. That is, it is not a movement that has reached the point where a crisis is imminent, where a lie by the government would gain it a week, or eight or ten days. That was not the situation. The guerrillas are in a period a period we know only too well in which they rely fundamentally on their own forces. And when guerrilla fighters hear such news reports, they laugh when they are false. Therefore, news reports have no effect on the guerrillas, while, on the contrary, they have an effect, an almost immediate effect, on the meager prestige and meager credibility some of these governments have. I am reasoning this out in order for us to understand that it would be absolutely illogical for anyone to try to invent such news. I am doing this to consider what would be the motives to invent such news. There is no possible motive. And the way the diary reads, the contents of the diary, the area spoken of in the diary, the photographs, photographs that were not issued by the government but which were taken by journalists a whole series of specific features enables us to conclude with absolute certainty that the news is the bitter truth. Logically, the natural tendency of any person faced with bad news about someone for whom he feels great affection is to reject it. To a great degree, that is what happened to us at first. In the mind of the people, in the mind of revolutionaries all over the world, there is a tendency to reject this kind of news. In addition, that government's meager credibility, its absolute lack of prestige, helped cast doubt on the news, on top of the emotional circumstances that lead to an instinctive rejection of news of this sort. This government is so discredited that even many of its allies among them US imperialism itself many of the governments that are similar to the government of Bolivia, read the news initially and said they were not sure, that they did not believe it, and adopted a very cautious attitude. Later, naturally, they began to adopt a different attitude when they had in hand evidence that gave them some assurance of the news. But until they had that evidence, it may be said that almost universally they refrained from giving credence to the news coming from Bolivia. But the discussion going on right now and the doubts that may remain at least the doubts we have are not connected with the fact of death itself but rather with the way he died the circumstances that led up to it. Those of us who know Echo Beto Guevara very well and I say no, because you really can't speak about Echo Beto Guevara in the past tense have had abundant experience with his character and temperament. However difficult it is to imagine a person of his stature, of his prestige, of his personality being killed in combat between a guerrilla patrol and an army force however illogical that might seem there is nothing extraordinary about it. For as long as we have known him, he has always been characterized by an extraordinary courage, by an absolute contempt for danger, and by a willingness, in every difficult and dangerous moment, to undertake the most difficult and dangerous tasks. That is what he did on many occasions during the course of our struggle. That is how he acted in the Sierra Maestra and in Las Villas. Many times we had to take steps of one kind or another to protect him. On more than one occasion we had to oppose some action he wanted to undertake. 
and as we came to appreciate what a magnificent combatant he was, as we came to see the possibility that he might serve the revolution in tasks or missions of the greatest strategic importance, we tried above all to protect him from the risk of being killed in some battle of little strategic importance. That's more or less how the moment came in which he was made commander of one of the invading columns, charged with carrying out the exceptionally difficult task of invading Las Villas province, a singular feat. Those who knew him then know the way he conducted himself in many actions. And we must say that we were always worried about the possibility that this temperament, this ever-present attitude of his in moments of danger, could lead to his death in virtually any battle. No one could ever be sure he would adopt even minimal measures of caution. Many times he went out at the head of scouting patrols. On the other hand, he was highly conscious of the importance of the mission he had taken on. And it is possible that he was thinking, as he always did, of the relative value of humans and the incomparable value of example. This was part of his personality. We would have liked more than anything to have seen him become a creator rather than a precursor of great victories of the peoples. But a person of that type of temperament, personality, and character, of that way of consistently reacting to specific circumstances, is unfortunately more likely to be a precursor than a creator of such victories. Yet the precursors are also obviously creators of victories the greatest creators of victories. Che would be the one least upset by this. But for all of us who have come to hold a deep affection for him, it is understandably difficult to resign ourselves to seeing him become a precursor, an example whose impact we have no doubt will be very great. Any human being would understandably grieve when a character, a mind, and an integrity such as his is physically destroyed. It is not my intention at the moment to express my ideas, opinions, and feelings about Echo Beto Guevara. In today's broadcast I am explaining these things simply as part of analyzing the news dispatches we are receiving. But as I said, absolutely no one should be surprised that he would be one of the first to fall in a battle involving a guerrilla detachment. It would almost take a miracle, it would almost be impossible for it to have been otherwise. He confronted danger many times and on many occasions, and in these situations a sort of mathematical law operates. It wasn't something we thought would never happen, and we have been evaluating all the circumstances accordingly. So, what is the background surrounding that moment, what are the circumstances that could have caused the battle that the enemy carried out in the midst of a large-scale mobilization, in the midst of a great deployment of forces against him? Here, for example, we have some facts that perhaps can explain those circumstances that are part of that background. We cannot in any way make a categorical statement about these questions when the only information by which we can judge is what we have been able to collect, select, and analyze from the waves of news items, from a veritable sea of dispatches. But there is, for example, a dispatch here dated September 29. A high-ranking military source confirmed today that the Bolivian army is firmly convinced it has the Argentine-Cuban revolutionary Ecobedo Che Guevara encircled in a jungle canyon some 128 kilometers from here. The source declined to give further details. But his revelation to the Associated Press, AP, at noon today is supported by the fact that troops in battle gear have been dispatched in the last few days to the densely wooded area apparently to engage in an important action. Another 800 troops, specially equipped for jungle operations, left the city of Santa Cruz early this week for the same zone. This city, where the trial of Regis de Bray is being held, is headquarters for the 4th Army Division, while Santa Cruz is the headquarters of the 8th Division. One contingent of troops left Camarai on Wednesday and another left last night. One more is scheduled to leave this afternoon. According to a reliable military source, at least 1,500 troops are taking part in the manhunt for Guevara. We have very good information that Guevara is alive, and we are more than convinced that he is surrounded, said the source, who refused to give details as to the basis for this belief. According to this source, the army has surrounded the communist guerrillas in a small valley between two hills of unspecified size. This information could not be confirmed. The two outlets of the valley, which is a sort of gorge, 
are occupied by Bolivian army troops specializing in jungle warfare. Many of them have been trained by U.S. instructors, some of whom served in Vietnam. It was pointed out that the flanks and bottom of the valley are covered with dense growth, but the high parts are free of obstacles, impeding undetected flight. Army patrols exploring the jungle established positive contact at the beginning of this week, said the source. On September 29 they began to speak of a typical region, and of a wooded valley, a kind of gorge, between hills, or between elevations totally lacking in vegetation, where it was necessary to move in one direction or the other that is, toward one exit or the other without being able to leave the area because that would require moving over terrain absolutely lacking in vegetation. This dispatch is especially interesting because it begins to speak of the territory that appears in almost all the other dispatches. But what circumstances gave them the absolute assurance that they would find a guerrilla force directly commanded by Commander Ecobedo Guevara in that territory? Here is a news item that speaks of a deserter from the guerrillas. This news appeared on September 30, in another dispatch. The Castro communist revolutionary leader Ecobedo Che Guevara is gravely ill and is being carried on a stretcher by other guerrillas, under heavy guard, according to news dispatches released today in this oil center. This information is attributed to the Bolivian former guerrilla Antonio Rodriguez Flores, who voluntarily surrendered to the armed forces camped on the Rio Grande, in response to the official offer to guarantee the lives of those who abandon armed subversion against the government. A desertion took place sometime between September 25 and September 30 and a deserter always has the same attitude. A deserter offers the enemy all the information that can be of interest to the enemy, and offers it immediately, without scruples and without concern of any kind, because a deserter is above all a demoralized revolutionary, or a pseudo-revolutionary who wanted to play at revolution. And it is indisputable that if a desertion occurs among the guerrillas and during our revolutionary war there were many cases of desertion this is nothing out of the ordinary. There is a period in which many people want to join a guerrilla struggle and come to the guerrilla camps in great number, in fact, there are more who want to join than there are weapons. Among those who come to join there are many who later play brilliant roles, who are magnificent soldiers, magnificent revolutionaries. Our guerrilla army never had a recruiting office or anything even similar. Our problem was the number of those who came to join us and for whom we did not have weapons. But more than 95% of the combatants in our rebel army came on their own accord, others were sent to us in an organized manner, only a few. Our army was made up of those who came and joined. But, of course, some who were inspired to join had no prior experience and no clear idea of the sacrifices involved in the guerrilla struggle. And when they had to walk a lot, climb mountains, and face difficulties, they would take advantage of an opportunity to leave the detachment in a cowardly way. And a deserter is always a traitor. If he falls into the enemy's hands he immediately informs about everything, and he can give a full report on all the details involving the guerrilla detachment. The dispatch speaks of illness. This must be taken to mean there may have been some temporary problem Che could have had. In the part of the diary that has been published, in the photocopies of the diary, the entry for September 1st states, we dismounted early from the mules after a few incidents, including a spectacular fall by one of them. The doctor has not yet recovered, but I have, and am walking perfectly, leading the mule. And he continues describing some other things. That is, on September 1st he tells of how he has recovered and feels perfectly fine. And in the diary entries for the two days before his death, he talks like a person in perfect health. In other words, it was not true he was ill at the time. But naturally a deserter could have described a previous illness, anything. Above all, the enemy was probably far more interested in pinpointing the exact location of the region or area where the guerrilla force was to be found. That explains why there was such a large mobilization of forces on September 29. The news about the deserter was published September 30. It is possible that he had already been in the hands of the enemy forces for three or four days, and of course those forces immediately began to carry out a series of troop movements.
any repressive army mobilizes its forces when it sees an opportunity at hand, of course, most of the time such troop movements are an empty, useless effort. But it is unquestionable that they had high hopes, since they had the exact region where the guerrilla forces were located. They began to carry out a series of large-scale troop movements, with high hopes of winning a tactical victory there against the guerrillas. Then there is the curious New York Times article written on October 7 that is, on the eve of the battle and published in the edition of Sunday, October 8 that is, on the morning of the day of the battle headlined Che Guevara's Last Stand. It says. Camarai, Bolivia. Even for a man as traveled as Ecobedo Che Guevara, the bleak cul-de-sac where the Andes fall away to the Amazon basin is a long way from anywhere. The sun rises blazing each morning on the dusty valley, baking the raw earth and the brown brambles. The teeming insect life monstrous flies and mosquitoes, spiders and stinging beetles swarm in the dead stillness. The article goes on to give something of a description of the region. It says. The heat and the dust and the bites turn the skins of humans into cloaks of misery. The harsh vegetation, dry and covered with thorns, makes sustained movement all but impossible except along the well-watched river banks and trails. According to military reports, the erstwhile Cuban major and 16 exhausted guerrilla companions have been bottled up in the valley by a tightening armed forces encirclement for nearly two weeks. The Bolivian military believes Major Guevara will not get out alive. In many ways, the situation of Major Guevara, and his companions in their infernal canyon 120 miles northwest of the military post of Camarai serve as a metaphor for armed revolution in the hemisphere. And so on and so forth. In other words, the content of the September 29th dispatch which speaks of troop movements that were perfectly explained by the news of a desertion, published September 30 is repeated by representatives of the foreign press who have close ties with the military command, and who speak insistently about the valley, the jungle-lined gorge, with areas lacking in cover. That is, there is an air of hopeful anticipation but this does not mean that the anticipated result will necessarily occur. Without having an idea of the terrain, without having an idea of the size of the valley, its width, its length, a whole series of circumstances, it is impossible to judge what real objective basis they could have had for harboring such hopes, since in general it is always said of guerrillas that they are surrounded. For example, they always said they had us surrounded, which was true. We had the sea to our backs, the plains and rice fields in front of us, and for a considerable period of time our actions were conducted within a territory no more than 10 kilometers wide and some 20 kilometers long, with occasional incursions to places a little more distant. Throughout 1957 and until the middle of 1958, every offensive against us including the last one, which involved an extremely large number of troops took place in that 10 by 20 kilometer piece of territory. It was a territory that we knew very well, and at the time we had some 300 men. But, generally speaking, the guerrilla unit is always seen as being surrounded, strategically, the guerrilla is surrounded by various military forces. More dangerous is tactical encirclement, that is, a guerrilla unit that is completely encircled by a cordon of enemy soldiers. But even in these situations, the cordons are broken through in a majority of cases. For that reason, no opinion can be given regarding the degree of danger involved in their location within the valley that is talked about, or in the region that is talked about. But everything seems to indicate because later they speak again of that region, and a certain persistence about this can be noted in all the wire service dispatches that they pinned their hopes on one particular region, and carried out a large-scale mobilization of forces. This does not necessarily mean that a clash had to take place, or that no withdrawal or maneuver was open to the guerrillas, but it explains the circumstances and the mobilization of forces preceding the battle. This means that almost two full weeks before the battle, there was already a certain euphoria and a whole series of troop movements headed toward that region. What exactly is the region like? We do not know. What other regions or what natural obstacles mark it off? We do not know. Whether there were broad plains barren of vegetation, or a river, or insurmountable hills, we do not know. 
but what is clear is that troops were sent to a given region that, thanks to information from a deserter, had been more or less pinpointed as the location of the guerrilla forces. Then come the dispatches, various dispatches, telling of a battle taking place in a region they say is characterized by rugged terrain, by terrain where it is difficult to move, a dense jungle at the foot of a valley, deep ravines, gorges, canyons. The diary entries of October 6 and 7 tell of such an area. For example, the entry for October 6 says, scouting patrols discovered a house nearby, some parts of the photocopy simply cannot be deciphered. Che's handwriting is small and not easy to read, and on top of that the photocopy has come out a little blurred. The diary says, ravines farther away where there was water, we, something that we couldn't make out, and we cooked all, a line missing under a rock overhang that served as a roof, that I. It says, in broad daylight we had passed close to places, and were in a hole. And again there are missing lines here. It says, because preparing the food took so long, we decided to leave at dawn for a tributary near this little creek, and from there to scout the area, to determine our future route. It continues, the Cruz del Sur radio reported in an interview. The men, this time Orlando was a little less, perhaps it says discreet. He is referring to another Bolivian who, it was first reported, gave himself up to the authorities. Later it was said that he was taken prisoner. There is something here that is not very clear, not as clear as in the other case. It continues, the Chilean radio carried a news item, to the effect that there are some 1,800 troops in the area. The entry for October 7 says, today marks the completion of 11 months of guerrilla operations without complications. This 11 months of guerrilla operations without complications indicates that the strategic situation of his forces, in his judgment, was not a difficult one. This is something to take into consideration the fact that Che did not think it was a critical situation. The diary says, up to 12.30, when an old woman, tending goats, entered the canyon where we were camped, and we had to take her prisoner. She gave us no reliable information about the soldiers, simply repeating that she knew nothing, that it had been quite a while since she had last been in the area. She gave us information only about the roads. From what the old woman told us, we are now about one league about 3.5 miles from Iguera, another from Jagway, and a few more from Pucara. At 17.30, here he gives a name Anacito and, went to the old lady's house. One of her daughters is bedridden. They gave her 50 pesos and asked her to keep quiet, but they held out little hope she would do so despite her promises. The 17 of us set out under a slither of a moon. The march was exhausting, and we left tracks in the canyon we walked through. There were no nearby houses, just a few potato patches irrigated by ditches leading from the stream. Between two paramos it seems to say, paramos seem to be those hills bare of vegetation, so we continued to advance in that direction. Some things here cannot be well understood. The diary says, the army has information to the effect that there are 250 revolutionaries. And here the page ends. So he speaks of an area exactly like, or very similar to, that described earlier, which has to be crossed at night. And he gives the impression it is some kind of wooded valley bounded by rocky hills, bare of vegetation. That is the last thing he writes. It must have been almost dawn, because he says, 17 of us, under a slither of a moon. The march was exhausting, and we left tracks. We have tried to decipher all this. Sometimes there are words that almost have to be guessed at in order to make out the meaning. The diary refers to an area very similar to the one described in the wire service dispatch of September 29th and in the New York Times article of October 8th. Later there were many dispatches, and all of them always referred to a similar area. On September 29th, they talked about only one valley. Here they talk of several valleys, separated by hills, hills that are bare of vegetation, that are difficult to cross. They would either have had to make their way through the canyons or come out onto the higher ground, 
where it was impossible to move without being seen. The gorillas were apparently in a new area. This is made clear in the same entry, the same diary note of October 7th, which indicates they had basically been exploring the terrain. Che is there with 16 other men, because he says we left, 17 of us and scouted the area. And he says, we are now one league from here, two from here, six from there. They were trying to determine their exact location, they said, in order to determine what direction to set out in. There is quite a consistency in how the earlier reports, the later reports, and the contents of the diary all more or less explain the circumstances in the same way, the existence of a deserter, accurate information on how many men were with him, and the place where he was located. And there was the fact that they were in a new area. Any guerrilla unit scouting the terrain, any unit of troops in an area even when it has information, detailed maps for example, even when it has aerial photographs, everything can only really get to know a specific area on the ground. In fact, a guerrilla detachment scouting a wide area can wind up in an area like this one, an isolated area, a relatively isolated area, through going scouting. It may advance through mountains and suddenly reach a point where even the areas of vegetation, or the area of territory suited for guerrilla warfare, disappear, and it then becomes necessary to return to another area and continue scouting. This is one of the things we did in the Sierra Maestra in the beginning. We would send out scouting patrols to get to know a certain territory, until we were finally perfectly acquainted with it. We don't know whether the territory was really isolated, whether the territory where they were at the time could be cut off. We don't know whether it was made up of a valley or a series of valleys that could be entered or left here or there and was surrounded by areas that could not be crossed, by large stretches that could not be crossed in a night's journey. To know if the enemy's hopes were well founded, we would have to have information about the territory. But many times repressive armies entertain hopes of this type, and most of the time they are not well founded. So we can say that even though a battle did take place, this was not necessarily the only possible outcome. Clearly there were large-scale troop movements, and these troops moved in a direction determined by information they had. The territory they were in raised the hopes of the repressive forces because of an accidental encounter between the guerrilla forces and the repressive forces. If an accidental encounter took place, then the possibilities that Che might be killed increased, because of those traits of his that I explained earlier. It is clear that neither the guerrilla forces nor the repressive forces fell into an ambush. It is clear that a clash took place. And according to all indications it is clear that when this clash took place, Che carried out some sort of action. All the indications, all that is said, point to some action such as moving forward to sea, or moving forward to fire, or even moving away from the place perhaps a few steps, a few meters from where the rest of the combatants were. That is, everything seems to indicate that he carried out one of his characteristic actions, and it appears that he was seriously wounded very early and remained in a kind of no man's land. It is also clear that his comrades, probably seeing him wounded, seeing he was in danger, and inflamed by that fact, fought a prolonged battle that went far beyond any battle that a guerrilla detachment would fight under normal conditions. That battle lasted four hours, according to some, and five or six hours according to others. A guerrilla unit generally does not fight a battle of this type, since the enemy is always superior in numbers. If the enemy is given time, it may be able to surround the guerrillas. Only a guerrilla detachment inflamed under circumstances such as these would fight a battle of four, five, or six hours. Among other reasons, the ammunition of a guerrilla detachment tends to run out in a battle of that length. This is another factor that we evaluated and took into consideration. When you read a news dispatch, anyone who has guerrilla experience knows what happened. You know what happens when a repressive force falls into an ambush. This is unmistakable. Generally the repressive force that falls into an ambush loses its advance guard and loses many men. It may or may not also lose weapons, that depends on the number of guerrillas and on other circumstances. In the same way, when a guerrilla force falls into an ambush by repressive forces, 
since the guerrilla force is always numerically smaller, in general it cannot inflict casualties on the ambushers. This is simply a law of warfare. If that's the case, if in this instance there was no ambush on either side, if it was a clear-cut matter and really a prolonged battle, it is evident that something unusual happened. And the fact that the military reports spoke of so many soldiers wounded and killed, of 10 casualties, while also stating the number of casualties of the guerrillas first said to be 5 was rather strange and something to be concerned about. In the initial reports it was stated that Che was among the first to be wounded and that he was in a no man's land. These are the only circumstances that would make a guerrilla unit carry out a prolonged battle, one lasting from one in the afternoon until nightfall the only circumstances. And this aspect was something to be concerned about, because, in general, one or the other group falls into an ambush, and the characteristics of the situation are quite clear. But a guerrilla unit never wages a battle for five or six hours against troops that are numerically superior, have more ammunition, and in fact enjoy a whole series of advantages, including the ability to surround the guerrillas. Anyone with experience in guerrilla warfare knows that this battle was not an ambush by one side or the other, that it was not the type of battle characteristic of guerrilla warfare. And it is obvious that the abnormal circumstance in this case was the fact that Che was wounded. His comrades made a superhuman, desperate effort, risking everything. They kept fighting, inflicting ten casualties on the enemy according to the enemy's own account and perhaps even more. This is part of what I referred to before as the set of facts, circumstances and other things that helped us form a judgment about the situation. The question that is being debated as I said at the beginning is what happened afterwards. The question is whether Che died instantly or was seriously wounded and, after some hours, taken alive by the repressive forces. This is the question most under debate. Naturally, all of us who know Che understand that there was no way possible of capturing him alive unless he was unconscious, unless he was totally paralyzed by his wounds, unless his weapon had been destroyed and therefore had no way to avoid falling prisoner by killing himself. No one who knows him well has the slightest doubts about that. There is something more. The enemy itself, the officers of the enemy force themselves all are unanimous in attesting to Che's extraordinary courage, his conduct, and his scorn for danger. There has not been a single word that would attempt to deny him these characteristics. It is therefore difficult to believe that they could have captured him although it would not have been impossible, especially in the situation he was in, wounded in no man's land, unable to move, possibly unconscious. It is by no means impossible for them to have captured him while he was still alive. And it is on this point that a lot of tremendous confusions and contradictions have arisen, which perhaps explain the attitudes displayed and the events that happened afterward. I did not bring all the dispatches with me, because they make quite a bundle. But from the very beginning, when there was not a single official report, the rumors started rumors picked up by the reporters that Che was either dead or wounded, or that he had been captured after being wounded. The very first reports received spoke mainly of him as a wounded prisoner. Later, official statements began to be made. On October 10, for example, a wire service dispatch reported. High-ranking officers of the Bolivian army declared that it had been fully confirmed that the Argentine-Cuban guerrilla leader met his death in Bolivia yesterday after being seriously wounded the day before. General Alfredo Ovando, chief of the armed forces, reported that Che had identified himself and had admitted failure with the Bolivian guerrillas, who General Ovando said had been virtually wiped out. Nobody believed the part about Che having said such a thing. Even though we are thoroughly aware of his extraordinary frankness and invariable honesty, we must say that if he were able to speak under such circumstances, he would never say anything pleasing to the enemy. In fact, whatever the circumstances he would calmly say whatever would displease the enemy the most. But the problem is that this gentleman stated that Che died the following day as a result of his wounds. That is what he said. High officials confirmed the same version of events. Then the chief of the army division operating in the area comes on the scene and says that the battle took place in a canyon called El Uro, where the soldiers fought bravely, almost hand to hand, 
at a distance of no more than 50 meters. Zentino added that Guevara was found alive but seriously wounded, in a deep pass. Asked if Guevara said anything to his captors, Zentino contradicted Ovando's statement by responding that Guevara never had time to say anything. Ovando says Che was captured alive, seriously wounded. Another official says the same thing. But Ovando says Che told him who he was and that he had failed. The other official says Che said nothing, not even a word. Of course, a few days later the same gentleman declared once his contradiction with his chief had become evident, it seems that yes, Che was alive and had said the same things Ovando claims he said. But both of them declare that Che was alive. Naturally, it seems senseless to claim Che said such a thing, because nothing else they say is even remotely detrimental to him. They themselves acknowledge his integrity, his courage, everything about him. Che might just as easily have said, my name is this, that, or the other. That would have been in keeping with his character. What could he have said, and what did that gentleman hear? But both of them agree Che was alive. And these statements take on further importance when we take into consideration a whole series of later events. This is when the version emerges that he was captured when he was seriously wounded but still alive, and that he was then finished off that is, he was shot to death. In other words, not the slightest effort was made to take care of his wounds, no effort whatsoever was made to save his life. There is not the slightest evidence that he received any treatment, but there are many indications that what they actually did was to kill him. And this in spite of the fact that earlier reports always mentioned how Bolivian soldiers wounded in combat had been taken care of by the revolutionaries and then released. Of course, what else can you expect from a mercenary army, from mercenary officers, from a mercenary government? No one can give assurance that Che would have been able to survive his wounds, because the wounds must have been very serious. No one can say that he would have survived. But what is undeniable is that they made not the slightest effort to save him. It seems what they did was to kill him. How did all these contradictions come about? A whole lot of things have now become clear, because the doctors, as well as soldiers wounded in the battle, have begun to make statements. Here, for example, is a wire service dispatch we received yesterday. It says, Dr. Martinez Casso, one of the two physicians to see the body upon its arrival in Valle Grande, was interviewed there. He was asked if an autopsy had been performed. No, we made only a simple examination. Death must have occurred about five hours earlier, because the body was still warm, the physician answered. This means that if the body arrived at the hospital in Valle Grande around 5 p.m., October 9, death must have occurred around noon the same day. The physician added that the body showed bullet wounds, five of them in the legs, one in the throat, and the other one in the chest, below the left breast. This bullet pierced the heart and lung. This is the fatal wound, the doctor added. When the body was turned over to him he was told it was probably the body of an important person. This opinion was based on the perfect condition of the feet, which left the impression that the man was not accustomed to walking too much. So the body was delivered to the doctor and he discovered that death had occurred only a few hours earlier, that there was no sign of rigor mortis. And the fact remains that Ovando, the high-ranking officers, Colonel Zantino, everybody says that when they captured him, he was still alive. And the doctors say and everybody who knows a little bit about medicine agrees that nobody can live more than a few minutes with their heart pierced by a bullet. This is when all the suspicions began to emerge. Here is a dispatch from Interpress that reads. La Paz. A spectacular change seems to have come over the investigations made by observers into the circumstances surrounding the death of Ecobedo Che Guevara in a battle last Sunday, since José Martínez, a Bolivian physician who examined the body of the Argentine revolutionary Monday afternoon, stated that death had occurred only five hours before. This confirmation strengthens the opinions consistently expressed by well-known journalists present in the Army's anti-guerrilla center of operations that Guevara was given a coup de grace after he was captured alive, together with two other guerrillas. 
several official spokesmen share the same doubts as to how the principal organizer of the insurrectional movement died. To this may be added a new version, issued recently by a top, confidential military source, which says that Guevara's death was not caused by the wounds received in battle against the army in the El Uro ravine. The guerrilla leader died at 1.15 p.m. in La Higuera, where he had been taken before the battle had ended. According to the same military source, Che had been wounded in the legs. This is followed by a sentence whose meaning we can only guess at because it is mutilated. It says, but when a bullet put his rifle out of commission. That is, it seems this dispatch suggests that after being wounded, Che kept on fighting, firing his rifle until it was put out of commission. That is possible. There is nothing extraordinary about him fighting against the enemy while wounded. And many combatants have had their rifle destroyed in battle. The dispatch continues. But when a bullet destroyed his M2 rifle that had been adapted for use as a submachine gun, he was taken prisoner along with two other guerrillas who were apparently also wounded. When interrogated on Monday, Guevara did not answer a single question. If something like this happened, those of us who know Che well are aware that this is the only attitude he would adopt. And it says, he did not answer a single question, looking indifferently at his captors. It continues, the other two guerrillas were also killed that same day at La Higuera. That is, this news agency gives the version of how he was wounded, how he continued fighting while wounded. That is what it leads one to believe. Here is another dispatch, Dr. Jose Martinez Casso stated during an interview that one of the fatal shots was lodged in the heart and another in the lungs, but that when he examined the body, that is, the same news. Then this news agency says, Martinez's statement coincides with those of four wounded soldiers. Ah. Here it says that, according to the doctor, the soldiers told him that when Guevara saw them he advanced toward them and was hit. It continues, Martinez's statement coincides with those of four wounded soldiers who took part in the battle. The four said that they saw Guevara alive after the battle. One of them, named Taboda, said he was near Che when Che was hit, saying explicitly that Guevara was wounded in battle and that he was still alive then. So there have been a series of statements that repeatedly coincide with the first version, which tells of Che being taken prisoner after being seriously wounded. For him to be wounded while advancing on the soldiers would be something natural for him. And for him to continue fighting despite being wounded would also be characteristic of him. While he still had a breath of life, he could be captured only if he were unconscious, or if his weapon were destroyed, or if he couldn't move because of a serious wound. For them to question him and for him to look back at them with absolute indifference more than indifference, complete scorn for his captors all that is consistent with his personality, as would be his having died in battle. The most important thing is not whether he died in battle or was finished off later, after having been seriously wounded in battle. In itself, that is not the most important thing. What is important is the certainty that he had received fatal, or nearly fatal wounds that undoubtedly led, in one way or another, to his death. But a serious controversy has arisen around this point, and this explains in part, but only in part, what was later done with his body. Then comes a series of dispatches. One on October 11th says, the President of the Republic, General René Barrientos, told United Press International, UPI, tonight that the remains of Echo Beto Che Guevara, buried last night in a secret spot in the Bolivian Andes, will not be brought to La Paz, or be exhibited again. One of the stupid things that I said, added the head of state, is that the body would remain in Bolivia. It seems according to a dispatch from Bolivia that Che, in one of the entries in his diary, said that Barrientos is stupid. So that gentleman, alluding to that part of the diary, says that one of the stupid things he said was the matter referred to above. So on October 11th the claim is made that the body was buried in a secret place. The next day, October 12th, a dispatch stated the following. Journalists who say they have interviewed Roberto Guevara, Ernesto's brother, reported him to have said that General Alfredo Ovando, commander-in-chief of the armed forces, 
told him that the body of the Cuban Argentine revolutionary had been cremated today. That version was challenged tonight by official government sources. President René Barrientos knew absolutely nothing of this until at least 5 p.m. today, stated a high official in the foreign ministry. We would be greatly surprised if that were true, added the source, because it would have to have been a last-minute decision made by the armed forces, without notifying the president himself, which is difficult to believe. Then all the dispatches began to arrive indicating that Che had been buried, that the body had been exhumed, that it had been cremated, that they had cut off one of his hands, or a finger a whole series of dispatches, both macabre and contradictory. One can easily imagine that they would want to conceal proof that Che was killed while in custody. They were worried that a careful examination of all the details would reveal that a coup de grace had been administered. But in my opinion there is something they give even more weight to, which is what is behind all these strange things. And that something is their fear of Che even after his death. Not only were they afraid of him while he was alive, but even after his death they are still afraid, even more afraid. This is an idea they themselves began to promote when they removed Che's remains so the area could not become a shrine. They know instinctively that they are condemned by history. And they know it was a mere stroke of luck that they could physically eliminate Che. So it is logical that they would be afraid that Che's remains, or the site where they are buried, would become a shrine now or at some time in the future. They wish to deprive the revolutionary movement of even a symbol, a site, a spot. In a nutshell, they fear Che even after his death. In my opinion, the key factor in their behavior is not their concern to conceal whether or not they fired the final shot. The key factor is really their desire to get rid of Che's remains. They are afraid that his family might claim the body, that it might be buried at a specific site and become as they might call it a shrine, a revered spot for revolutionaries. That, in my opinion, is the real reason behind all this. These are more or less our impressions of how events occurred, our evaluation of the news items, of the whole series of strange and contradictory events after Che's death. We considered it our duty to discuss this information, to express this conviction, regardless of whether a state of uncertainty might be useful to the revolutionary movement. We considered it a moral question, a question of principle, a duty to the people, a duty to revolutionaries everywhere. In our opinion, the only one to benefit from indefinitely maintaining uncertainty and doubt, from maintaining false hopes among the masses, would be imperialism. We are not about to believe that the imperialist puppets in Bolivia, who are vying to be seen as the vanguard lackeys of imperialism, want us to doubt their news. It is clear that the imperialist puppets in Bolivia want the news to be believed, because it has to do with their role their part, their aspiration to be vanguard puppets. But as for the imperialists, who are quite subtle, there should not be the slightest doubt that, after eliminating Che physically, they would like to diminish the impact of his conduct, his example, his consistent, heroic, and revolutionary attitude. They would like to weaken that example, that impact, by clouding it with mystery, with uncertainty, with illusory hope. They would like five years, ten years, fifteen, or even twenty years to pass, with his example clouded by mystery, hovering between doubt and hope. Such hope is natural and understandable among all who find Che's death particularly painful. It is understandable among all who sympathize with and admire him, among revolutionaries throughout the world. Imperialism knows it has freed itself physically of Che. Its great aspiration now is to free itself of his spirit, to find some subtle way of dissolving his spirit into a vain, illusory hope a hope that, while never fulfilled, could, on the other hand, feed speculation and stories reporting, we saw him here and we saw him there. When a fabricated story relates things that can later be disproved, we are not worried. For a long time there were all sorts of suppositions and stories going around, all kinds of versions and interpretations of Che's absence, a host of gross statements, indecent slanders. We were never seriously concerned about this. We knew the facts, the truth, would eventually come out, 
and all the mistaken theories and interpretations, whether put forward in good or bad faith, would be shattered. We were not concerned. But we did have to concern ourselves about the possibility that a false hope might arise, with nothing concrete to contradict it. And that such a false hope with the passage of years and surrounded by the deepest mystery would only weaken the impact of one of the most extraordinary examples known to history of loyalty to revolutionary principles, of integrity, courage, generosity, and selflessness. The facts will soon give light to the imperialists' triumphant boasts that Che's death will discourage the revolutionary struggle. The imperialists, too, know the power, the tremendous power, of example. They know that while a person can be physically eliminated, an example such as Che's can never be eliminated, by anything or anyone. They are understandably deeply concerned about this. Newspapers of all tendencies and currents have universally recognized Che's virtues. Only in an exceptional case, among hundreds of viewpoints expressed, does the vulgar opinion of some scoundrel crop up. For Che's life had the virtue of impressing even his worst ideological enemies, causing them to admire him. It is an almost unique example of how a person can gain the recognition and respect of their enemies, of the very enemies they have faced, arms in hand, of their ideological enemies, who have in turn been almost unanimous in expressing feelings of admiration and respect for Che. It is understandable that this should worry imperialism. Many people, including a number of political figures, have stated that Europe has been astounded at the impact of the news about Che, at the tremendous interest in it. It has been a kind of awakening to the realities of our times. We sincerely believe and hold the opinion that the duty of telling the truth stands above all considerations of convenience and that has been our attitude. We must tell revolutionaries our conviction, our absolute certainty, our evaluation of the news reports. Furthermore, we must issue this warning so that imperialism will not be able to make use of doubts to bring about inaction and uncertainty. It is even possible that the fact that many revolutionaries were not convinced, or had doubts about the news, that may have kept them from speaking out. For no revolutionary so long as there is hope of any kind accepts news of this sort. And we know that revolutionaries have faith in the Cuban Revolution, that revolutionaries throughout the world have genuine faith in the word of the Cuban Revolution. We have come here once more to make good that faith, to demonstrate the justice in that faith in the absolute honesty of the revolution. No matter how bitter, how painful the circumstances including those we mentioned, of doubts among close relatives we cannot waver in fulfilling this duty. What good would it do for revolutionaries to maintain false hopes? What would be gained by that? Aren't revolutionaries the ones who must be prepared for whatever comes about, for all vicissitudes, including setbacks? Has the history of revolutions and revolutionary peoples been characterized by the absence of hard blows? Aren't true revolutionaries the ones who overcome these blows, these setbacks, without becoming discouraged? Isn't it precisely revolutionaries who preach the value of moral principles, the value of example? Aren't revolutionaries the ones who believe in the lasting quality of the work of human beings, of the principles of human beings? Aren't revolutionaries the first ones to acknowledge how ephemeral humanity's physical existence is, and how long-lasting and durable humanity's ideas, conduct, and example are since example is what has inspired and guided peoples throughout history? This is always the way it has been. Harder blows, Extremely hard blows were dealt to our revolution for independence with the death of Marty and with the death of Masio. Such blows have been dealt to many revolutionary movements, and they always overcame these setbacks and blows, no matter how hard they were. Who could deny what a blow Che's death is to the revolutionary movement, how much it means to no longer be able to count on his experience, his inspiration, the strength of his reputation, which instilled fear into reactionaries. It is a fierce blow, a very hard one. But we are sure that he more than anyone was convinced that what is most important is not a person's physical life but rather his conduct. This is the only way to explain and understand how Che's absolute contempt for danger fits in with his personality and actions. We must not lose time or allow the enemies of our ideology, the enemies of the revolution, 
to take the ideological offensive or to assume the psychological offensive in order to dishearten the revolutionary movement. Basing ourselves on the truth and recognition of the truth, and turning Che's example into invincible strength, the revolutionary movement must go forward, firmer and more determined than ever. I have carried out this bitter task. Perhaps it has not been an absolutely exhaustive analysis, but suffice it to say that analyzing everything, absolutely everything, we all the leaders of the revolution, all of us who are intimately familiar with Che's character we have all, unanimously, and without the slightest doubt, come to the same conclusion I have expressed to you. Today, the Council of Ministers met and adopted the following resolution. Whereas, the heroic commander Ecobedo Guevara died fighting for the liberation of the peoples of Latin America at the head of the Bolivian National Liberation Army. Whereas, the people of Cuba will always remember the extraordinary service rendered by Commander Ecobedo Guevara, both in our war of liberation and in the consolidation and advancement of our revolution. Whereas, his conduct embodies the spirit of internationalism that inspires the united struggle of the peoples. Whereas, his untiring revolutionary activity, which knew no borders, his communist thinking, and his unshakable determination to fight until victory or death in defense of the national and social liberation of the people of Latin America and against imperialism, constitute an example of revolutionary conviction and heroism that will last forever. It is resolved. First, that for 30 days, beginning with the signing of this resolution, the national flag be flown at half-mast, and that for three days, starting at midnight tonight, absolutely all public entertainment be suspended. Second, that the day of Che's heroic death in combat be declared a national memorial day, to that effect establishing October 8 as the day of the heroic guerrilla. Third, that as many activities be carried out as may be conducive to perpetuating Che's life and his example in the memory of future generations. At the same time, the Central Committee of our party has resolved. First, to create a commission made up of Commanders Juan Almeida, Ramiro Valdez, Regalio Acevedo and Alfonso Zayas, headed by the first of the aforementioned comrades, to orient and direct all activities aimed at perpetuating the memory of Commander Ecobedo Guevara. Second, to issue a call to the people to hold a solemn memorial gathering at the Revolution Plaza on Wednesday, October 18 at 8 p.m., to pay tribute to the unforgettable and heroic fighter who has died in combat. Chapter 3 Memorial for Che Guevara October 18, 1967 At a memorial rally for Che Guevara in Havana's Revolution Plaza on October 18, 1967, attended by almost one million people, Fidel Castro made the following remarks. I first met Che one day in July or August 1955. And in one night as he recalls in his account he became one of the future Granma expeditionaries, although at that time the expedition possessed neither ship, nor arms, nor troops. That was how, together with Raul, Che became one of the first two on the Granma list. Twelve years have passed since then, they have been twelve years filled with struggle and historical significance. During this time death has cut down many brave and invaluable lives. But at the same time, throughout those years of our revolution, extraordinary individuals have arisen, forged from among the people of the revolution, and between them, bonds of affection and friendship have emerged that surpass all possible description. Tonight we are meeting to try to express, in some degree, our feelings toward one who was among the closest, among the most admired, among the most beloved, and, without a doubt, the most extraordinary of our revolutionary comrades. We are here to express our feelings for him and for the heroes who have fought with him and fallen with him, his internationalist army that has been writing a glorious and indelible page of history. Che was one of those people who was liked immediately, for his simplicity, his character, his naturalness, his comradely attitude, his personality, his originality, even when one had not yet learned of his other characteristics and unique virtues. In those first days he was our troop doctor, and so the bonds of friendship and warm feelings for him were ever increasing. He was filled with a profound spirit of hatred and contempt for imperialism, 
not only because his political education was already considerably developed, but also because, shortly before, he had had the opportunity of witnessing the criminal imperialist intervention in Guatemala through the mercenaries who aborted the revolution in that country. A person like Che did not require elaborate arguments. It was sufficient for him to know Cuba was in a similar situation and that there were people determined to struggle against that situation, arms in hand. It was sufficient for him to know that those people were inspired by genuinely revolutionary and patriotic ideals. That was more than enough. One day, at the end of November 1956, he set out on the expedition toward Cuba with us. I recall that the trip was very hard for him, since, because of the circumstances under which it was necessary to organize the departure, he could not even provide himself with the medicine he needed. Throughout the trip, he suffered from a severe attack of asthma, with nothing to alleviate it, but also without ever complaining. We arrived, set out on our first march, suffered our first setback, and at the end of some weeks, as you all know, a group of those Granma expeditionaries who had survived was able to reunite. Che continued to be the doctor of our group. We came through the first battle victorious, and Che was already a soldier of our troop, at the same time he was still our doctor. We came through the second victorious battle and Che was not only a soldier, but the most outstanding soldier in that battle, carrying out for the first time one of those singular feats that characterized him in all military action. Our forces continued to develop and we soon faced another battle of extraordinary importance. The situation was difficult. The information we had was erroneous in many respects. We were going to attack in full daylight at dawn a strongly defended, well-armed position at the edge of the sea. Enemy troops were at our rear, not very far, and in that confused situation it was necessary to ask people to make a supreme effort. Companero Juan Almeida had taken on one of the most difficult missions, but one of the flanks remained completely without forces one of the flanks was left without an attacking force, placing the operation in danger. At that moment, Che, who was still functioning as our doctor, asked for three or four men, among them one with a machine gun, and in a matter of seconds set off rapidly to assume the mission of attack from that direction. On that occasion he was not only an outstanding combatant but also an outstanding doctor, attending the wounded comrades and, at the same time, attending the wounded enemy soldiers. After all the weapons had been captured and it became necessary to abandon that position, undertaking a long return march under the harassment of various enemy forces, someone had to stay behind with the wounded, and it was Che who did so. Aided by a small group of our soldiers, he took care of them, saved their lives, and later rejoined the column with them. From that time onward, he stood out as a capable and valiant leader, one of those who, when a difficult mission is pending, do not wait to be asked to carry it out. Thus it was at the Battle of El Yavaro. But he acted in a similar way on a previously unmentioned occasion during the first days when, following a betrayal, our little troop was attacked by surprise by a number of planes and we were forced to retreat under the bombardment. We had already walked a distance when we remembered some rifles of some peasant soldiers who had been with us in the first actions and had then asked permission to visit their families, at a time when there was still not much discipline in our embryonic army. At that moment, we thought the rifles might have to be given up for lost. But I recall it took no more than simply raising the problem for Che, despite the bombing, to volunteer, and having done so, quickly go to recover those rifles. This was one of his principal characteristics, his willingness to instantly volunteer for the most dangerous mission. And naturally this aroused admiration and twice the usual admiration, for a fellow combatant fighting alongside us who had not been born here, a person of profound ideas, a person in whose mind stirred the dream of struggle in other parts of the continent and who nonetheless was so altruistic, so selfless, so willing to always do the most difficult things, to constantly risk his life. That was how he won the rank of commander and leader of the second column organized in the Sierra Maestra. Thus his standing began to increase. He began to develop as a magnificent combatant who was to reach the highest ranks in the course of the war. Che was an incomparable soldier. 
Che was an incomparable leader. Che was, from a military point of view, an extraordinarily capable person, extraordinarily courageous, extraordinarily combative. If, as a gorilla, he had his Achilles heel, it was this excessively combative quality, his absolute contempt for danger. The enemy believes it can draw certain conclusions from his death. Che was a master of warfare. He was an artist of guerrilla struggle. And he showed that an infinite number of times. But he showed it especially in two extraordinary deeds. One of these was the invasion, in which he led a column, a column pursued by thousands of enemy soldiers over flat and absolutely unknown terrain, carrying out together with Camillosi and Fuegos an extraordinary military accomplishment. He also showed it in his lightning campaign in Las Villas province, especially in the audacious attack on the city of Santa Clara, entering with a column of barely 300 men a city defended by tanks, artillery, and several thousand infantry soldiers. Those two heroic deeds stamped him as an extraordinarily capable leader, as a master, as an artist of revolutionary war. However, now after his heroic and glorious death, some people attempt to deny the truth or value of his concepts, his guerrilla theories. The artist may die especially when he is an artist in a field as dangerous as revolutionary struggle but what will surely never die is the art to which he dedicated his life, the art to which he dedicated his intelligence. What is so strange about the fact that this artist died in combat? It is stranger that he did not die in combat on one of the innumerable occasions he risked his life during our revolutionary struggle. Many times it was necessary to take steps to keep him from losing his life in actions of minor significance. And so it was in combat in one of the many battles he fought that he lost his life. We do not have sufficient evidence to enable us to deduce what circumstances preceded that combat, or how far he may have acted in an excessively combative way. But, we repeat, if as a gorilla he had an Achilles heel, it was his excessive combativity, his absolute contempt for danger. And this is where we can hardly agree with him, since we consider that his life, his experience, his capacity as a seasoned leader, his authority and everything his life signified, were more valuable, incomparably more valuable than he himself, perhaps, believed. His conduct may have been profoundly influenced by the idea that individuals have a relative value in history, the idea that causes are not defeated when one person falls, that the powerful march of history cannot and will not be halted when leaders fall. That is true, there is no doubt about it. It shows his faith in people, his faith in ideas, his faith in examples. However as I said a few days ago with all our heart we would have liked to see him as a forger of victories, to see victories forged under his command, under his leadership, since people of his experience, his caliber, his really unique capacity, are not common. We fully appreciate the value of his example. We are absolutely convinced that many people will strive to live up to his example, that people like him will emerge. It is not easy to find a person with all the virtues that were combined in Che. It is not easy for a person to spontaneously develop a character like his. I would say that he is one of those people who are difficult to match and virtually impossible to surpass. But I would also say that the example of people like him contributes to the appearance of others of the same caliber. In Che, we admire not only the fighter, the person capable of performing great feats. What he did, what he was doing, the very fact of his confronting, with a handful of men, the army of the oligarchy, trained by U.S. advisors sent in by U.S. imperialism, backed by the oligarchies of all neighboring countries that in itself constitutes an extraordinary feat. If we search the pages of history, it is likely that we will find no other case in which a leader with such a limited number of men has set about a task of such importance, a case in which a leader with such a limited number of men has set out to fight against such large forces. Such proof of confidence in himself, such proof of confidence in the people's, such proof of faith in the people's capacity to fight, can be looked for in the pages of history but the likes of it will never be found. And he fell. The enemy believes it has defeated his ideas, his guerrilla concepts, his point of view on revolutionary armed struggle. What they accomplished, 
by a stroke of luck, was to eliminate him physically. What they accomplished was to gain an accidental advantage that an enemy may gain in war. We do not know to what degree that stroke of luck, that stroke of fortune, was helped along, in a battle like many others, by that characteristic of which we spoke before, his excessive combativity, his absolute disdain for danger. This also happened in our War of Independence. In a battle at Dos Rios they killed José Martí, the apostle of our independence, in a battle at Punta Brava, they killed Antonio Macio, a veteran of hundreds of battles in the Cuban War of Independence. Countless leaders, countless patriots of our War of Independence were killed in similar battles. Nevertheless, that did not spell defeat for the Cuban cause. The death of Che as we said a few days ago is a hard blow, a tremendous blow for the revolutionary movement because it deprives it, without a doubt, of its most experienced and able leader. But those who boast of victory are mistaken. They are mistaken when they think that his death is the end of his ideas, the end of his tactics, the end of his guerrilla concepts, the end of his theory. For the man who fell, as a mortal being, as someone who faced bullets time and again, as a soldier, as a leader, was a thousand times more able than those who killed him by a stroke of luck. However, how should revolutionaries face the serious setback? How should they face this loss? If Che had to express an opinion on this point, what would it be? He gave this opinion, he expressed this opinion quite clearly when he wrote in his message to the Tricontinental Latin American Solidarity Conference that if death surprised him anywhere, it would be welcome as long as his battle cry had reached a receptive ear and another hand reached out to take up his rifle. His battle cry will reach not just one receptive ear, but millions of receptive ears. And not one hand, but millions of hands, inspired by his example, will reach out to take up arms. New leaders will emerge. People with receptive ears and outstretched hands will need leaders who emerge from their ranks, just as leaders have emerged in all revolutions. Those hands will not have available a leader of Che's extraordinary experience and enormous ability. Those leaders will be formed in the process of struggle. Those leaders will emerge from among the millions of receptive ears, from the millions of hands that will sooner or later reach out to take up arms. It is not that we feel that his death will necessarily have immediate repercussions in the practical sphere of revolutionary struggle, that his death will necessarily have immediate repercussions in the practical sphere of development of this struggle. The fact is that when Che took up arms again he was not thinking of an immediate victory, he was not thinking of a speedy victory against the forces of the oligarchies and imperialism. As an experienced fighter, he was prepared for a prolonged struggle of 5, 10, 15, or 20 years, if necessary. He was ready to fight 5, 10, 15, or 20 years, or all his life if need be. And within that perspective, his death, or rather his example will have tremendous repercussions. The force of that example will be invincible. Those who attach significance to the lucky blow that struck Che down try in vain to deny his experience and his capacity as a leader. Che was an extraordinarily able military leader. But when we remember Che, when we think of Che, we do not think fundamentally of his military virtues. No. Warfare is a means and not an end. Warfare is a tool of revolutionaries. The important thing is the revolution. The important thing is the revolutionary cause, revolutionary ideas, revolutionary objectives, revolutionary sentiments, revolutionary virtues. And it is in that field, in the field of ideas, of sentiments, of revolutionary virtues, of intelligence, that apart from his military virtues we feel the tremendous loss his death means to the revolutionary movement. Che's extraordinary character was made up of virtues that are rarely found together. He stood out as an unsurpassed man of action, but Che was not only that he was also a person of visionary intelligence and broad culture, a profound thinker. That is, the man of ideas and the man of action were combined within him. But it is not only that Che possessed the double characteristic of the man of ideas of profound ideas and the man of action, but that Che as a revolutionary united in himself the virtues that can be defined as the fullest expression of the virtues of a revolutionary, 
a person of total integrity, a person with a supreme sense of honor and absolute sincerity, a person of stoic and spartan living habits, a person in whose conduct not one stain can be found. He constituted, through his virtues, what can be called a truly model revolutionary. When someone dies it is usual to make speeches, to emphasize their virtues. But rarely can one say of someone with greater justice, with greater accuracy, what we say of Che on this occasion, that he was a pure example of revolutionary virtues. But he possessed another quality, not a quality of the intellect or of the will, not a quality derived from experience, from struggle, but a quality of the heart, he was an extraordinary human being, extraordinarily sensitive. That is why we say, when we think of his life, when we think of his conduct, that he constituted the singular case of a most extraordinary human being, able to unite in his personality not only the characteristics of the man of action, but also the man of thought, the person of immaculate revolutionary virtues and of extraordinary human sensibility, joined with an iron character, a will of steel, indomitable tenacity. Because of this, he has left to the future generations not only his experience, his knowledge as an outstanding soldier, but also, at the same time, the fruits of his intelligence. He wrote with the virtuosity of a master of our language. His narratives of the war are incomparable. The depth of his thinking is impressive. He never wrote about anything with less than extraordinary seriousness, with less than extraordinary profundity and we have no doubt that some of his writings will pass on to posterity as classic documents of revolutionary thought. As fruits of that vigorous and profound intelligence, he left us countless memories, countless narratives that, without his work, without his efforts, might have been lost forever. An indefatigable worker, during the years that he served our country he did not know a single day of rest. The responsibilities assigned to him were many, President of the National Bank, Director of the Central Planning Board, Minister of Industry, Commander of Military Regions, the head of political or economic or fraternal delegations. His versatile intelligence was able to undertake with maximum assurance any task of any kind. He brilliantly represented our country in numerous international conferences, just as he brilliantly led soldiers in combat, just as he was a model worker in charge of any of the institutions he was assigned to. And for him there were no days of rest, for him there were no hours of rest. If we looked through the windows of his offices, he had the lights on all hours of the night, studying, or rather, working and studying. For he was a student of all problems, he was a tireless reader. His thirst for learning was practically insatiable, and the hours he stole from sleep he devoted to study. He devoted his scheduled days off to voluntary work. He was the inspiration and provided the greatest incentive for the work that is today carried out by hundreds of thousands of people throughout the country. He stimulated that activity in which our people are making greater and greater efforts. As a revolutionary, as a communist revolutionary, a true communist, he had a boundless faith in moral values. He had a boundless faith in the consciousness of human beings. And we should say that he saw, with absolute clarity, the moral impulse as the fundamental lever in the construction of communism in human society. He thought, developed, and wrote many things. And on a day like today it should be stated that Che's writings, Che's political and revolutionary thought, will be of permanent value to the Cuban revolutionary process and to the Latin American revolutionary process. And we do not doubt that his ideas as a man of action, as a man of thought, as a person of untarnished moral virtues, as a person of unexcelled human sensitivity, as a person of spotless conduct have and will continue to have universal value. The imperialists boast of their triumph at having killed this guerrilla fighter in action. The imperialists boast of a triumphant stroke of luck that led to the elimination of such a formidable man of action. But perhaps the imperialists do not know or pretend not to know that the man of action was only one of the many facets of the personality of that combatant. And if we speak of sorrow, we are saddened not only at having lost a person of action. We are saddened at having lost a person of virtue. We are saddened at having lost a person of unsurpassed human sensitivity. 
We are saddened at having lost such a mind. We are saddened to think that he was only 39 years old at the time of his death. We are saddened at missing the additional fruits we would have received from that intelligence and that ever richer experience. We have an idea of the dimension of the loss for the revolutionary movement. And, here is the weak side of the imperialist enemy, they think that by eliminating a person physically they have eliminated his thinking that by eliminating him physically they have eliminated his ideas, eliminated his virtues, eliminated his example. They are so shameless in this belief that they have no hesitation in making it public, as if it were the most natural thing in the world, the by now almost universally accepted circumstances in which they murdered him after he had been seriously wounded in action. They do not even seem aware of the repugnance of the procedure, of the shamelessness of the acknowledgement. They have publicized it as if thugs, oligarchs, and mercenaries had the right to shoot a seriously wounded revolutionary combatant. Even worse, they explain why they did it. They assert that Che's trial would have been quite an earth shaker, that it would have been impossible to place this revolutionary in the dock. And not only that, they have not hesitated to spirit away his remains. Whether it is true or false, they certainly announced they had cremated his body, thus beginning to show their fear, beginning to show that they are not so sure that by physically eliminating the combatant, they can eliminate his ideas, eliminate his example. Che died defending no other interest, no other cause than the cause of the exploited and the oppressed of this continent. Che died defending no other cause than the cause of the poor and the humble of this earth. And the exemplary manner and the selflessness with which he defended that cause cannot be disputed even by his most bitter enemies. In history, people who act as he did, people who do and give everything for the cause of the poor, grow in stature with each passing day and find a deeper place in the heart of the peoples with each passing day. The imperialist enemies are beginning to see this, and it will not be long before it will be proved that his death will, in the long run, be like a seed that will give rise to many people determined to imitate him, many people determined to follow his example. We are absolutely convinced that the revolutionary cause on this continent will recover from the blow, that the revolutionary movement on this continent will not be crushed by this blow. From the revolutionary point of view, from the point of view of our people, how should we view Che's example? Do we feel we have lost him? It is true that we will not read new writings of his. It is true that we will never again hear his voice. But Che has left a heritage to the world, a great heritage, and we who knew him so well can become in large measure his beneficiaries. He left us his revolutionary thinking, his revolutionary virtues. He left us his character, his will, his tenacity, his spirit of work. In a word, he left us his example. And Che's example will be a model for our people. Che's example will be the ideal model for our people. If we wish to express what we expect our revolutionary combatants, our militants, our people to be, we must say, without hesitation, let them be like Che. If we wish to express what we want the people of future generations to be, we must say, let them be like Che. If we wish to say how we want our children to be educated, we must say without hesitation, we want them to be educated in Che's spirit. If we want the model of a person, the model of a human being who does not belong to our time but to the future, I say from the depths of my heart that such a model, without a single stain on his conduct, without a single stain on his action, without a single stain on his behavior, is Che. If we wish to express what we want our children to be, we must say from our very hearts as ardent revolutionaries, we want them to be like Che. Che has become a model of what future humans should be, not only for our people but also for people everywhere in Latin America. Che carried to its highest expression revolutionary stoicism, the revolutionary spirit of sacrifice, revolutionary combativeness, the revolutionary spirit of work. Che brought the ideas of Marxism-Leninism to their freshest, purest, most revolutionary expression. No other person of our time has carried the spirit of proletarian internationalism to its highest possible level as Che did. When one speaks of a proletarian internationalist, and when an example of a proletarian internationalist is sought, that example, high above any other, 
will be the example of Che. National flags, prejudices, chauvinism, and egoism had disappeared from his mind and heart. He was ready to shed his generous blood spontaneously and immediately, on behalf of any people, for the cause of any people. Thus, his blood fell on our soil when he was wounded in several battles, and his blood was shed in Bolivia, for the liberation of the exploited and the oppressed, of the humble and the poor. That blood was shed for the sake of all the exploited and all the oppressed. That blood was shed for all the peoples of the Americas and for the people of Vietnam because while fighting there in Bolivia, fighting against the oligarchies and imperialism, he knew that he was offering Vietnam the highest possible expression of his solidarity. It is for this reason, comrades of the revolution, that we must face the future with firmness and determination, with optimism. And in Che's example, we will always look for inspiration inspiration in struggle, inspiration in tenacity, inspiration in intransigence toward the enemy, inspiration in internationalist feeling. Therefore, after tonight's moving ceremony, after this incredible demonstration of vast popular recognition incredible for its magnitude, discipline, and spirit of devotion which demonstrates that our people are a sensitive, grateful people who know how to honor the memory of the brave who die in combat, that our people recognize those who serve them, which demonstrates the people's solidarity with the revolutionary struggle and how this people will raise high and maintain ever higher. Revolutionary banners and revolutionary principles today, in these moments of remembrance, let us lift our spirits and, with optimism in the future, with absolute optimism in the final victory of the peoples, say to Che and to the heroes who fought and died with him. Hasta la victoria siempre. Ever onward to victory. Patria o muerte. Homeland or death. Vence Ramos. We will win. Chapter 4 A Necessary Introduction 1968 The diary kept by Che Guevara during the guerrilla campaign in Bolivia was confiscated following his capture on October 8, 1967. Journalists were able to photograph several pages of it and copies were made for the Pentagon and the CIA. Almost immediately, excerpts of the diary that had been falsified or taken out of context were circulated in an attempt to discredit Che and the guerrilla movement. Parts of Che's diary were used as evidence by the prosecution at the trial of the French journalist Regis Debray, who had been captured after spending time with the guerrillas in Bolivia. The Bolivian regime then pursued efforts to sell the publication rights which they claimed belonged to them as a war trophy for more than $300,000. These plans were short-lived, however, when the Cuban government obtained photocopies of the diary from Bolivia's Minister of the Interior, Antonio Argudas. When his role in this became known, Argudas was forced to flee Bolivia. Before proceeding with its publication of the diary, the Cuban government conducted a rigorous check of the manuscript to verify its authenticity. Aleta March, the partner of Che Guevara and now director of the Havana-based Che Guevara Studies Center, transcribed Che Guevara's handwritten and often illegible notes. This process was aided by three Cuban survivors of the campaign, who had escaped the army's ambush and made their way through the Andes to Chile on foot. On July 1, 1968, the diary was published and distributed free of charge to the people of Cuba. Arrangements were also made for its translation and publication in a number of other countries. An English version appeared in Ramparts magazine in a special edition of more than 200,000 copies. The following is Fidel Castro's introduction to the first authorized edition of Che's Bolivian diary, which he described as necessary because of the Barrientos government's attempt to manipulate it. It was Che's custom during his days as a guerrilla during the 1956-58 Cuban Revolutionary War to carefully record his daily observations in a personal diary. During long marches over rugged and difficult terrain, in the midst of damp woods, when the lines of men, always hunched over from the weight of their packs, ammunition, and weapons, would stop for a moment to rest, or when the column would receive orders to halt and set up camp at the end of an exhausting day's march, you would see Che as he was affectionately nicknamed by the Cubans from the beginning take out a small notebook and, with the tiny and nearly illegible handwriting of a doctor, write his notes. 
what he was able to save from these notes he later used in writing his magnificent historical narratives of the Revolutionary War in Cuba accounts full of revolutionary, educational, and human content reminiscences of the Cuban Revolutionary War, Ocean Press, 2006. This time, thanks to his invariable habit of noting the main events of each day, we have at our disposal rigorously exact, priceless, and detailed information on the heroic final months of his life in Bolivia. These notes, not really written for publication, served as a tool in the constant evaluation of events, situations, and people, and at the same time served as an outlet for the expression of his keenly observant and analytical spirit, often laced with a fine sense of humor. They are soberly written and form a coherent whole from beginning to end. It should be kept in mind that they were written during those rare moments of rest in the midst of a heroic and superhuman physical effort, where he bore exhausting obligations as leader of a guerrilla detachment in the difficult first stages of a struggle of this nature, which unfolded under incredibly harsh material conditions. This reveals once more his method of work, his will of steel. The diary, in the course of analyzing in detail the incidents of each day, takes note of the shortcomings, critical assessments, and recriminations that are part of and inevitable in the development of a revolutionary guerrilla struggle. Inside a guerrilla detachment such assessments must take place constantly. This is especially true in the stage in which it consists of a small nucleus facing extremely adverse material conditions and an enemy infinitely superior in number, when the slightest negligence or the most insignificant mistake can be fatal. The leader must be extremely demanding, using each event or episode, no matter how insignificant it may seem, to educate the combatants and future cotters of new guerrilla detachments. The process of training a guerrilla force is a constant appeal to each person's consciousness and honor. Che knew how to touch the most sensitive fibers in revolutionaries. When Marcos, after being repeatedly admonished by Che, was warned that he could be dishonorably discharged from the guerrilla unit, he replied, I would rather be shot. Later he gave his life heroically. Similar behavior could be noted among all those in whom Che placed confidence and those he had to admonish for one reason or another in the course of the struggle. He was a fraternal and humane leader, but he also knew how to be demanding and, at times, severe. But above all, and even more than with others, Che was severe with himself. He based discipline on the guerrilla's moral consciousness and on the tremendous force of his own example. The diary also contains numerous references to Regis de Bray, it reflects the enormous concern Che felt over the arrest and imprisonment of the revolutionary writer who had been given a mission to carry out in Europe although at heart Che would have preferred him to have stayed with the guerrilla unit, which is why Che shows a certain uneasiness and, on occasion, some doubts about his behavior. Che had no way of knowing the odyssey de Bray experienced in the hands of the repressive forces, or the firm and courageous attitude he maintained in face of his captors and torturers. He noted, however, the enormous political significance of the trial and on October 3, six days before his death, in the midst of bitter and tense events, he wrote, We heard an interview with Debray, very courageous when faced by a student acting as an agent provocateur. This was his last reference to the writer. The Cuban Revolution and its relation to the guerrilla movement are repeatedly referred to in the diary. Some may interpret our decision to publish it as an act of provocation that will give the enemies of the revolution the U.S. imperialists and their allies, the Latin American oligarchs arguments for redoubling their efforts to blockade, isolate, and attack Cuba. Those who judge the facts this way should remember that U.S. imperialism has never needed a pretext to carry out its crimes anywhere in the world, and that its efforts to crush the Cuban Revolution began as soon as our country passed its first revolutionary law. This stems from the obvious and well-known fact that imperialism is the policeman of world reaction, the systematic supporter of counter-revolution, and the protector of the most backward and inhuman social structures that still exist in the world. Solidarity with the revolutionary movement may be taken as a pretext for U.S. aggression, but it will never be the real cause. To deny solidarity in order to avoid giving a pretext is a ridiculous, ostrich-like policy that has nothing to do with the internationalist character of today's social revolutions. 
to abandon solidarity with the revolutionary movement not only does not avoid providing a pretext, but in effect serves to support U.S. imperialism and its policy of dominating and enslaving the world. Cuba is a small country, economically underdeveloped as are all countries dominated and exploited for centuries by colonialism and imperialism. It is located only 90 miles from the coast of the United States, has a U.S. naval base on its territory Guantanamo, and faces numerous obstacles in attaining socio-economic development. Grave dangers have threatened our country since the triumph of the revolution, but imperialism will never make us yield for these reasons, because the difficulties that flow from a consistently revolutionary line of action are of no importance to us. From the revolutionary point of view, there is no alternative but to publish Che's Bolivian diary. It fell into the hands of President René Barrientos, who immediately sent copies to the CIA, the Pentagon, and the U.S. government. Journalists with links to the CIA had access to the document inside Bolivia, having made photocopies of it, they promised to refrain, for the moment, from publishing it. The Barrientos government and the top-ranking military officers have more than enough reasons not to publish the diary. It reveals the immense incapacity of their army and the countless defeats they were dealt by a handful of determined guerrillas who, in a matter of weeks, took nearly 200 weapons from them in combat. Furthermore, Che describes Barrientos and his regime in terms they deserve, with words that cannot be erased from history. Imperialism also had its own reasons, Che and the extraordinary example he set are gaining increasing force in the world. His ideas, image, and name are banners of struggle against the injustices suffered by the oppressed and exploited, they evoke impassioned interest among students and intellectuals throughout the world. In the United States itself, the black rights movement and progressive students, both of which are continuing to grow in numbers, have made Che's figure their own. In the most combative demonstrations for civil rights and against the aggression in Vietnam, his image is brandished as a symbol of struggle. Few times in history, perhaps never before, has a figure, a name, an example become a universal symbol so quickly and with such impassioned force. This is because Che embodies, in its purest and most selfless form, the internationalist spirit that marks the world of today and that will characterize even more the world of tomorrow. Arising from a continent yesterday oppressed by colonial powers, today exploited and held in backwardness and the most iniquitous underdevelopment by U.S. imperialism, there has emerged this singular figure who has become the universal symbol of revolutionary struggle, even in the metropolitan centers of the imperialists and colonialists. The U.S. imperialists fear the power of this example and everything that may help to spread it. The diary is the living expression of an extraordinary personality, a lesson in guerrilla warfare written in the heat and tension of daily events, as flammable as gunpowder, a demonstration in life that the people of Latin America are not powerless in face of the enslavers of entire peoples and of their mercenary armies. That is its intrinsic value, and that is what has kept them from publishing it up to now. Also among those who may be interested in keeping the diary unpublished are the pseudo-revolutionaries, opportunists, and charlatans of every stripe. These people call themselves Marxists, Communists, and other such titles. They have not, however, hesitated to call Che a mistaken adventurer or, when they speak more benignly, an idealist whose death marked the swan song of revolutionary armed struggle in Latin America. If Che himself, they say, the greatest exponent of these ideas and an experienced guerrilla fighter, died in the guerrilla struggle and his movement failed to free Bolivia, it only shows how mistaken he was. How many of these miserable creatures were happy with the death of Che and have not even blushed at the thought that their stance and arguments completely coincide with those of imperialism and the most reactionary oligarchs. That is how they justify themselves. That is how they justify their treacherous leaders who, at a given moment, did not hesitate to play at armed struggle with the underlying intention as would be seen later of destroying the guerrilla detachments, putting the brakes on revolutionary action, and imposing their own shameful and ridiculous political schemes, because they were absolutely incapable of carrying out any other line. That is how they justify those who do not want to fight, who will never fight for the people and their liberation.
that is how they justify those who have made a caricature of revolutionary ideas, turning them into an opium-like dogma with neither content nor message for the masses, those who have converted the organizations of popular struggle into instruments of conciliation with domestic and foreign exploiters, and those who advocate policies that have nothing to do with the genuine interests of the exploited peoples of this continent. Che thought of his death as something natural and probable in the process, he made an effort to stress, especially in his last writings, that this eventuality would not hold back the inevitable march of the Latin American Revolution. In his message to the Tricontinental, he reiterated this thought, our every action is a battle cry against imperialism. Wherever death may surprise us, let it be welcome if our battle cry has reached even one receptive ear, if another hand reaches out to take up our arms, Che gave our reader, Ocean Press, 2003. Che considered himself a soldier in the revolution, with absolutely no concern as to whether he would survive it. Those who see the outcome of his struggle in Bolivia as marking the failure of his ideas can, with the same oversimplification, deny the validity of the ideas and struggles of all the great revolutionary precursors and thinkers, this includes the founders of Marxism, who were themselves unable to complete the task and to see in life the fruits of their noble efforts. In Cuba, Jose Marti and Antonio Macio were killed in combat, U.S. intervention followed, ending the War of Independence and frustrating the immediate objectives of their struggle. Brilliant advocates of socialist revolution, like Julio Antonio Mella, have been killed, murdered by agents in the service of imperialism. But these deaths could not, in the long run, block the triumph of a process that began 100 years ago. And absolutely nothing can call into question the profound justice of the cause and line of struggle of those eminent fighters, or the timeliness of their basic ideas, which have always inspired Cuban revolutionaries. In Che's diary, from the notes he wrote, you can see how real the possibilities of success were, how extraordinary the catalyzing power of the guerrilla struggle. On one occasion, in the face of evident signs of the Bolivian regime's weakness and rapid deterioration, he wrote, the government is disintegrating rapidly. What a pity we don't have 100 more men right now. Che knew from his experience in Cuba how often our small guerrilla detachment had been on the verge of being wiped out. Whether such things happen depends almost entirely on chance and the imponderables of war. But would such an eventuality have given anyone the right to consider our line erroneous, and, in addition, to take it as an example to discourage revolution and inculcate a sense of powerlessness among the peoples? Many times in history revolutionary processes have been preceded by adverse episodes. We ourselves in Cuba, didn't we have the experience of Moncada just six years before the definitive triumph of the people's armed struggle? From July 26, 1953 the attack on the Moncada garrison in Santiago de Cuba to December 2, 1956 the landing of the Granma revolutionary struggle in Cuba in the face of a modern, well-equipped army seemed to many people to lack any prospect for success, the action of a handful of fighters was seen as a chimera of idealists and dreamers who were deeply mistaken. The crushing defeat and total dispersal of the inexperienced guerrilla detachment by Batista's troops on December 5, 1956, seemed to confirm entirely those pessimistic forebodings. But only 25 months later the remnants of that guerrilla unit had developed the strength and experience necessary to annihilate that same army. In all epochs and under all circumstances, there will always be an abundance of pretexts for not fighting, but not fighting is the only way to never attain freedom. Che did not live as long as his ideas, he fertilized them with his blood. It is certain, on the other hand, that his pseudo-revolutionary critics, with all their political cowardice and eternal lack of action, will outlive by far the evidence of their own stupidity. Worth noting in the diary are the actions of one of those revolutionary specimens that are becoming typical in Latin America these days, Mario Monge, brandishing the title of Secretary of the Bolivian Communist Party, sought to dispute with Che the political and military leadership of the movement. Monge claimed, moreover, that he had intended to resign his party post to take on this responsibility, in his opinion, obviously, it was enough to have once held that title to claim such a prerogative. 
Mario Manje, naturally, had no experience in guerrilla warfare and had never been in combat. In addition, the fact that he considered himself a communist should at least have obliged him to dispense with the gross and mundane chauvinism that had already been overcome by those who fought for Bolivia's first independence. With such a conception of what an anti-imperialist struggle on this continent should be, communist leaders of this type do not even surpass the level of internationalism of the aboriginal tribes subjugated by the European colonizers in the epoch of the conquest. Bolivia and its historical capital, Sucre, were named after the country's first liberators Simon Bolivar and Antonio José de Sucre, both of whom were Venezuelan. And in this country, in a struggle for the definitive liberation of his people, the leader of the Bolivian Communist Party had the possibility of enlisting the cooperation of the political, organizational and military talent of a genuine revolutionary titan, a person whose cause was not limited by the narrow and artificial not to mention unjust borders of Bolivia. Yet he did nothing but engage in disgraceful, ridiculous and unjustified claims to leadership. Bolivia has no outlet to the sea, and therefore, for its own liberation and to avoid exposure to a cruel blockade, it more than any other country needs revolutionary victories by its neighbors. Che, because of his enormous authority, ability and experience, was the person who could have accelerated this process. In the period before a split occurred in the Bolivian Communist Party, Che had established relations with leaders and members, soliciting their help for the revolutionary movement in South America. With authorization from the party, some members worked with Che for years on various assignments. When the split occurred, it created a special situation, given that a number of the people who had been working with him ended up in one or another group. But Che did not see the struggle in Bolivia as an isolated occurrence, rather as part of a revolutionary liberation movement that would soon extend to other countries in South America. He sought to organize a movement free of sectarianism, one that could be joined by anyone who wanted to fight for the liberation of Bolivia and of all the other peoples of Latin America subjugated by imperialism. In the initial phase of preparing a base for the guerrilla unit, however, Che depended for the most part on the help of a group of courageous and discreet collaborators who, at the time of the split, remained in the party headed by Manje. Although he certainly felt no sympathy toward Manje, in deference to them he invited Manje to visit his camp first. He then invited Moises Guevara, a leader of the mine workers and a political leader. Moises Guevara had left the party to join in the formation of another organization, the one led by Oscar Zamora. He later left that group because of differences with Zamora, who proved to be another Manje. Zamora had once promised Che he would help in organizing the armed guerrilla struggle in Bolivia, but later backed away from that commitment and cowardly folded his arms when the hour of action arrived. After Che's death, Zamora became one of his most venomous Marxist-Leninist critics. Moises Guevara joined Che without hesitation, as he had sought to do long before Che arrived in Bolivia, he offered his support and gave his life heroically for the revolutionary cause. The group of Bolivian guerrillas who until then had stayed with Manje's organization also joined Che. Led by Inti and Coco Peredu, who proved to be courageous, outstanding fighters, they left Manje and decisively backed Che. But Manje, seeking revenge, began to sabotage the movement. In La Paz he intercepted well-trained communist militants who were on their way to join the guerrillas. These facts demonstrate that within the ranks of revolutionaries, men who meet all the conditions necessary for struggle can be criminally frustrated in their development by incapable, maneuvering, and charlatan-like leaders. Che was a man never personally interested in posts, leadership, or honors, but he believed revolutionary guerrilla warfare was the fundamental form of action for the liberation of the peoples of Latin America, given the economic, political, and social situation in nearly all Latin American countries. Moreover, he was firmly convinced that the military and political leadership of the guerrilla struggle had to be unified. He also believed the struggle could be led only by the guerrilla unit itself, and not from the comfortable offices of bureaucrats in the cities. So he was not prepared to give up leadership of a guerrilla nucleus that, at a later stage of its development, was intended to develop into a struggle of broad dimensions in Latin America. 
and he certainly was not prepared to turn over such leadership to an inexperienced empty head with narrow chauvinist views. Such chauvinism often infects even revolutionary elements of various countries in Latin America. Che believed that it must be combated because it represents reactionary, ridiculous, and sterile thinking. And let us develop genuine proletarian internationalism, he said in his message to the Tricontinental. Let the flag under which we fight be the sacred cause of the liberation of humanity, so that to die under the colors of Vietnam, Venezuela, Guatemala, Laos, Guinea, Colombia, Bolivia, to mention only the current scenes of armed struggle, will be equally glorious and desirable for a Latin American, an Asian, an African, and even a European. Every drop of blood spilled in a land under whose flag one was not born is experience gathered by the survivor to be applied later in the struggle for liberation of one's own country. And every people that liberates itself is a step in the battle for the liberation of one's own people. In the same way, Che believed fighters from various Latin American countries would participate in the guerrilla detachment, that the guerrilla struggle in Bolivia would be a school in which revolutionaries would serve their apprenticeship in combat. To help him with this task he wanted to have, together with the Bolivians, a small nucleus of experienced guerrilla fighters, nearly all of whom had been his companeros in the Sierra Maestra during the revolutionary struggle in Cuba. These were men whose abilities, courage, and spirit of self-sacrifice Che knew. None of them hesitated to respond to his call, none of them abandoned him, none of them surrendered. In the Bolivian campaign Che acted with his proverbial tenacity, skill, stoicism, and exemplary attitude. It might be said that he was consumed by the importance of the mission he had assigned himself, and at all times he proceeded with a spirit of irreproachable responsibility. When the guerrilla unit committed a careless mistake, he quickly called attention to it, corrected it, and noted it in his diary. Unbelievably adverse factors built up against him, such as the separation supposed to last for just a few days of part of the guerrilla detachment, a unit that included a courageous group of fighters, some of them sick or convalescent. Once contact between the two groups was lost in very rough terrain, separation continued, and for endless months Che was preoccupied with the effort to find them. In this period his asthma and ailment easily treated with simple medication, but one that, lacking the medication, became a terrible enemy attacked him relentlessly. It became a serious problem, as the medical supplies that had been accumulated by the guerrillas beforehand had been discovered and captured by the enemy. This fact, along with the annihilation at the end of August of the part of the guerrilla detachment he had lost contact with, were factors that weighed considerably in the development of events. But Che, with his iron will, overcame his physical difficulties and never for an instant cut back his activity or let his spirits flag. Che had many contacts with the Bolivian peasants. Their character highly suspicious and cautious would have come as no surprise to Che, who knew their mentality perfectly well because he had dealt with them on other occasions. He knew that winning them over to the cause required long, arduous, and patient work, but he had no doubt that in the long run they would obtain the support of the peasants. If we follow the thread of events carefully, it becomes clear that even when the number of men on whom Che could count was quite small in the month of September, a few weeks before his death the guerrilla unit still retained its capacity to develop. It also still had a few Bolivian cotters, such as the brothers Inti and Coco Peredu, who were already beginning to show magnificent leadership potential. It was the ambush in La Higuera on September 26, 1967 the sole successful action by the army against the detachment led by Che that created a situation they could not overcome. In that ambush, in broad daylight, the vanguard group was killed and several more men were wounded as they headed for a peasant area with a higher level of political development an objective that does not appear to have been noted in the diary but which is known through the survivors. It was without doubt dangerous to advance by daylight along the same route they had been following for days, with inevitably close contact with the residents of an area they were entering for the first time. It was certainly obvious that the army would intercept them at some point, but Che, fully conscious of this, decided to run the risk in order to help the doctor Octavio de la Concepcion de la Petrija, El Medico, who was in very poor physical condition. 
The day before the ambush, he wrote, we reached Puggio but there were people who had seen us down below the day before, which means we are being announced ahead of time by Radio Bimba word of mouth. Traveling with mules is becoming dangerous, we are trying to make it as easy as possible for El Medico because he is becoming very weak. The following day he wrote, at 1300 hours, the vanguard set out to try to reach Jagway and to make a decision there about the mules and El Medico. That is, he was seeking a solution for the sick, so as to get off the road and take the necessary precautions. But that same afternoon, before the vanguard reached Jagway, the fatal ambush occurred, leaving the detachment in an untenable situation. A few days later, encircled in the El Euro ravine, Che fought his final battle. Recalling the feat carried out by this handful of revolutionaries is deeply moving. The struggle against the hostile natural environment in which their action took place constitutes by itself an insuperable page of heroism. Never in history has so small a number of men embarked on such a gigantic task. Their faith and absolute conviction that the immense revolutionary capacity of the peoples of Latin America could be awakened, their confidence in themselves, and the determination with which they took on this objective these things give us a just measure of these men. One day Che said to the guerrilla fighters in Bolivia, this type of struggle gives us the opportunity to become revolutionaries, the highest form of the human species, and it also allows us to emerge fully as men, those who are unable to achieve either of those two states should say so now and abandon the struggle. First photograph of Fidel Castro and Che Guevara together, in prison, Mexico, June 1956. Recovering from an asthma attack in the Sierra Maestra, 1957. With Fidel Castro in the Sierra Maestra, 1957. Sierra Maestra, 1957, Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, Calixto Garcia, Ramiro Valdez, and Juan Almeida. Che Guevara in the Escambray Mountains, 1958. December 1958. Che Guevara and Camilo Cienfuegos, 1959. Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, 1960. Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, 1962. Photo by Osvaldo Salas. Che Guevara and Aleda March. Break from voluntary work. Photo by Osvaldo Salas. January 1959. Juan Almeida and Che Guevara. Last photograph of Che Guevara and Fidel Castro together, Havana, 1966. Che Guevara in Bolivia, 1966-67. Those who fought with him until the end have become worthy of such honored terms, they symbolize the type of revolutionary and the type of person history is now calling on for a truly challenging and difficult task the revolutionary transformation of Latin America. The enemy our forebears faced in the first struggle for independence was a decadent colonial power. Revolutionaries have as their enemy today the most powerful bulwark of the imperialist camp, equipped with the most modern technology and industry. This enemy not only organized and equipped a new army for Bolivia where the people had destroyed the previous repressive military apparatus and immediately sent weapons and advisors to help in the struggle against the guerrillas. It has also provided military and technical support on the same scale to every repressive force on the continent. And when these methods are not enough, it has intervened directly with its troops, as in the Dominican Republic. Fighting this enemy requires the type of revolutionaries and individuals Che spoke of. Without this type of revolutionary and human being, ready to do what they did, without the spirit to confront the enormous obstacles they faced, without the readiness to die that accompanied them at every moment, without their deeply held conviction in the justice of their cause and their unyielding faith in the invincible force of the peoples, against a power like U.S. imperialism, whose military, technical, and economic resources are felt throughout the entire world without these, the liberation of the peoples of this continent will not be attained. The people of the United States themselves are beginning to become aware that the monstrous political superstructure that reigns in their country has for some time no longer been the idyllic bourgeois republic the country's founders established nearly 200 years ago. They are increasingly subjected to the moral barbarism of an irrational, alienating, dehumanized, 
and brutal system that takes from the people of the United States a growing number of victims in its wars of aggression, its political crimes, its racial aberrations, the miserable hierarchy it has created among human beings, its repugnant waste of economic, scientific, and human resources on its enormous, reactionary, and repressive military apparatus in the midst of a world where three quarters of humanity lives in underdevelopment and hunger. Only the revolutionary transformation of Latin America will enable the people of the United States to settle their own accounts with imperialism. At the same time, and in the same way, the growing struggle of the people of the United States against imperialist policy can become a decisive ally of the revolutionary movement in Latin America. An enormous differentiation and imbalance occurred in the Americas at the beginning of this century. On one side a powerful and rapidly industrializing nation, in accordance with the very law of its social and economic dynamics, was marching toward imperial heights. On the other side, the weak and stagnant countries in the balkanized remainder of the Americas were kept under the boot of feudal oligarchies and their reactionary armies. If this part of the hemisphere does not undergo a profound revolutionary transformation, that earlier gap will seem but a pale reflection of not just the enormous present unevenness in finance, science, and technology, but rather of the horrible imbalance that, at an increasingly accelerated rate, the imperialist superstructure will impose on the peoples of Latin America in the next 20 years. If we stay on this road, we will be increasingly poor, weak, dependent, and enslaved to imperialism. This gloomy perspective also confronts, to an equal degree, all the underdeveloped nations of Africa and Asia. If the industrialized and educated nations of Europe, with their common market and supranational scientific institutions, are worried about the possibility of being left behind, and contemplate with fear the perspective of being converted into economic colonies of U.S. imperialism, what does the future have in store for the peoples of Latin America? This is unquestionably the real situation that decisively affects the destiny of our peoples. What is urgently needed is a deep-going revolutionary transformation that can gather together all the moral, material, and human forces in this part of the world and launch them forward so as to overcome the economic, scientific, and technological backwardness of centuries, a backwardness that is greater still when compared with the industrialized world to which we are tributaries and will continue to be to an even greater degree, especially to the United States. If some liberal or bourgeois reformist, or some pseudo-revolutionary charlatan, incapable of action, has a different answer, and if, in addition, that person can provide the formula, the magic road to carrying it out, that is different from Che's conception one that can sweep away the oligarchs, despots, and petty politicians, that is to say, the servants, and the U.S. monopolists, in other words, the masters, and can do it with all the urgency the circumstances require then let them stand up to challenge Che. But no one really has an honest answer or a consistent policy that will bring genuine hope to the nearly 300 million human beings who make up the population of Latin America. Devastatingly poor in their overwhelming majority and increasing in number to 600 million within 25 years, they have the right to the material things of life, to culture, and to civilization. So the most dignified attitude would be to remain silent in face of the action of Che and those who fell with him, courageously defending their ideas. The feat carried out by this handful of guerrilla fighters, guided by the noble idea of redeeming a continent, will remain the greatest proof of what determination, heroism, and human greatness can accomplish. It is an example that will illuminate the consciousness and preside over the struggle of the peoples of Latin America. Che's heroic cry will reach the receptive ear of the poor and exploited for whom he gave his life, many hands will come forward to take up arms to win their definitive liberation. On October 7, Che wrote his last lines. The following day at 1 p.m., in a narrow ravine where he proposed waiting until nightfall in order to break out of the encirclement, a large enemy force made contact with them. The small group of men who now made up the detachment fought heroically until dusk. From individual positions located on the bottom of the ravine, and on the cliffs above, they faced a mass of soldiers who surrounded and attacked them. There were no survivors among those who fought in the positions closest to Che. 
since beside him were the doctor in the grave state of health mentioned before, and a Peruvian gorilla who was also in very poor physical condition, everything seems to indicate that until he fell wounded, Che did his utmost to safeguard the withdrawal of these comrades to a safer place. The doctor was not killed in the same battle, but rather several days later at a place not far from the Quebrada del Euro El Euro Ravine. The ruggedness of the rocky, irregular terrain made it difficult at times impossible for the guerrillas to maintain visual contact. Those defending positions at the other entrance to the ravine, some hundreds of meters from Che, among them Inti Peredu, resisted the attack until dark, when they managed to lose the enemy and head toward the previously agreed point of regroupment. It has been possible to establish that Che continued fighting despite being wounded, until a shot destroyed the barrel of his M2 rifle, making it totally useless. The pistol he carried had no magazine. These incredible circumstances explain how he could have been captured alive. The wounds in his legs kept him from walking without help, but they were not fatal. Moved to the town of La Higuera, he remained alive for about 24 hours. He refused to exchange a single word with his captors, and a drunken officer who tried to annoy him received a slap across the face. At a meeting in La Paz, Barrientos, Ovando, and other top military leaders coldly made the decision to murder Che. Details are known of the way in which the treacherous agreement was carried out in the school at La Higuera. Major Miguel Aero and Colonel Andres Selleck, rangers trained by the United States, ordered Warrant Officer Mario Duran to proceed with the murder. Duran, completely drunk, entered the schoolyard. When Che, who heard the shots that had just killed a Bolivian Willie and a Peruvian guerrilla fighter Chino, saw the executioner hesitate, he said firmly, Shoot. Don't be afraid. Duran left, and again it was necessary for his superiors, Aero and Selleck, to repeat the order. He then proceeded to carry it out, firing a machine gun burst at the belt down. A statement had already been released that Che died a few hours after combat, therefore, the executioners had orders not to shoot him in the chest or head, so as not to induce fatal wounds immediately. This cruelly prolonged Che's agony until a sergeant, also drunk, killed him with a pistol shot to the left side of his body. Such a procedure contrasts brutally with the respect shown by Che, without a single exception, toward the lives of the many officers and soldiers of the Bolivian army he took prisoner. The final hours of his existence in the hands of his contemptible enemies must have been very bitter for him, but no one was better prepared than Che to be put to such a test. The way in which the diary came into our hands cannot be told at this time, suffice it to say it required no monetary payment. It contains all the notes he wrote from November 7, 1966, the day Che arrived in Nakawazu, until October 7, 1967, the evening before the battle in the El Euro Ravine. There are a few pages missing, pages that have not yet arrived in our hands, but they correspond to dates on which nothing of any importance happened, and therefore do not alter the content of the diary in any way. Although the document itself offers not the slightest doubt as to its authenticity, all photocopies have been subjected to a rigorous examination to establish not only their authenticity but also to check on any possible alteration, no matter how slight. The dates were compared with the diary of one of the surviving guerrilla fighters, both documents coincided in every aspect. Detailed testimony of the other surviving guerrilla fighters, who were witnesses to each of the events, also contributed to establishing the document's authenticity. In short, it has been established with absolute certainty that all the photocopies were faithful copies of Che's diary. It was a laborious job to decipher the small and difficult handwriting, a task that was carried out with the tireless assistance of his companera, Aleta March. The diary will be published almost simultaneously in France by the publishing house of François Maspero, in Italy by Filtrinelli Publishers, in the Federal Republic of Germany by Tricont Verlag, in the United States by Ramparts Magazine, in France, a Spanish edition, by Edicionese Ruido Iberico, in Chile by the magazine Punto Final, in Mexico by Editorial Siglo XXI, and in other countries. Hasta la victoria siempre. Ever onward to victory.
Chapter 5 On the Publication of Che's Bolivian Diary July 4, 1968 Despite the fact that the Bolivian government itself had fabricated excerpts of Che's diary and used it out of context, when the complete Bolivian diary was published in Cuba, Bolivian President René Barrientos claimed it had been falsified. Fidel Castro responded by saying that the Cuban government was willing to provide reproductions of the microfilm of the diary's pages to the international press so they could be checked against the original, if the Bolivian government would permit that to be done. The following speech was delivered on Cuban television on July 4, 1968. As you all know the publication of Che's Bolivian diary has aroused extraordinary interest all over the world. Among those affected by the publication is, of course, the Bolivian government. What was Barrientos's reaction to news of the diary's publication? In order to explain this matter it is necessary to read several reports from different news agencies, some of which you may have already read. We have here, for example, an Associated Press, AP, dispatch of July 1st from La Paz. President René Barrientos stated that, the publication of a fictitious diary, falsified and conveniently presented, might perhaps raise the morale of a people so long subjected to so many privations. I do not believe that Che Guevara has continued to write his diary from the great beyond. I am sure that the whole thing is a scheme of the Castro hierarchy to exalt Che Guevara. They must have produced a diary only a few pages long. According to the news agencies, in Cuba it is only possible to read by daylight. They don't even have matches to read by at night. According to news agencies. Hibariantos informs himself by what the news agencies report. Another statement. General Juan J. Torres, Chief of Staff of the Bolivian Army, for a considerable time so it says here in charge of negotiations the text is illegible, this presumably refers to the negotiations to publish or sell the diary stated that the Cuban edition, is nothing but an attempt at sensationalism by Fidel Castro, since at no time have we made Che's diary available to anyone. This was from the same AP dispatch. The same day an ANSA dispatch read. La Paz. The Bolivian military chief of staff maintains that Che Guevara's campaign diary, whose publication and free distribution has been announced by Fidel Castro's regime, is falsified. Torres asserted that the aforementioned diary has been kept in a safe, secret place since those illegible the guerrillas, October 1967, ended in failure. The dispatch continued. Torres said that only high-ranking military officers, approximately seven, have access to or knowledge of the contents of the documents, that at no time was permission given for their publication either within the country or abroad, despite the numerous offers received. He insisted that the document to be published in Cuba is falsified. He also emphasized that the version of Che's diary being published in Cuba will be compared with the original in the hands of the Bolivian army, and that in case of similarity, an immediate and exhaustive investigation will be carried out to discover out how the Cubans obtained photocopies of it. So the first contradiction appears, no one was given permission, the diary is falsified, yet, immediately following, this member of the army's staff reveals doubts, saying that, in any case, the diary will be compared and that in case of similarity an immediate and exhaustive investigation will be carried out to discover how the Cubans obtained photocopies of it. The kind of doubt now revealed by the chief of staff, together with a certain caution caution not in the least displayed by Barrientos leaves the door of possibility open. The AP agency itself, in the dispatch I read earlier, further stated. Despite emphatic statements made by the president and other high-ranking military officers, the Havana publication appears to be at least a serious threat to Bolivian army's plans to sell Che's diary at a high price the original of which, written in two notebooks, is in the hands of the high command. Many observers did not dismiss the possibility that at least a substantial part of the diary may have been taken out of the country in the form of photocopies somehow obtained from the army. It is recalled that during Regis de Bray's trial, the military prosecutor exhibited photocopies of several pages of the diary as state evidence. On July 3, in answer to the doubts expressed by AP, 
Barrientos issued a new statement. Here is an ANSA news dispatch from La Paz, dated July 3, which reads. President Barrientos considered it would have been impossible for microfilm of Che Guevara's diary to be removed from the Army High Command. Barrientos expressed the opinion that fragments of the, the text is illegible of Pombo this could possibly mean fragments of Pombo's diary who was Guevara's aide in the Bolivian guerrilla force, plus knowledge of several pages of the diary which were published by the press both nationally and abroad, made it possible to put together the diary announced for publication in Havana. The chief executive insisted that the Havana diary is spurious. Some curious doubts can be observed including doubts of the chief of staff himself which in a certain sense contradict Barrientos' statements. These are also the doubts of a U.S. news agency. Here, for example, we have a cable which reads. Washington, July 3, CTK. The current literary and political sensation in the United States is the publication of the diary of Cuban revolutionary Ecobedo Che Guevara. The authenticity of some material is doubtful, to say the least, and gives rise to questions regarding which is the true Guevara. The first to publish Guevara's notes on the guerrilla war in Bolivia was the radical monthly Ramparts of California. It is pointed out in that edition that Ramparts obtained exclusive publication rights from the Prime Minister of the Cuban government, Fidel Castro. Ramparts, with Guevara's diary, is already on sale at all newsstands and will soon be sold out. And so on and so forth. The fact remains that this agency, a news agency of Czechoslovakia, a socialist country, states, the authenticity of some material is doubtful, to say the least, and gives rise to questions regarding which is the true Guevara. This is truly paradoxical, leading one to wonder where we stand, where each news agency stands. It is truly paradoxical when a U.S. news agency, not in the least known for being sympathetic to revolutionaries, admits the possibility that the diary may have found its way here, while a socialist agency. Well, I wanted to make sure, so I asked, CTK. Are you sure? Could there have been some interference? Did the report come over the CTK teletype? Yes, on the CTK teletype. This agency expresses doubts about the diary's authenticity. Well, there is great freedom of the press in Czechoslovakia at this time, and naturally we do not question the Czech agency's right to have doubts. Still, that report was filed in Washington DC and it is highly likely that it was strongly influenced by the atmosphere there of doubts concerning the diary's authenticity, it came out sounding almost exactly like Barrientos, and, of course, like imperialism. Here's our analysis of these doubts, and our proof. The first thing we notice is the fact somewhat incomprehensible, though it has an explanation that the Bolivian government has jumped to the conclusion that the diary is falsified, without having seen a copy of it, without taking the basic precaution of waiting to get its hands on a copy. Firstly, this reveals its lack of caution. It also reveals that the gentleman Barrientos who relies on the news agencies I don't know what agency, it might be any of them, they don't even have matches to read by at night, perhaps judging others by his own moral standards, thinks that such a thing could actually be done. It is an act of unbelievable irresponsibility. Secondly, simple logic reveals how absurd such an allegation is. They have the original, and they could have tried to publish a falsified diary. It would have been very difficult to prove that it was falsified. Of course, we have now been completely convinced. When we had to break the tragic news of Che's death here, we analyzed the first pages that had been published, and we were left without the slightest doubt that the pages were written by Che. We were capable of immediately recognizing even the slightest alteration in the diary. Nevertheless, they had the original and would have been able to publish a falsified edition. No one in their right mind would conceive of publishing a false copy of a document whose original is in someone else's hands, especially the hands of an enemy. The very idea that we would make such a mistake is unthinkable, and besides being a mistake, it would be immoral, completely alien to the Cuban Revolution. We received the photocopies and studied them carefully. Considering every possibility that they might contain changes, errors, 
things that did not ring true, we studied them very carefully. But a simple reading of the document assured us of its authenticity just as it has everyone in this country because we knew Chase so well, his way of writing, his style, his thoughts, his temperament, his personal traits. Yet we did not go by this alone, we exhausted all means of investigation and were absolutely convinced it was Chase's diary. We might have made a mistake not, of course, by inventing a diary but we might have made a mistake in judgment. We don't, however, believe this to be the case, and we are prepared to stand by our verdict. Frankly, we do not have the slightest doubt that it is the authentic diary. This can be proven. When we reached this conclusion, in view of the historic significance of the document, we decided to publish the diary. The Bolivian leaders leaders by the grace of U.S. imperialism, of course are lying. In the first place, they lie when they say that no copy of Che's diary left Bolivia. They pretend to be unaware of a series of events. For example, they pretend not to know that a Dr. Gonzalez a CIA agent who operated widely in Bolivia photographed all of Che's documents and naturally sent them immediately to his CIA bosses, promising to send Colonel Zantino Anaya a copy. And, indeed, he did send a copy to Colonel Zantino Anaya through the U.S. Embassy in La Paz, a copy which fell into General Ovando's hands. They pretend to be unaware of the fact that the high command of the Bolivian army itself ordered the trial presided over by General Reyes Villa of Colonels Joaquim Zantino Anaya and Luis Antonio Richteran, for having sold documents seized from the guerrillas. They pretend not to know that the New York Times reporter Juan de Anis had access to Che's documents, although there is no proof that he took complete copies of them. They pretend not to know that another newsman, Andrew St. George closely linked to the CIA took advantage of his ties with that organization and used bribery to obtain copies of Che's documents. Andrew St. George dreamed of making a fortune out of these documents, and as his first step he contacted various publishing houses. Among those he contacted was the important U.S. publishing house McGraw-Hill, to arrange for a large print run of an edition of the diary using these documents. It so happened that McGraw-Hill, not wanting to risk its own reputation, was not willing to assume responsibility for publishing the diary. It did try to get some type of legal authorization and sent representatives to obtain permission to publish the diary from Che's family, since they are the legal heirs to Che's property. Naturally, they replied that they were not interested in the proposal, which is obvious, because for one thing we already had the diary, and for another, it was impossible to participate in or consent to a printing or an edition promoted by an individual linked to the CIA. Naturally, we did not tell McGraw-Hill that we had the diary, but we did tell them flatly that we were not interested in their proposed edition. We must recognize that this U.S. publishing house acted honestly and decently. They could have published the diary, but decided against it. They knew they had no right to publish a document of this nature, since those who had obtained the document got it directly from the murderers of the author. They also knew that, in a strictly legal sense, they had no moral or any other kind of right to claim ownership, or worse, to act as vulgar peddlers of the document. Of course, it must be understood that McGraw-Hill would not have had time to publish it, but it is a fact that they did not make any effort to do so. This led Andrew St. George to seek other publishing houses and try to do business with them. Now several news items are appearing to the effect that the Bolivian government will publish the document, edited by an expert on Latin American and anti-communist affairs. Others are reportedly going to publish the diary or articles on the diary. The first question that comes to mind is why, in the past eight months, has the Bolivian government not published the documents? The reasons are obvious, and those who have read the documents can understand it. The fact of the matter is that the publication of the diary has upset a few apple carts. In the first place, the imperialists and the Bolivian militarists were most interested in keeping the contents of the document secret. In the second place, its publication ruined a number of shady and grossly mercenary business deals in connection with the document. Andrew St. George and others like him counted their chickens before they hatched, dreaming of fat profits, but their dreams never materialized. 
now they are desperately trying to see what they can still do and whether they can salvage something from their investment in those shady deals. Their efforts are certainly belated, because the diary is about to be published internationally. In the next few days it will appear in several languages, published by honest publishing houses devoted to this type of publication, publishing houses who know what they are dealing with. The Cuban Book Institute is also receiving offers for the publication of the diary from dozens of countries. So logically, their belated and desperate efforts will be futile. Is there any way of proving who is right? The answer is extremely easy. There is a proverb that says it is easier to spot a liar than a lame man. In this case, the liar will be spotted before the invalid. At this moment, there is not one copy of Che's diary outside Bolivia, there is more than one copy of Che's diary outside Bolivia. Considering all these interlocking interests, with all these desperate profit seekers intervening, there is now no possibility that anyone could attempt to write or alter this diary and have their false version accepted. Naturally, none of this explanation is necessary for our own people. The Cuban people knew Che well, and they know the revolution's methods well, even our enemies, in many cases, admit this. But this explanation is necessary in case some people should harbor any doubt and because, naturally, the imperialists and their sycophants stunned by the blow will try to cast doubt, as if it were possible, on Che's diary. It so happens that we did not receive a typewritten copy of the diary. If we had received typewritten copies, we would still have been able to analyze them and even reach a conclusion. But if we were to be asked, what do you base yourselves on, we would have had to reply, we have based ourselves on this. Yet here we have all the photocopies of the pages of Che's diary that have been published. Any month, December, for example, here are the photocopies. All the photocopies corresponding to the Cuban Book Institute edition are here, for any month, from the first to the last page. We have still more documents. For example, we have here 36 additional photocopies of documents written by Che that are not part of the diary but are documents such as war communiques, messages, and declarations, the content of which Che discusses in his diary. So here we have 36 photocopies of documents that are kept over there in that safe in Bolivia, that very strong safe, so strong that those who are most highly informed assert it is secured by a lock steel door with three padlocks. But it seems to have quite a few leaks. We knew that something so absurd as questioning the authenticity of the documents could occur perhaps it was their only way out and consequently we took the appropriate measures. We have still more photocopies of other documents written by Che in Bolivia. Any attempt, therefore, to falsify the diary, any attempt at fraud would be very difficult. Some people will say, yes, indeed, here are the photocopies, the handwriting is just like Che's, his style, all that is so distinctive of his personality is reflected here. Even so, wouldn't it be possible to make a true-to-life copy, invent it all, find someone more brilliant than Cervantes who could write with such exactness, who could imitate a figure as distinctive as Che? Is there sufficient proof? To that we would say, no, there is not sufficient proof. But there is a conclusive test that can be carried out. The Cuban Book Institute has published this diary. It is a historic document, and those affected have to cast doubt on it, yet world opinion has the right to know the full truth. Someone is lying, and it is necessary to clear up who that is, who is capable of duping world public opinion so cynically and shamelessly. There is a very simple test. We invite any journalist from any country of the world to come to Cuba to receive a complete collection of the photocopies of the diary, and then go to Bolivia to check it against the original diary. We will submit to that test. Tomorrow morning, or tonight, if they wish, in any part of the world where there is a Cuban embassy, any journalist no matter what newspaper they represent, friend or foe only has to go to a Cuban embassy, which have been instructed to give them their visa immediately so they can come here to receive their copy. Naturally, they can also begin making their requests for visas from the Bolivian government. 
Because this is the definitive test and because world public opinion has the right to know the truth, we challenge the Bolivian government to accept this test and to authorize journalists to go there and see. We are not saying they should turn over a copy, or even let the journalists photograph it although I don't see why the journalists shouldn't photograph it at this stage, especially if the photographs confirm that these copies correspond to the original but we do say they should authorize this test immediately without any kind of evasion. If not, there is nothing more to be said and they will have been completely unmasked before world public opinion. We are working intensively to this effect using, incidentally, a great deal of scarce paper to make the pertinent copies. This very night, following this appearance, we will have film made with negatives of the photocopies of Che's diary, ready to deliver to the foreign press in Cuba. They are now speaking of the Cuban version, and this is only acceptable if in the strictest sense the Cuban version is identified as true and authentic, not a version in fact but rather a faithful copy of the diary. This very night, if representatives of the foreign news agencies in Cuba wish to be the first to request their visas for Bolivia they will be given film containing all the photocopies we have available of Che's diary. Furthermore, we will provide them with film containing the negatives of these 36 additional photocopies. And, I repeat, in our little cardboard safe, without any key, we have still more photocopies of other documents. There are all kinds of things here, including this photograph taken in Valle Grande if Valle Grande is of any great interest of one of the CIA agents who was operating in Bolivia, a native Cuban Felix Rodriguez. And here is a photo of General Ovando and others drinking, celebrating the assassination of Che. Here we see that same CIA agent, the same Ramos, helping to apply formaldehyde to Che's body. Some documents are possibly not even in the safe, such as this document discussing the turning over to the army of a wounded guerrilla who was later murdered, Jorge Vasquez Viana, he is referred to by different names in the diary. He was taken out of the hospital and murdered, his body was placed in a helicopter and thrown into the jungle. We believe that, when all is said and done, they will have no choice but to accept the complete authenticity of the diary and the other documents. We carried out no espionage work in Bolivia. It is simply that every just cause has sympathizers everywhere. Although it cannot yet be told, someday what happened will be made known. And we reiterate what we stated in the necessary introduction to the diary, see Chapter 4. Absolutely no money changed hands in our obtaining the diary. It is now General Torres's turn to speak, it is René Barrientos's turn to speak, it is the journalist's turn to speak. It so happens that any day now July 4, if I remember correctly Barrientos is due to arrive in the United States at the invitation of the governor of Texas, nowadays not even his own masters pay much attention to him and he is not even granted the status of an official guest of the U.S. government. He will travel to the United States as a guest of the governor of Texas, and there, on a ranch, that other Texan, Mr. Lyndon B. Johnson, will receive him. Journalists can go there and ask him questions, pin him down. This is the definitive test, the only conclusive test, and it is what we propose. Now it is up to the journalists, those who doubt the authenticity of this diary, to speak out and substantiate their doubts with solid evidence or dispel them completely. Our people have no doubts, but there may be many people in the world who lack the evidence on which to base a decision, who lack the evidence to reach a definite conclusion. This is the only response. If this can't be done, it won't be our fault. We can submit to this test without batting an eyelid. As I said, at this very moment journalists will begin to receive the negatives I mentioned. We believe this will serve to dispel any possible doubts concerning the authenticity of this diary. Chapter 6 Reflections on Che Chile 1971. In 1971 Fidel Castro made a visit to Chile, his first trip to another Latin American country in more than a decade. He went at the invitation of then-President Salvador Allende. The following speech was given in the community of San Miguel in the capital city of Santiago de Chile, which had erected a statue of Che Guevara. 
Allende was overthrown in September 1973 by a Uzbek military coup. A few days ago, when I visited the statue of Jose Marti, I said I would come a few days later to visit the statue of Che and meet with the residents of this community. Today you have honored me with the title illustrious son of this community, and I thank you for it. My task here is to give you my impressions and memories, to present some of the characteristics of Che's personality and life. When I came here and placed flowers in front of the monument, many thoughts went through my mind. First, the memory of one who was a comrade in struggle and a brother of our people and our fighters, the impact of seeing, transformed into bronze, a person I once had the privilege of knowing, at whose side I once had the privilege of fighting. This is the first time I've seen a monument to someone I've known in life. Usually, when statues are created by artists in memory of people who distinguished themselves for their feats and accomplishments in the struggle for humanity, they symbolize individuals who lived a long time ago, hundreds and even thousands of years ago. Possibly only in very special circumstances does one have the chance to see a statue of someone one has known, because usually history sees fit to erect these monuments after the passage of many years. But in this case the revolutionary proletarian community of San Miguel wanted to erect a monument to Che. And so, in October 1970, three years after his death, this monument was unveiled. I met Che in Mexico in 1955. An Argentine by birth, he was Latin American in spirit and in heart. He had just come from Guatemala. About Che, as about all revolutionaries, many tales have been invented. They try to present him as a conspirator, a shadowy subversive dedicated to devising plots and revolutions. As a young man, like so many other young students, as a graduate of his country's university, like so many other graduates in his case, as a Dr. Che, who had a special curiosity and interest in things related to Latin America, a special interest in study and knowledge, a special desire to see all our nations, made a tour of several countries. He had nothing more than his degree. At times on foot, at times on motorcycle, he went from country to country. In fact, when we were in Chucaicameta in northern Chile we were shown the place he had stopped for a day on the first trip he made outside his country. He had no money. He wasn't a tourist. He went to see the work centers, the hospitals, the historical sites. He crossed the Andes, took a boat or a raft, and went as far as a leper hospital in the Amazon, where he worked for a time as a doctor. He continued his journey. He arrived in Guatemala after passing through if I remember correctly Brazil, Venezuela, and Colombia. And he arrived in Guatemala when a progressive government headed by Jacobo Arbenz was in power. An agrarian reform was being carried out. Also there at the time were some survivors of the 1953 attack on the Moncada garrison. They established a friendship with Che. He was working there if I remember correctly as a doctor. As one who was interested in the Guatemalan process, a studious man who thirsted after knowledge with an inquiring spirit, a revolutionary vocation and disposition, and a clear intelligence, he had of course read the books and theories of Karl Marx, Engels, and Lenin. And although he wasn't a member of any party, Che was already a Marxist in his thinking. But it was his lot to live through a bitter experience. While he was in Guatemala the imperialists intervened with an invasion led by the CIA that is, the CIA organized the invasion of that country from neighboring territory, with arms, planes, and all kinds of equipment. It was something similar to what they later tried to do at Playa Geron the Bay of Pigs. But in Guatemala, they attacked without any risk. Using their planes and then advancing on the ground, they overthrew the revolutionary government. The Cubans and other Latin Americans who were there and who had supported the government, who had carried out simple tasks of a practical nature not even political tasks had to leave the country. They went to Mexico. In 1955, the first Moncada combatants who had just come out of prison had to leave Cuba. One of the first comrades subjected to persistent harassment and persecution was Raul Castro, who left for Mexico. I arrived a few weeks later. 
Rahul had already made contact with other comrades who had not been in prison, and he had also met Che. A few days after my arrival in Mexico I met Che in a house where some Cubans were staying on Amparan Street, if I remember the name correctly but I can't remember the number of the house now. Che wasn't Che then. He was Ecobedo Guevara. It was because of the Argentine custom of calling people Che that the Cubans began calling him Che. That was how he got that name, a name he later made famous, a name he turned into a symbol. That's how we met. As he himself related in one of his writings, he joined the Cuban movement immediately, after a few hours of discussion. Because of his state of mind when he left Guatemala, because of the extremely bitter experience he'd lived through there that cowardly aggression against the country, the interruption of a process that had awakened the hopes of the people because of his revolutionary vocation, his spirit of struggle, we can say that it did not take hours, but that in a matter of minutes Che decided to join the small group of Cubans who were working on organizing a new phase of the struggle in our country. We spent a little over a year in Mexico, working under difficult conditions, with very few resources. But that really doesn't matter, that's what was to be expected of the struggle, as with all struggles. Then at last, on November 25, 1956, we left for Cuba. Our movement had launched a slogan against the skeptics, against those who doubted the possibility of continuing the struggle, against those who disputed our position that in this situation there was no other solution we had declared that in 1956 we would be either free or martyrs. That declaration was simply a reaffirmation to the Cuban nation of our determination to struggle, of our confidence that the struggle would be renewed without delay. It is true that many people not the people in our organization, for they understood perfectly the meaning of that slogan did not understand why we made that promise to return to Cuba practically on a fixed date. It was because of the state of mind of many people in our country who, because of the frustrations, because of the tricks by the traditional politicians, had become somewhat skeptical. Moreover, there were many people representing vested interests who were engaged in political maneuvering, making great efforts to obtain political agreements with the Batista dictatorship and to extinguish the people's faith in revolutionary struggle. That's why we were forced to launch that slogan, right or wrong. We aren't going to discuss it now, it may serve as material for theoretical research. People don't always go strictly by a diagram. People don't make history at their own whim or to their own liking. People may contribute to the making of history, but history also makes people. So, for better or worse, the slogan was launched. And for better or worse, we were determined to carry it out. Special circumstances could and did arise, and there were very serious complications on the eve of our departure. But we had always had a small number of arms hidden, and we said that if we can't all go, some of us will, no matter what. So 82 fighters left aboard a small cabin cruiser called Granma. We sailed 2,400 kilometers and arrived at the coast of Cuba on December 2, 1956. Two or three days from now our country will be celebrating the 15th anniversary of that landing, which marked the birth of our small army. December 2nd is now our Armed Forces Day. That's the way the struggle began. I don't propose to give you an entire history far from it. I simply want to provide you with a clear understanding of the circumstances in which this contingent began the struggle. And what was Che? Che was the doctor of our contingent. He wasn't the commissar. He didn't yet have any troops under his command. He was simply the doctor. Because of his seriousness, his intelligence, and his character, Che had once been assigned leader of a group of Cubans in a house in Mexico. One day a small, disagreeable incident took place. There were about 20 or 30 Cubans there in all, and some of them it must have been two or three, but sometimes two or three are enough to create a disagreeable situation challenged Che's leadership because he was an Argentine and not a Cuban. We of course criticized an attitude that ignored human value, that ingratitude towards someone who, although not born in our land, was ready to shed his blood for it. And I remember the incident hurt me a great deal. I think it hurt him as well. He was, in addition, 
a person without any desire to exercise authority. He did not have the slightest ambition, he was not self-centered in any way. He was instead a person who became inhibited if anyone contradicted him. When he came to our country, he came I repeat as our troop doctor, on the general staff. The interesting thing is how Che became a soldier, how he distinguished himself, and what his characteristics were. A few examples, on December 5th, because of tactical errors, our small detachment was the victim of a surprise attack and was completely dispersed. After overcoming tremendous difficulties, a small number of men regrouped in the midst of an encirclement and heavy pursuit. There were three groups, one with Rahul, another group that included Che, who wasn't yet in charge of a group comrade Almeida was in this group too and the group with me. Almeida's group rejoined mine first, and Rahul's did so a few days later. We continued the struggle. Our first battle took place January 17, 1957, we had 17 men. At the beginning, of all the weapons we had brought with us, we were able to round up only seven. December 5th was what we might call the baptism by fire for Che and many other comrades. But the first small battle we won was on January 17th. By the second battle Che had already begun to distinguish himself, to show he was Che. In a confrontation with forces that were pursuing us, he showed his personal bravery. In a practically individual battle with an enemy soldier, in the midst of general combat, he shot the adversary and crawled forward under a hail of bullets to take his weapon. He carried out that brave, outstanding, and special deed on his own initiative, and it earned him the admiration of all. Barely six or seven days later, at the end of January, we suffered the consequences of a betrayal. Our small contingent had grown to some thirty men, five or six of whom were peasants who had asked for and received permission to go visit their families discipline still wasn't very strong in that small group. They left their weapons there, with the detachment. One day at dawn, a squadron of fighter planes and bombers attacked with a very heavy barrage at the exact spot where the detachment was located at least that's how we viewed it at the time. We had already had some experience along that line, but this was the hardest we had ever been hit. I'm going into this because when the combatants were trying to get away from the spot where the fire was concentrated we were going up a hillside at that moment we remembered the weapons that belonged to the five or six peasants who were visiting their homes. Those weapons had to be retrieved and I called for volunteers. Immediately, without thinking or hesitating for an instant, Che was the first to say, I'll go. He and another comrade went quickly to the place being bombed, got the weapons, hid them in a safe place, and then rejoined the rest of our forces. Different episodes took place. Che was still the doctor, he didn't command any troops. But in May of that year, on May 28, something else happened. Our column already had some 100 men, if I remember correctly, and a group of Cuban revolutionaries from another political organization had landed in the northern part of the province. We remembered our own landing and the difficult moments we had gone through, we wanted to help that group by carrying out a support action. So we started for the coast, where an enemy infantry company held positions with fortifications and trenches. Basing ourselves on the information we had received, we scheduled the attack for dawn and organized it very quickly. But when we were about to start combat at dawn the situation became complicated, it turned out our information was not very accurate. The enemy positions were not where we thought they were, and the situation became complicated. However, we had to go ahead. Our small units platoons and squads were scattered in a circle whose perimeter was at least a kilometer and a half long. We could not retreat. We had no choice but to attack. At the time of that battle, Che was a part of the general staff. He already had some responsibilities. We had to carry out two or three actions. We had to ask Almeida's platoon to advance to the front quickly to get as close as possible to certain enemy positions. The advance was very risky and cost us a number of casualties. We also had to have a group move toward the west. And while we were sizing up the situation and analyzing the necessity of that action, Che immediately volunteered. 
he asked for a group of men and an automatic rifle, and said he would march to the west. We gave him a group of men and the automatic rifle, which virtually belonged to the general staff, and he quickly began the advance toward that position. That was the third time we needed a volunteer when Che had immediately stepped forward. In any difficult situation he would act at once, and that's what he did then. That battle was a hard-fought one. It lasted three hours and almost 30% of the forces on both sides were killed or wounded. It had been motivated by the desire to help those who had landed in the north. Despite our efforts, however, they had been surrounded, captured, and killed every last one of them. When we occupied the enemy camp, after three hours of fighting, there was a large number of wounded enemy wounded and our own men. Che was the doctor who attended quickly to both our wounded and those of the enemy. That was always the practice and the rule throughout our struggle. Later, logically, the battle gave rise to a concentration of enemy forces, a huge manhunt directed against us. And we had to solve the problem of our many wounded. After we took care of the enemy wounded we left them there at the scene of the battle so that, as we withdrew, they could be picked up by their own side Che as the doctor stayed behind in an isolated place with our wounded. He took care of them in a difficult situation in which sizable enemy forces in the area were trying to corner us. The column marched through difficult, rugged terrain. We broke through the encirclement. But Che stayed behind with the wounded, with only a very few men. He stayed with them for several weeks until the wounded had recovered. The small group was then able to rejoin the main column, which had been reinforced by the weapons we had captured during the battle. So the first time we organized a new column the second column we gave command of that column to Che. And we made him commander, the second commander of our forces. With his small new column, he began to operate in a specific area, in positions not far from where the first column was based. That was how Che became a soldier and was named commander of a small column. And, of course, he continued to display the same character, the same attitude, to such an extent that it can be said we had to watch out for him. What do I mean by watching out for him? Well, his aggressiveness and audacity led him to plan very daring operations. And when he entered combat during the following stage, which lasted several months a stage where his small group still lacked sufficient forces and experience in the region they were operating in he displayed great tenacity and perseverance as a soldier. Sometimes he insisted on fighting with the enemy for a position. And there he would stay and fight for hours, even days. We could say that, in a way, he even violated the rules that is, the ideal norms, the most perfect methods of combat, risking his life in battle because of that character, tenacity, and spirit of his. He would obstinately refuse to surrender a position even though his little column was very small and the advancing enemy forces very numerous, even when there wasn't much sense in defending that particular position. That was his character, his perseverance, his combative spirit. Logically, therefore, we had to lay down certain rules and guidelines for him to follow. What was it that we admired in him, that impressed us? What was that characteristic that gave the precise measure of Che's spirit and soul? It was his moral qualities, his altruism, his absolute selflessness. He had met a group of Cubans, he became convinced of their cause, and from the very first moment he showed great selflessness and generosity. From the first moment, he was absolutely willing to give his life, regardless of whether it was in the first battle or the second or the third. Here we had a person born in a place thousands of kilometers from our country, a person some Cubans had even once objected to because he was giving them orders and hadn't been born in Cuba, but for that country and for that cause, he was the first at every moment to volunteer for something dangerous, for a mission with great risks. He was someone who had no personal ambitions whatsoever. There was nothing he wanted except to do his duty and to do it well. He sought to respond quickly in any situation, to immediately and unhesitatingly set an example of what he thought a revolutionary fighter should be. How far Che was during those early days from imagining that one day, in this community, 
there would be a meeting such as this and that we would be standing in front of a monument honoring him. Che did not fight for glory, for material possessions, or ambition. He never fought for fame. He was a person who right from the outset, from the very first battle, was ready to give his life, who could have been killed as just one more soldier. If he had died in the first battle, he would have left behind the memory of his person, the personality and characteristics we knew him by, and nothing more. The same if he had died in the second, third, fourth, or fifth battle. He could have died in any of those battles, many did. Therefore, we can say that Che thought of nothing but duty and sacrifice, with the most absolute purity and with the most complete selflessness. We can say that Che survived the battles in the Sierra Maestra because we followed the principle that whenever a person distinguished themselves as a leader, we would not expose them in minor battles but would save them for more important operations. An offensive was launched against us in May 1958, when some 10,000 soldiers of the Batista dictatorship advanced against our forces at the time we had at most 300 soldiers, including Che's column and some other forces we had managed to get together. After a battle that lasted 70 consecutive days, our soldiers, who were already combat-tested veterans in spite of being at a disadvantage with regard to weapons and numbers managed to smash the offensive, capture a sizable number of weapons, and organize different columns. When the battle began, we had 300 men, when it ended we had 805 armed men. It was then that we organized two columns one commanded by Camillo and the other by Che equipped with the best weapons we had, and they carried out what we can call a veritable feat. Starting from the Sierra Maestra Camillo with 90 men, Che with 140 they marched toward the west, toward Las Villas province, across more than 500 kilometers of flatlands, uninhabited in many places. The two columns left the Sierra Maestra around September. They advanced with the enemy close on their heels, many times fighting their way over difficult terrain, and carried out their mission of reaching the center of the island. When, at the end of December, our forces were virtually in control of Orient Province, and the island was cut in two through Las Villas Province, Che performed one of his last military feats in Cuba. He marched on the city of Santa Clara with 300 combatants, attacked an armored train stationed on the outskirts of the city, cut the tracks between the train and the main headquarters of the enemy, derailed the train, surrounded it, forced the troops inside to surrender, and captured all the weapons there. In short, he attacked the city of Santa Clara with only 300 men. When the Batista regime finally collapsed on January 1st and there was an attempt to cheat the Cuban revolution of its triumph, the columns of Camillo and Che were ordered to advance rapidly on Havana. They carried out their mission, on January 2nd both columns were inside the capital of the Republic. Victory was consolidated on that day, and a long road began. Everybody's life changed. Many tasks arose and many combatants had to take on administrative responsibilities. At the end of several months, Che was named Minister of Industry and began to carry out the work that occupied him for several years. I have spoken of Che as a soldier but he was endowed with outstanding qualities in many areas. First of all, he was a person of extraordinary culture, he had one of the most penetrating minds I have known, one of the most generous spirits, one of the most revolutionary characters. His feelings his concern for other people, his concern for the movement in Asia and Africa extended to the whole world. At the time the Algerians were fighting for their independence from France, in a war from 1954 to 1962. The poor and underdeveloped countries in other continents were also engaged in different struggles. He saw with complete clarity the need to establish contact with these worlds. He visited many countries on different missions, seeking closer relations and commercial trade, working hard to overcome the consequences of the economic blockade imposed on our country. When the Bay of Pigs invasion took place, Che was in command of the forces of Pina del Rio province. When the attack began, in the south-central part of the island, we didn't know at first where the direction of the main attack would be. Generally speaking, the most experienced leaders assumed command of specific military zones. 
and even though he was in charge of the Ministry of Industry, as soon as the mobilization against the attack began, Che was sent to Pina del Rio province. Similarly, when the October missile crisis occurred, in 1962 another moment of very grave danger Che again assumed command of that military region. Thus, a number of times and under different circumstances, we were obliged to confront certain grave dangers. And he continued to serve as a combatant, he assumed his responsibilities, he continued studying military science assiduously. He was an extremely studious person who, in the hours in which he could manage to free himself from his intense work, sacrificed sleep and rest to study. Not only did he work interminable hours in the Ministry of Industry, but he also received visitors, wrote accounts of the war, and about his experiences in the countries he visited on one or another mission. He related his experiences in an interesting, simple, and clear style. Many episodes of the Revolutionary War have been preserved because Che wrote them down, because of his interest in making available for our people the experiences of their compatriots at various times. Che was the originator of voluntary work in Cuba. He maintained close contact with the workplaces that were under the responsibility of the Ministry of Industry. He visited them, talked with the workers, analyzed the problems. Every Sunday, Che went to some workplace, sometimes to the docks to load freight with the dock workers, sometimes to the mines to work with the miners, sometimes to the cane fields to cut cane, sometimes he met with construction workers. He never kept a Sunday for himself. What's more, all this and his previous feats must be viewed in the light of his own health, for he suffered from certain allergy problems that produced severe attacks of asthma. With asthma, he fought during the whole campaign. With asthma, he worked day and night. With asthma, he wrote. With asthma, he traveled throughout the country and the world. With asthma, he went down into the mines, went to work in the fields, went everywhere without ever allowing himself a moment's rest. When he wasn't working at his responsibilities in the ministry, he was studying during hours stolen from sleep, or he was out doing voluntary work. Che was a person with infinite confidence and faith in humanity. He was a living example. It was his style to be the example, to set the example. He was a person with a great spirit of self-sacrifice, with a truly Spartan nature, capable of any kind of self-denial. His policy was to set the example. We could say that his entire life was an example in every sphere. He was a person of absolute moral integrity, of unshakably firm principles, a complete revolutionary who looked toward the future, toward the humanity of the future, and who above all stressed human values, humanity's moral values. And above all, he practiced selflessness, renunciation, self-denial. None of the words I use about him involve the slightest exaggeration, the slightest overestimation. They simply describe the man we knew. Here is his monument, here is his figure as the artist saw it. But it is impossible for a monument to capture the overall conception of the person. We have Che's writings, his narratives, his speeches. Those who knew him have their own memory of Che. And we have seen how proudly the workers in many of our factories recall the day Che visited their workplaces, the places where Che did voluntary work. Not very long ago, we visited a large textile plant whose machinery was being upgraded. We were accompanied by an illustrious foreign visitor. The workers there took us to a shop where they kept, almost like a family treasure, the looms on which Che had done voluntary work. The mines Che visited and the places where he worked and talked with the workers are other monuments to his memory, which our workers cherish with extraordinary affection. But Che did not live for history, he did not live for honor or glory. Like every other true revolutionary, like every other thoroughgoing revolutionary, he knew what that extraordinary person, that great patriot Jose Marti whom you have also honored here meant when he said, all the glory of the world fits into a kernel of corn. Revolutionaries do not struggle for honor or glory, or to occupy a place in history. Che occupied, occupies, and will always occupy a great place in history because that was not important to him, because he was ready to die from the first battle on, 
because he was always absolutely selfless. And so his life became an epic, his life became an example. We say to our people and this has become a basic idea, a watchword if we were to describe what we want our children to be like, we would want them to be like Che. There is no Cuban family, no Cuban parent, no Cuban child who doesn't hold Che up as the model for their life. If today's world this contemporary world that is writing a new history of humanity, that is trying to build a better, more humane society, that confronts very complex problems and difficult struggles if today's world is seeking an example, and if you consider the qualities this example requires, we who knew Che, we who had that great privilege, understand why our people and our country have chosen this model for our children. And we believe it is an extraordinarily worthy one. How wonderful it would be if we were to succeed in making this model a reality in the generations to come so that in the future we would have generations like Che. Future societies will be made of generations of people like Che. From generations of people like Che a better society, communism, will arise. He left us his example. And as the final fruit of his clear mind, his Spartan character, his heart of steel steel for self-sacrifice, for suffering of his noble, sensitive and generous spirit of giving himself to a cause and struggling for others, sacrificing himself for others, of his intelligence, his heart and his calm hand, he left us, finally, his diary, in which he narrated the epic of the last days of his life. And in his concise, straightforward, terse style, reflecting the last moments of his life, he wrote a true epic of literature, containing extraordinary merit in every sense. That is why the youth of the world see Che as a symbol. And just as he identified with the cause of the Algerians, the Vietnamese, and the Latin Americans, so Che's name and figure are viewed with tremendous respect, admiration and affection on all continents. The name and figure of Che are emblazoned even there in the very heart of U.S. society itself. Civil rights fighters, fighters against the war of aggression, fighters for peace, progressives, all citizens who struggle for any cause whatever within the United States itself, have taken up Che's name and banner. He has therefore become a gigantic figure, and so he is. But nobody's imagination, nobody's fantasy, nobody's self-interest created this. Never has a banner been raised on a more solid pedestal, never has an example been raised on firmer ground. Che himself turned his figure into the symbol during his brief but intense life, his brief but creative life. This was not his aim, this was not what he sought. But because of his life, his selflessness, his nobility, his altruism, his heroism, he became what he is today. He became a banner, a model, a fighter. He became a guide. He became a monument to all that is noble, to the spirit of justice. Che is, in short, a model as a revolutionary, as a fighter, and as a communist for all the peoples of the world. Chapter 7 I Still Dream of Che 1987 The following is part of a 1987 interview with Fidel Castro by Italian journalist Johnny Mina at the time of the 20th anniversary of Che's death. The entire interview was published as an encounter with Fidel, Ocean Press, 1990. Johnny Mina, President Castro, you are a witness to contemporary history like few others in our time. This interview is proof of that. I would like to move on to your most intimate recollections of some comrades in struggle, in particular Che Guevara and Camilo Cienfuegos. For example, Che represents a symbol, an ideal, for at least three generations in Europe and the world. When you think of your friend Che, what is the first thought that comes to your mind? Fidel Castro, for me, as well, it has been hard to accept the thought that Che is dead. I have dreamed many times you sometimes tell people the things you dream I dreamed I spoke with him, that he was alive. It's a very special thing, a person whose death it is hard to resign yourself to. What's the reason? In my opinion, it is because he has a permanent presence in everything. His death occurred far away, many miles from our country. The idea that Che was dead was something very difficult to get used to. 
it hit me differently from the death of other comrades, for we have lost comrades in the struggle many times. We have seen comrades die. One has the impression Che is still present because of what he symbolizes, because of his character, his conduct, his principles. He had a great number of truly exceptional qualities. I knew him very well, from the time he made contact with us in Mexico until he left Cuba the final time. I really think, with sorrow, that with Che's death a great mind was lost. He was a person who still had much to contribute to the theory and practice of building socialism. Johnny Mina, in the letter to you that Che wrote before leaving he seems almost bitter for not having earlier recognized your quality as a leader, for the time it took him to fully recognize that. Fidel Castro, what might be the reason for that? First, Che was a very quiet man. He was not expressive. He didn't communicate these things. He felt things but he did not say them. By the way, some very warm-hearted verses he wrote about me have come to light, someone saved them. He was naturally a little skeptical about Latin America, about Latin American politicians. He may have thought our revolution might end the way other revolutions have ended. But in reality he never gave me the slightest impression of having such doubts. He was always extraordinarily fraternal and respectful with me. He may have been a little mistrustful of the July 26th movement. He may have observed that our movement was heterogeneous, that it included people from many different sectors. He already had an excellent revolutionary education, a Marxist education. He was very studious. He had graduated from medical school, conducted research, and was very rigorous in studying the questions of Marxism. So for this reason he was a little skeptical. I think if he wrote what he did it must have been from an excess of integrity, because in reality I had to coordinate many factors and to promote unity over the reservations demonstrated by one or another comrade, I had to have patience in my relations with them. For Che, who was impulsive, very courageous, very daring, at times even reckless, I always had special regard. On more than one occasion he would step forward as a volunteer. Whatever the mission, the first volunteer was always Che. He volunteered for the most difficult actions and suggested them in the midst of combat. He was totally selfless and altruistic. Cuba wasn't his homeland, yet he had joined us and every day he was ready to give his life for the revolution. I would, of course, use cotters according to the importance of a mission. When a cotter had acquired more skills, more experience, we would send out new cotters so they too could could learn and develop. In war you can't continually use a cotter in dangerous situations, because at one moment or another you will lose them. We really had to protect the cotters, preserve them, because they wanted to do things and I took on the task of preserving them as much as possible and using them in the most important missions. I often rotated the men in this type of task, but as for him. Well, I truly believe if we hadn't followed this policy, Che, because of those character traits of his, would not have come out of the war alive. But Che was exceedingly straightforward. If at any moment he thought there was some doubt about something, he felt obligated to speak up about it. That's the way he was. Johnny Mina, the Cuban Revolution is incredible. It united an intellectual like Che, an intellectual like you, and a simple man of the people like Camillo men of different backgrounds and educational levels, who functioned together in harmony. There was clearly a common dream. Fidel Castro, they were three people of three different origins, different characteristics. What is extraordinary about Che is that he wasn't Cuban, he was Argentine. When we met in Mexico, he had been working in Guatemala as a doctor. He was filled with enthusiasm by the political process in Guatemala, by the agrarian reform. He witnessed the intervention of the United States and suffered very much over all that. It was something he carried within him. He joined us right away. As he relates, he joined us the first time we had a conversation. He envisioned an anti-imperialist revolution, a revolution of national liberation. 
He did not yet see the socialist revolution he envisioned that to be a little bit down the road but he committed himself totally. Moreover, Che was our doctor. No one thought of Che as being a great soldier. He liked sports. He tried to climb Popa Catapetal almost every week, he never reached the top, but tried every week. He suffered from asthma, he had that handicap, but he made a heroic effort to climb that volcano. Although he never made it to the top, he never stopped trying to climb it once more. That also shows what kind of character he had. He was our doctor, he went as our doctor because he had that handicap. No one imagined him as a soldier. But he wasn't only an intellectual, he was also to become a great soldier. Camillo was a man of the people. At first no one could have guessed his qualities. Later he really distinguished himself. I am sure many more would have done so, because in our group of 82 men I later gave this quite a bit of thought there were some 40 who were suited to become leaders. Out of those few who survived, several brilliant leaders emerged, Camillo, Che, and other comrades, including one outstanding leader not mentioned so much Rahul. Johnny Mina, how were Camillo and Che different? Fidel Castro, they had two different personalities, even though they loved and respected each other very much. Camillo liked to joke a lot, he always had a sense of humor. Johnny Mina, Cuban. Fidel Castro, he had a Cuban sense of humor, always laughing, very daring, very intelligent, less intellectual than Che but also an excellent leader, one who never gave the enemy an opportunity. He was very courageous, but wasn't as reckless as Che. Che seemed to be a man who sought death. Camillo defied death, he wasn't afraid of it, but he wasn't reckless. Those are two differences between them. They had great affection for each other. Johnny Mina, and your brother, Rahul. Fidel Castro, another leader who, as I said, is not mentioned so much in this connection. Rahul is capable, responsible, and brilliant. He also played a very important role. Of the group that survived, several very good leaders emerged. That's why I think there were many young men who, had they survived the initial expedition, were well suited to become leaders. At least 15 or 20 outstanding leaders could have emerged from our group because someone needs both the opportunity and responsibilities to distinguish themselves. Johnny Mina, more than 20 years ago Che left Cuba to fight in Bolivia. Can you tell me where he went from the time he left Havana until he arrived in Bolivia? Fidel Castro, Che very much wanted to go to South America. This was an old idea of his, and when he joined us in Mexico although it is not that he made it a condition he did ask one thing, the only thing I want after the victory of the revolution is to go fight in Argentina his country that you don't keep me from doing so, that no reasons of state will stand in the way. And I promised him that. It was a long way off, after all. Firstly, no one knew if we would win the war or who was going to be alive at the end and he surely, because of his impetuousness, had little chance of coming out alive but this is what he asked. Once in a while, in the Sierra and afterward, he would remind me of this plan and promise. He was certainly farsighted in this. After gaining experience in the Sierra Maestra, he grew more enthusiastic about the idea of making a revolution in South America, in his own country. Che knew firsthand our exceptional experience, beginning with the difficult conditions in which we rebuilt our army and carried through the struggle, and he developed a great faith in the possibilities of the revolutionary movement in South America. When I speak of South America, I am actually speaking of the southern part of South America. The promise had been given and I always told him, don't worry, we will keep our word. He raised it perhaps two or three times. With the triumph of the revolution there were many tasks to carry out and problems of all kinds to be resolved. We had political problems, problems with the unification of our forces, state problems, economic problems, all such things. Now no one knew what a great soldier Che would turn out to be. He was, as I said, our doctor, who began to distinguish himself in the first battles and was to become a great military leader. 
both he and Camillo carried out a very important task in the war the invasion of the central part of the country, under difficult conditions. Much more could be said about that, but this is not the time. We had to confront all the tasks of a victorious revolution, where nothing remained of the former state, the old armed forces, or the administrative apparatus. The various revolutionary organizations although ours carried the principal weight had the support of the immense majority of the population, and we used our influence to bring about unity. We always fought sectarianism. We experienced a process of unity of the revolutionary forces. Camillo took part in all this but his death was very premature, it occurred in October 1959 in connection with the events in Camgi and the problem of Huber Matos. Che was later assigned to head the Ministry of Industry. He worked very methodically. He also had several other responsibilities. Every time a serious comrade was needed for an important post, Che would offer to do it. He was named president of the National Bank in the days when technicians, specialists in banking but politically inconsistent, were abandoning the country. Jokes and anecdotes followed. People would say that we had asked for an economist and Che volunteered. And we asked him, you're an economist. No, he answered, I'm a communist. The struggle inside the country was just beginning, and right-wing elements were accusing Che of being a communist and all kinds of things such as that. But Che always had great authority. Every assignment he was given he would fulfill strictly and brilliantly. He worked hard and acquired his first experiences in building socialism in the sector of nationalized industry. He worked hard in organizing production, in checking production, in voluntary work. He was one of the pioneers of voluntary work. He participated in almost every activity. He was very consistent in everything he did, he set an example in everything he did. That is how he spent the first years of the revolution. He later evidently began to feel impatient about carrying out his old plans and ideas. I believe he was influenced in part by the fact that time was passing. He knew that special physical conditions were required for this. He felt he was capable of doing it and, in reality, he was at the peak of his mental and physical capacities. He had many ideas, based on the experience he had gained in Cuba, of what could be done in his native country. He was primarily thinking of his country, but didn't think only of Argentina. He thought of all the Americas, of South America in general. He was impatient. From our own experience, I knew the difficulty of the initial phase of a process like the one he wanted to carry out. I thought better conditions could be created for what he was thinking of doing. We attempted to persuade him not to be impatient, to convince him that more time was needed. He wanted to go out from the very first day and do it all, while we wanted other, less well-known cotters to carry out the initial steps. Che was also very interested in international questions, in the problems faced by Africa. At the time, mercenaries had intervened in the former Belgian Congo, now Zaire. Lumumba had been killed, a neo-colonial regime was established, and a movement of armed struggle emerged in Zaire. We never made this public, but the revolutionary movement asked us for help and we sent instructors and combatants on an internationalist mission. Johnny Mina, and Lumumba's movement. Fidel Castro, at that time Sonia Milot was its leader. It was the same movement, but Lumumba was dead. I myself suggested an idea to Che. He had time on his hands, he had to wait. At the same time he wanted to train cotters, to develop their experience. So we put him in charge of the group that was going to help the revolutionaries in what is today Zahir. They went in by way of Tanzania, crossing Lake Tanganyika. In all, about 100 Cubans went and stayed there several months. He followed the approach of teaching Zairians how to fight. Cubans and Zairian patriots fought white mercenaries and forces sent by the government. They fought many battles against the mercenaries. The idea was not to fight the war in place of the Zairians but rather to help them, to teach them how to fight. But that movement was just beginning. It didn't have sufficient strength or unity. 
In the end the revolutionary leaders of the former Belgian colony decided to halt the struggle, and our personnel were withdrawn. That decision was quite correct. It had become clear that conditions did not exist at the time for developing the struggle. The Zairians analyzed the situation along with the Cuban contingent, and we were in agreement with their assessment. Consequently the unit was withdrawn, and the Cuban personnel returned home. Having now spent about six months in Zahir, Che stayed for a while in Tanzania, assessing the experience he had just lived through. His conduct on the mission was, as always, exemplary to the highest degree. His stay in Africa was temporary, awaiting the creation of conditions for traveling to South America. During this whole period the situation became highly awkward for us, as Che had already said goodbye. He had written the letter before he left, and he left quietly of course you might even say clandestinely. We kept the letter quiet and this gave rise to many rumors as well as some slander. Some said that Che had been made to disappear, others that Che was dead, or that there were differences all sorts of stories. We took that deluge of rumors and intrigue silently, so as not to endanger the mission he wanted to accomplish and the personnel he intended to take to his final destination South America. So after finishing the phase in Zahir he went to Tanzania, marking time. He spent some months in Tanzania and then went to a socialist country in Eastern Europe. In fact. Well, I'm not going to say more, because I haven't checked with the country in question to see if it can be told. He stayed there. He didn't want to return to Cuba because it would have been an embarrassment to come back after the publication of the letter. Eventually, publication of the letter became unavoidable. It was becoming very harmful to allow the campaign of slander to continue without an answer, an explanation to world public opinion. The only alternative was to publish the letter. The letter, of course, said nothing specific about his mission. He spoke only of fighting in other parts of the world. Once the letter had been made public politically, it had become unavoidable to publish it Che, with his particular character, felt very awkward about returning to Cuba after having said farewell. But in the end I persuaded him to return, because it was the best move given all the practical matters he wanted to take care of. So he secretly returned to Cuba. He stayed several months, training in a remote mountainous region. He spent months in training with those who were to accompany him. He asked for the collaboration of a group of comrades some were veteran guerrilla fighters, some were new men who had been in Zahir with him. He asked for their help. He selected the group and spoke with each one of them. We authorized the selection of a group of highly experienced comrades to accompany him, because the task he intended to carry out really required a group of experienced volunteers. He trained with them for several months while groundwork was undertaken to arrange for transporting him and his group to Bolivia. Che chose the territory and worked out the plan of struggle. We gave him cooperation and support in carrying out the project, although naturally we were concerned about the inherent risks. We would have preferred a movement that was already much more developed, a movement Che could join, but he wanted to get there almost at the very beginning. We managed to hold him until at least some preliminary work had been carried out, so he could go there with a little more safety. The initial stages are the most difficult. In fact, all this was organized perfectly, down to the last detail. Che and the other comrades were transported to a camp in the area selected. They had to overcome difficult obstacles, pass through complicated places. It wasn't easy, but it was accomplished thanks to the methods used. They managed to join with a group of comrades in the area of Nakawazu, I believe it's called, in the part of Bolivia he chose. That was more or less the itinerary, a stay in Africa, leaving via Tanzania, eastern Zahir, a return to Tanzania, a socialist country in Europe, Cuba again and, finally, the trip to the area he had selected in Bolivia. Johnny Mina, was it a mistake to have chosen Bolivia, where the people were probably not yet ready for a revolution? Was it a romantic error determined by a geographic choice that was neither tactically nor strategically justified? Fidel Castro, I wouldn't say that. 
he was interested in Argentina, he was genuinely inspired by the idea of making a revolution in Argentina. But at that time we had no relations with any country in South America all those governments had joined with the United States against Cuba. In the early days Che had recruited a group of Argentines, including Jorge Ricardo Massetti, who worked with us in the Sierra Maestra as a journalist and who later founded Prensa Latina. Che had recruited him to his ideas of struggle in Argentina. Massetti, in agreement with Che, attempted to establish a front in northern Argentina, in the Salta area. Massetti died on that mission. Che was always a very sensitive man, highly committed to his comrades. The mere fact that he had initiated the effort, the struggle, in which some comrades had already given their lives was without doubt a factor that greatly influenced his impatience to carry out his plans. He had already studied the area in question. And the importance of the area he selected seems to have been its proximity to the Argentine border. Che knew the Bolivian peasants were very quiet, reserved, and mistrustful. He knew they were very different from Cuban peasants. After graduating from medical school, he had traveled through South America on a motorbike. He visited a number of places, and even got as far as the Amazon. He had extensive contact with the people there and knew the tragedy of the Indians, their characteristics. He knew this very well and felt it deeply. More than once he explained to me, told me what they were like, how you had to work with them, how this took time, that it wasn't easy. He was conscious of the difficulties of the task ahead. So what happened? He had witnessed our experience, our almost incredible experience. After the initial setbacks, he saw how a very small group could reorganize and carry out a struggle under very difficult conditions. He had blind faith in this type of struggle and its possibilities, even more so now that he had enormous experience in it. So Che chose the territory, the place. And essentially, I would say he made no mistake in his choice. No mistake was made. He tried to gain the support of organized political forces. He assumed he could count on the support of the Bolivian Communist Party and other forces. It turned out that other forces joined him, because there were divisions at that time within the left, within the communist movement. Johnny Mina, in this regard, Che's father has said publicly that the Bolivian Communist Party is responsible for Che's death, that if they did not betray him, they surely left him to die. And is it true, as Regis de Bray has said, that Che could have been saved if an expedition of young Bolivian communists had set out from Cochabamba? Fidel Castro, I share none of these views. And I believe I am very well informed on these questions. The Bolivian Communist Party had various leaders. The general secretary, Mario Monge, had already been spoken with, and an agreement of sorts had been reached. But other leaders were involved as well. It was that, really, that led to the conflict with Monge. That is well known, it's part of history. A conflict arose between Che and Monge over certain of Monge's positions, perhaps over pretensions of his concerning leadership, pretensions Che did not accept. I believe that formal factors prevailed in Manje's thinking, along the lines that it was his country where action was to begin, that he was the general secretary of the party. But in reality there was no one, no Cotter, better prepared than Che to lead an action that transcended the borders of Bolivia. This gave rise to misunderstandings, and they were not able to reach agreement. Manje withdrew his support. We received this information and immediately arranged meetings here with other important and prestigious leaders of the party, with Kahl and with Simon Reyes, a well-known and very good workers' leader. I asked them to come to Cuba, spoke with them, and told them, a crisis has emerged, and it's a very delicate situation. I have asked you to come meet with us because it is essential that you give Che some help. They promised to help they were ready to provide assistance and collaboration. They did everything possible, although in disagreement with the party secretary. What happened is that the pace of events quickened, and there was no chance for them to help. But they had an excellent attitude and understood everything in the meeting I had with them.
Kal later became leader of the party, replacing Manje. Simon Reyes also took on important responsibilities in the party leadership. They were part of the Bolivian Communist Party and they made a commitment. When we received information about this sort of situation, that is the kind of solution we sought. We managed to gain the support of other movements and also of a few Latin Americans. This was the stage the work was at when events became complicated and, in fact, their presence was discovered. For one reason or another, a combination of factors, the detachment was spotted while it was still in the stage of organization. I believe they needed a little bit more time. Manje bears a certain responsibility, but historically it would be unjust to blame the Bolivian Communist Party as a whole. A number of communists joined Che. These included the Pareto brothers, excellent people who proved to be very fine cotters. They joined and supported Che, gave him a great deal of help. And important cotters in the party leadership differed with Manje and wanted to help Che. So when responsibility is assigned, it should be given to Manje, but you cannot accuse the entire Bolivian Communist Party or blame it for the way events developed. Johnny Mina, in Europe it is also said. Fidel Castro, as for Debre, I didn't even respond to that because it belongs to the realm of fantasy. Yes, it is only fantasy, because not even the most minimal conditions existed to organize a column that could have helped Che. There were no weapons, no trained combatants, and no trainees. It's a theory, it can only be spoken of as a theory, it's a fantasy. You have to understand this is not regular war, it's guerrilla war, irregular war, and this kind of war has its own laws. It wasn't that way. You can't solve things so easily. Johnny Mina, in Europe it's also said the publisher Fultrinelli contributed without intending to, of course to leading the CIA to the traces of Che's little group in the woods near Valle Grande. Is there any truth in that? Fidel Castro, this is the first time, in fact, I have heard that, the first time I've heard that rumor, that version. There isn't the slightest possibility Fultrinelli did anything that affected the situation. Today the whole history of the matter is known. Many books have been written about it, and I have read them. First of all, there's Che's diary, which I have studied carefully, very carefully. I knew Che very well, and through the diary I was able to see each of his states of mind, each thing, because I knew him so well. Then there are all the documents written by the Bolivian army, detailing the information they were receiving, when, at what point, how they interpreted it, what they did. This whole story has been written, and not just by revolutionaries. In addition, there are the diaries of other comrades who survived, of those who were with Che until the final moments, diaries that fell into the hands of the Bolivian army. We know the testimony, we know step by step what occurred. There were a few lapses in discipline, some acts of poor judgment that gave the enemy indications something was going on, although they didn't know the magnitude. But this had nothing to do with Fultrinelli or with anybody, really. These facts are known in minute detail. There is one thing. They already had camps set up, they had created all the conditions, these are facts that have been told before. The army managed to determine there was something strange going on, but this coincided with other circumstances. Che began an incursion with a large detachment to explore the terrain and make a broad sweep through the area. They left the newest people in camp, those who had just arrived. But the trip lasted several weeks, it turned into a veritable odyssey. Che's diary describes in detail how they confronted high mountains, harsh terrain, swollen rivers. They also suffered some losses on the trip some drownings, one or two casualties. The troops returned completely exhausted after several weeks on the march. When they returned to the camp they discovered there had been some problems in Che's absence some infractions of discipline, some difficulties. But the worst was that although the troops were worn out, with a few men ill, they had no time to recover. In a few short days the army began to carry out some explorations and the first fighting took place. Because of their experience, Che's men suffered no losses. In fact, 
ambushes they set with a few men captured weapons and dealt the adversary a hard blow. But I would say all this happened prematurely. They made another incursion, again leaving a force behind in the camp. This produced a division into two groups that were never to make contact with one another again. Moreover, Che didn't have enough medicine for his asthma. It was the same thing that had happened on the Granma, where there was no medicine. In the Sierra Maestra we really had to make an exceptional effort to get Che medicine at any cost, because the terrible asthma attacks paralyzed him. He was in great need of the medicine, but during this whole period he went without it. All this is described in Che's diary with great rigor, precision, and narrative quality. Each event is described very clearly. This was quite a feat, because they spent months evading and fighting the army. These were not the circumstances for discussing the idea of a support column. Nobody knew where they were. All communications had been cut by the enemy. In the cities the contact points were under constant observation. At that moment the fate of the guerrilla unit depended on what they themselves did. Che believed his guerrilla unit of 20 men could survive if they relocated, as he proposed, to a place with a social base where Inti and Coco Peretu were known. That is where they were headed in this final stage. Che knew this was their best chance. From the description of everything that took place not only from his diary but also the accounts of the Bolivian army the feat they did accomplish is impressive, including the number of battles they waged against the army. What they accomplished was of epic proportions. All this is well known. What could have influenced him? I have an opinion. I think he was deeply affected by the deaths of those in the other group. We had news of their death from wire service dispatches. They described how it happened. From our own experience we concluded at once that the news was exact, correct, and truthful. Tamira Tanya, Joaquim, the whole unit had been killed. But Che resisted believing it. You can see from his diary he resisted believing it for months. He thought it was another lie by the army, because they had put out a number of false reports. For our part, however, when we saw the dispatches we were immediately convinced it was true. When he was really convinced because nearly all his efforts and many of their marches were aimed at trying to make contact with the other unit when he was really persuaded they no longer existed and he was not going to meet up with them, that is when he began the march toward an area with a social base. By this time he already had some good Bolivian cotters who had distinguished themselves. It was the correct decision, he did have a chance to survive. How much did the death of the other comrades affect his state of mind? I believe at the end he acted with a certain recklessness. They were walking along a road and at one point he stopped on high ground and said, Radio Bimba word of mouth has been here ahead of us, everyone is expecting us. That's more or less what he said. You can read it in his diary. They were walking along a road toward the area, a public road, when he reached a ridge and wrote in his diary, our arrival is being announced by Radio Bimba. That is, everyone was waiting for them. I think the certainty that Joaquim's unit had been killed influenced his state of mind. I knew him well, I knew how strongly he felt things, and I think in that moment he was acting in conformity with his nature, with a certain degree of recklessness. He continued to advance, entered the town in daylight, and found it empty. An empty town is a sign that something is up. The people sense a battle is going to take place. Any army any army in the world, under those circumstances has only to wait somewhere along the road and set an ambush. And on one of those barren hills, in full light of day, the advance guard began to march as though the army didn't exist. It fell into an ambush in broad daylight, and several men were killed. It was a very serious blow. The group was also carrying some sick men, including a sick doctor. Che insisted on carrying them even though it held up their movement. Sometimes we ourselves, in similar situations, sought a place where we could leave a sick person someone who could no longer march with someone who could take care of them. Che must have been looking for such a possibility. But he had already lost his advance guard. They had been spotted and trapped in a valley, and the dead included some of the good people among the Bolivians. 
Among the dead was one of the two Pareto brothers who had distinguished themselves so much as Bolivian cotters. The attack left Che in a very difficult situation in difficult terrain. He had managed to evade the army for months while fighting constantly. He had carried out a feat of epic proportions. But he now found himself in an extremely critical situation. He had been spotted, attacked, and wounded. His rifle had been destroyed. He was taken prisoner and moved to a nearby place. I would say that even when he was marching with 20 men, including a few Bolivian cotters, if they made it to the area they sought, they would have had possibilities not just of surviving but of developing the guerrilla movement. Up until that time, judging by all Che knew and the experience we had, that possibility existed. The moment in which things really changed was when they advanced in broad daylight along a public road in those barren hills where the advance guard was ambushed. So he must have been greatly influenced by something, his scorn for death sometimes it seemed as though he went looking for death, at least at certain moments. In such circumstances he really should have advanced more cautiously, gotten off the road, looked for other places. And they should have traveled by night. The ambush, had it been carried out at night, would not have inflicted such great damage. The enemy would have been shooting in the dark, and they might have been spotted by a light or some other indication. I believe that at that moment certain elements in Che's character influenced events. I knew him very well, and I have read his diary carefully, more than once. Johnny Mina, at this stage was there anything you could have done to assist him? I mean, in this final stage of his epic struggle? Fidel Castro, it was impossible. What could we have done? Sent a battalion, a company, a regular army. The laws of guerrilla warfare are different, everything depends on what the guerrilla unit itself does. They really did carry out an epic struggle. Someday their accomplishments will be recounted more objectively. The Bolivian army itself in its descriptions. There was one general, General Gary Prado, I read his book How I Captured Che. It reflects the official point of view, but he doesn't conceal his admiration for his adversary. Clashes with the army occurred a number of times. Che knew what to do just as we did. When we arrived in the Sierra we too were dispersed, we managed to gather together seven rifles. We began the struggle again in the Sierra Maestra, where we knew no one, with seven rifles. When we had reached twenty men, we were a force to be reckoned with. Che had confidence in the possibilities of irregular struggle, he knew how to do it. In such circumstances the guerrilla unit depends on itself. It can neither expect nor receive help from abroad, such assistance is practically impossible. It wasn't possible, and secret assistance wasn't possible either, the entire network of support had been broken up. At that moment everything depended on their own actions. That's why formulas of conventional warfare, speculation about columns that set out, that come and go, don't apply here. All that belongs to the realm of fantasy. Johnny Mina, President Castro, at the dramatic moment of Che's death a story about you circulated in Europe. It speculated that after the summit meeting in Glassboro in New Jersey between Soviet Premier Kosygin and U.S. President Johnson, the United States and the Soviet Union decided to reach a truce in Asia and Latin America. And that is why Cuba was unable to do anything more to help Che in Bolivia. Fidel Castro, I am astounded at the number of rumors and fantasies that circulate in Europe. I'm going to begin believing Europe is the least informed area of the world. Johnny Mina, that may be. Fidel Castro, I really don't even remember that meeting. The war in Vietnam was at its peak, and Che's action was underway. Neither had anything to do with the other. There was no Soviet participation in this, there was no question of strategy that was being discussed. Really, what it amounted to was that with great loyalty we gave Che the assistance he asked for, the comrades he asked for, the collaboration he asked for, everything. We stood by our word. What is it that we would have preferred? That Che wait. We would have preferred that he wait until a developed guerrilla front had been established, but we couldn't impose such a decision on him. 
We knew we might face political problems, state problems, denunciations, everything of that sort. But we accepted that type of inconvenience so as to fulfill our pledge to him. We respected that commitment. Not only did we respect it, we believed in what he was doing, and we believed he could carry out what he proposed. I have always said that success or failure is not what indicates whether a line is correct. We all could have died during our struggle, we were on the verge of death many times. If we had died, many people would have said we were wrong. But I think if we had died, it would not have proved we were wrong. I think our road was correct. A series of elements, of imponderables, intervened including luck and we almost miraculously survived those difficult days. That would be another long story. But in such circumstances you can't say success is the measure of whether or not a line is correct. Certain factors led to an adverse result, but I don't question the correctness of Che's line. What I say is that I would have preferred he avoid the initial highly dangerous stage, that he join the group as political and military leader, as strategist in a movement that had passed the early stage. Because of Che's courage, his qualities, his importance, in our war we gave him the most important missions. We didn't give him this mission. The idea, the plan, everything, was his. We shared in it with him because we thought his ideas were correct. He could have done it. He could have done it. I am not going to conclude that because certain factors exerted influence, resulting in the elimination of the guerrilla unit and the death of Che I am not going to conclude because of this that his course was wrong. You cannot measure the correctness of a line by success or failure. That, in my opinion, would be a mistaken criterion. That's not the only example. We have seen another case, that of Francisco Camano, also a man of the highest courage, who could not overcome his impatience to return to his country the Dominican Republic and did so. I talked with him a great deal, I knew him well. I know then of two cases of great cotters whose impatience led them to their deaths. It's not simply death that is at issue here, the sadness death brings. It is rather that two great cotters, two great revolutionaries, died in this way. And Kamano with fewer possibilities than Che. Kamano was a good soldier and well trained. But conditions were also difficult and the group was very small. We would have preferred that these valued cotters be preserved for a more opportune moment. We did not impose our point of view on them, nor did we prohibit their courageous actions. We had excellent relations of friendship and trust. Che gave great attention to my point of view and to the opinions I expressed, because we maintained a deep and trusting friendship up until the end. It was his idea. Forbidding him to carry it out was outside the type of relationship we had. Not even for reasons of state would I impose an opinion on him. What we did was help him. We helped something we thought was possible. We would not have been able to help something we thought was impossible, something in which we did not believe, because it would have been our duty to tell him, it's not possible, we can't do that, we can't sacrifice comrades on this mission. But he did what he did. I shared in it and I believed in it. There is only one thing I would have done differently. He should have waited until a strong movement had developed before a cotter of his quality and strategic importance joined the struggle. He should not have gone through the initial stage. This is the most difficult and dangerous phase, as the facts showed, and it resulted in his death. Johnny Mina, why didn't the Bolivian authorities ever return Che's body? Did he still scare them even following his death? Fidel Castro, they wanted to get rid of Che's body to prevent the establishment of a site that would be venerated and visited by people. We still don't know what they did with Che's body, or where it is. This has never been clarified. Many of his things, belongings, have surfaced. We know everything that happened, from the accounts of both sides, which agree on most points. What we still don't know is where Che was buried. They wanted him to disappear. The United States also wanted him to disappear. Nonetheless, Che has become a great symbol for the entire world, the perfect example of the heroic and revolutionary person. He became, I would add, 
one of the most outstanding examples of a combatant and revolutionary in the third world, and perhaps in the industrialized world as well. And this idea, this image of Che, is not without justification. Johnny Mina, there's a striking coincidence linked to Che's death. 16 or 17 persons directly or indirectly responsible for his murder in Bolivia have died, not always in the clearest of circumstances. Fidel Castro, it does seem there have been people who played a part in his murder who have died this way. The likelihood is that no one organized it, that it's simply the people's spontaneous action, bringing to justice those who acted in a contemptible way. I'm not referring to the soldiers who fought against him, but rather to people who served as informers, traders, and henchmen. Johnny Mina, down to the peasant who. Fidel Castro, I think his name was Honorado. Johnny Mina, Honorado Rojas. Fidel Castro, I read about that in the book written by the Bolivian general, Gary Prado, a man who has become something of an invalid. I understand he is now in Washington as military attaché. He wrote a very objective and respectful book, although of course it also has high praise for the Bolivian army. But I'm not going to deny him, a Bolivian soldier, this sentiment toward his institution. The Bolivian army was poorly trained. It was acquiring more experience during that period, this is indisputable. The United States made a considerable effort, they intensified their training plans, because they wanted to destroy Che. Johnny Mina, two people as reserved as you and Che, how did you greet each other the last time you saw each other? With the hug of old friends, or with a handshake? Fidel Castro, we saw each other many times. Very warmly and with much affection. No, a hug, without much effusiveness, because we are not very effusive. He wasn't, I'm not. But we feel things deeply and with great trust. We talked many times. I went to see him several times while he was training the group. They spent months in the province of Pina del Rio. Johnny Mina, and the day he left? Fidel Castro, the day he left I went so far as to play a joke. The day he left for good I invited a number of members of the party leadership, the most trusted comrades, to lunch with a visitor. The visitor was Che disguised. Absolutely no one recognized him in the disguise that had been created. Che had lunch with a few others at a house here in Havana the day before he left and none of those comrades recognized him either. We had to tell the comrades who came for lunch that it was Che. So as you can see he was very well prepared when he left, nobody recognized him. It was really perfect. Nobody recognized him, not even his closest comrades, who were talking with him the way they would talk with a guest. So we went so far as to play jokes such as this on the comrades the day before he left. Johnny Mina, I thank you for all you have told me. I believe I had the pleasure of hearing in your words some of the history of our times, of what we are living, thinking, or have hoped. This is something I want to thank you for. Fidel Castro, we have the obligation to be just. There is no reason to make accusations. We all have things we're sufficiently responsible for, but Manje's responsibility, the other. Well, that's why I explain the story to you in detail. And that is why I wrote the introduction, what I called the necessary introduction, when we published Che's Bolivian Diary. I explained everything, with much more detail, and the role of everyone involved. I wrote the introduction to explain a range of things, and we published it widely. Later the diary circulated throughout the world. We have such a duty to be objective. I think I know quite well everything that happened. I have thought a great deal about it, analyzed all the documents, and I think I knew Che quite well, I knew him very, very well. I am very sure about the facts, how they occurred, and what factors may have influenced the course of events. This is something I have never spoken of before. There are still many chapters of history to be written. What is missing is someone to write them, because those who can write them don't have the time to do so. Chapter 8 20th Anniversary of Che's Death October 8, 
1987. The following speech was given by Fidel Castro on October 8, 1987, at the main ceremony marking the 20th anniversary of the death of Echo Beto Che Guevara. The ceremony was held at a newly completed electronic components factory in the city of Pina del Rio. Nearly 20 years ago, on October 18, 1967, we met in Revolution Plaza with a huge crowd to honor comrade Echo Beto Che Guevara. Those were very bitter, very difficult days when we received news of the developments in Vedo del Yeso, in El Euro Ravine, when news agencies reported Che had fallen in battle. It didn't take long to realize that those reports were absolutely correct, for they consisted of news items and photos proving it beyond doubt. The news came in for several days until, with all that information in hand although many of the details we know today were not known at the time we held the large mass rally, the solemn ceremony in which we paid our last respects to the fallen comrade. Nearly 20 years have passed since that time, and now, on October 8, we are marking the date he fell in battle. According to reliable reports we have now, he was actually murdered the following day, after having been captured unarmed and wounded, his weapon had been rendered useless in battle. That's why it has become a tradition to commemorate that dramatic event on October 8. The first year passed and then 5, 10, 15, and now 20 years, and it has been necessary to recall the historic dimensions of that development, and particularly the person. In a natural way, rather than a very deliberate or pondered way, the entire people have been recalling the date in recent months. It was possible to commemorate the 20th anniversary on a solemn note as we have seen here today, the playing of taps, the anthem, the magnificent poem by Nicholas Guillen, which rang out with the same voice we heard 20 years ago. I could try to give a very solemn, grandiloquent speech, perhaps a written speech, but in these times the pressure of work barely leaves a minute free for thinking more carefully about all those events and the things I could say here, let alone for writing a speech. That's why I'd prefer to recall Che, share my thoughts with you, because I've thought a lot about Che. I did an interview, part of which was made public yesterday in our country, in answer to the questions of an Italian journalist Johnny Mina who had me in front of the television cameras nearly 16 hours straight. There were more than 100 questions on a variety of subjects, but the journalist was very interested in talking about Che, and between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. we got to the subject. I made an effort to answer each of his questions, and I made a special effort to summarize my memories of Che. I told him how I felt, and I think many comrades feel the same way, regarding Che's permanent presence. We must keep in mind the special relationship with Che, the affection, the fraternal bonds of comradeship, the united struggle over nearly 12 years, from the moment we met in Mexico until the end, a period rich in historic events, some of which have been made public only in the last couple of days. It was a period filled with heroic and glorious deeds, from the time Che joined us to go on the Granma expedition, the landing, the setbacks, the most difficult days, the resumption of the struggle in the mountains, rebuilding an army virtually from scratch, the first clashes, and the last battles. Then the intense period that followed the victory of the revolution, the first revolutionary laws, in which we were absolutely loyal to the commitments we'd made to the people, carrying out a really radical transformation in the life of the country. There were the things that followed, one after another, such as the start of imperialist hostility, the slander campaigns against the revolution as soon as we started to do justice to the criminals and thugs who had murdered thousands of our fellow citizens, the economic blockade, the Bay of Pigs invasion, the proclamation of the socialist nature of the revolution, the struggle against the mercenaries, the October Missile Crisis, the first steps in the construction of socialism when there was. Nothing neither experience, cotters, engineers, nor economists, and hardly any technicians, when we were left almost without doctors because 3,000 of the 6,000 doctors in the country left. Then came the first and second declarations of Havana, the start of the isolation imposed on our country, the collective rupture of diplomatic relations by all Latin American governments except Mexico. It was a period in which, along with all these developments, 
we had to organize the economy of the country. It was a relatively brief but fruitful period replete with unforgettable events. It must be kept in mind that Che persisted in an old desire, an old idea, to return to South America, to his country, to make revolution based on the experience he had gained in our country. We should recall the clandestine way in which his departure had to be organized, the barrage of slanders against the revolution, when there was talk of conflicts, of differences with Che, that Che had disappeared. It was even said that he had been murdered because of splits in the ranks of the revolution. Meanwhile, the revolution calmly and firmly endured the ferocious attack, because over and above the irritation and bitterness caused by those campaigns, the important thing was for Che to be able to fulfill his goals, the important thing was to ensure his safety and that of the compatriots with him on his historic missions. In the interview I explained the origin of that idea, how when he joined us he had set only one condition, that once the revolution was made, when he wanted to return to South America he would not be prevented from doing so for reasons of state or for the state's convenience, that he would not be held back. We told him he could go ahead and that we would support him. He would remind us of this pledge every so often until the time came when he decided it was time to leave. Not only did we keep the promise of agreeing to his departure, but we gave him all the help we could. We tried to delay the departure a little. We gave him other tasks to enrich his guerrilla experience, and we tried to create a minimum of conditions so that he would not have to go through the most difficult stage of the first days of organizing a guerrilla force, something we knew full well from our own experience. We were well aware of Che's talent, his experience, and his role. He was a cotter suited to major strategic tasks and we felt it might be better if other comrades undertook the initial organizational work and that he join at a more advanced stage in the process. This also fitted in with our policy during the war of saving cotters, as they distinguished themselves, for increasingly important and strategic assignments. We did not have many experienced cotters, and as they distinguished themselves we would not send them out every day with a squad to ambush, rather, we gave them more important tasks in keeping with their ability and experience. Thus, I remember that during the days of Batista's final offensive in the Sierra Maestra Mountains against our militant but small forces, the most experienced cotters were not in the front lines, they were assigned strategic leadership assignments and saved for our devastating counterattack. It would have been pointless to put Che, Camilo Cienfuegos, and other comrades who had participated in many battles at the head of a squad. We held them back so that they could subsequently lead columns that would undertake risky missions of great importance, and it was then that we did send them into enemy territory with full responsibility and awareness of the risks, as in the case of the invasion of Las Villas led by Camilo and Che. This was an extraordinarily difficult assignment that required men of great experience and authority as column commanders, men capable of achieving the goal. In line with this reasoning, and considering the objectives, perhaps it would have been better if this principle had been observed and Che had joined at a later stage. It really was not so critical for him to handle everything right from the start. But he was impatient, very impatient really. Some Argentine comrades had been killed in the initial efforts he had made years before, including Ricardo Massetti, the founder of Prensa Latina. He remembered that often and was really impatient to start to participate. As always, we respected our commitments and his views, for our relationship was always based on absolute trust, absolute brotherhood, regardless of our ideas about what the right time for him to join in would be. And so we gave him all the help and all the facilities possible to start the struggle. Then news came of the first clashes and contact was completely lost. The enemy detected the initial stage of organization of the guerrilla movement, and this marked the start of a period lasting many months in which almost the only news we received was what came via international news dispatches, and we had to know how to interpret them. But that's something our revolution has become very experienced at, determining when a report is reliable or when it is made up, false. I remember, for example, when a dispatch came with the news of the death of Joaquim's group, his real name was Vilo Acuna. When we analyzed it, I immediately concluded that it was true, 
this was because of the way they described how the group had been eliminated while crossing a river. Because of our own guerrilla experience, because of what we had lived through, we knew how a small guerrilla group can be done away with. We knew the few, exceptional ways such a group can be destroyed. When it was reported that a peasant had made contact with the army and provided detailed information on the location and plans of the group, which was looking for a way to cross the river, how the army set up an ambush on the other bank at a spot on the route the same peasant had told the guerrilla fighters to use, the way the army opened fire in midstream. There was no doubt as to the truth of the explanation. If the writers of false reports, which came in often, tried to do it again, it was impossible that they, who were always so clumsy in their lies, would have had enough intelligence and experience to make up the exact circumstances in which the group could be eliminated. That's why we concluded the report was true. As we have explained, we had hopes that even with only 20 men left, even in a very difficult situation, the guerrillas still had a chance. They were headed toward an area where the peasants were organized, where some good Bolivian cotters had influence, and until that moment, until almost the very end, there was a chance that the movement could be consolidated and could develop. The circumstances in which my relationship with Che developed were so unique the almost unreal history of the brief but intense saga of the first years of the revolution when we were used to making the impossible possible that, as I explained to that journalist, one often had the impression that Che had not died, that he was still alive. Since his was such an exemplary personality, so unforgettable, so familiar, it was difficult to resign oneself to the idea of his death. Sometimes I would dream all of us dream of things related to our lives and struggles that I saw Che, that he returned, that he was alive. How often this happened? I told the journalist that these are feelings you seldom talk about, but they give an idea of the impact of Che's personality and also of the extraordinary degree to which he really lives on, almost as if his were a physical presence, with his ideas and deeds, with his example and all the things he created, with his continued relevance and the respect for him not only in Latin America but in Europe and all over the world. As we predicted on October 18, some 20 years ago, he became a symbol for all the oppressed, for all the exploited, for all patriotic and democratic forces, for all revolutionaries. He became a permanent and invincible symbol. We feel Che's presence for all these reasons, because of this real force that he still has today which, even though 20 years have gone by, exists in the spirit of all of us, when we hear the poem, when we hear the anthem or the bugle sounded before a moment's silence, when we open our newspapers and see photographs of Che during different stages of his life, his image, so well known throughout the world. It has to be said that Che not only had all the virtues and all the human and moral qualities to be a symbol, he also had the appearance of a symbol, the image of a symbol, his look, the frankness and strength of his look, his face, which reflects character, irrepressibly determined for action, at the same time showing great intelligence and great purity when we hear the poems that have been written, the episodes that are recounted, and the stories that are repeated, we feel the reality of Che's relevance, of his presence. If one imagines that Che is alive, that he is in action and that he never died, it's not strange if one feels his presence not only in everyday life, but even in dreams. In the end we must reach the conclusion that to all intents and purposes in the life of our revolution Che never died, and in the light of what has been done, he is more alive than ever, and is a more powerful opponent of imperialism than ever. Those who disposed of his body so that he would not become a symbol, those who, under the guidance of their imperial masters, did not want any trace to remain, have discovered that although there is no body, a frightening opponent of imperialism, a symbol, a force, a presence does exist that can never be destroyed. When they hit Che's body they showed their weakness and their cowardice, because they also showed their fear of the example and the symbol. They did not want the exploited peasants, the workers, the students, the intellectuals, the democrats, the progressives, or the patriots of this hemisphere to have a place to go to pay tribute to Che. And in the world today, in which there is no specific place to go to pay tribute to Che's remains, tribute is paid to him everywhere. 
Today tribute is not paid to Che once a year, or once every 5, 10, 15, or 20 years, today homage is paid to Che every year, every month, every day, everywhere in a factory, in a school, in a military barracks, in a home, among children, among pioneers. Who can count how many millions of times in these 20 years the pioneers have said, pioneers for communism, we will be like Che. This one fact I've just mentioned, this one idea, this one custom in itself constitutes a great and permanent presence of Che. And I think not only our pioneers, not only our children, but children all over the hemisphere, all over the world could repeat the same slogan, pioneers for communism, we will be like Che. Really, there can be no superior symbol, there can be no better image, there cannot be a more exact idea, when searching for the model revolutionary person, when searching for the model communist. I say this because I have the deepest conviction just the same or more so than when I spoke that October 18th and I asked how we wanted our fighters, our revolutionaries, our party members, our children to be, and I said that we wanted them to be like Che. He is the image of that human being if we want to talk about a communist society, if our real objective is to build not just socialism but the higher stages of socialism, if humanity is not going to renounce the lofty and extraordinary idea of living in a communist society one day. If we need a paradigm, a model, an example to follow to attain these elevated ideas, then people like Che are essential, men and women who imitate him, who think like him, who act like him, men and women whose conduct resembles his when it comes to doing their duty in every little thing, every detail, every activity, in his attitude toward work, his habit of teaching and educating by setting an example, his attitude of wanting to be first at everything, the first to volunteer for the most difficult tasks, the most self-sacrificing, the individual who gives his body and soul to a cause, the individual who gives his body and soul for others, the person who displays true solidarity, the individual who never lets down a comrade, the simple person, the person without a flaw, who doesn't live any contradiction between what they say and what they do, between what they practice and what they preach, a man of thought and a man of action all of which Che symbolizes. For our country it is a great honor and privilege to have had Che as a son of our people even though he wasn't born in this land. He was a son because he earned the right to consider himself and to be considered a son of our country. That's not to say that I think exceptional people are rare, that's not to say that amid the masses there are not hundreds, thousands, even millions of exceptional men and women. I said it once during the bitter days after Camillo disappeared. When I recounted the history of how Camillo became the man he was, I said, among our people there are many Camillos. I could also say, among our peoples of the world there are many CHES. Why do we call them exceptional? Because, in actual fact, in the world in which they lived, in the circumstances in which they lived, they had the chance and the opportunity to demonstrate all that human beings, with their generosity and solidarity, are capable of being. And, indeed, seldom do ideal circumstances exist in which human beings have the opportunity to express themselves and to show everything they have inside, as was the case with Che. Of course, it's clear that there are countless men and women among the masses who, partly as a result of other people's examples and certain new values, are capable of heroism, including a kind of heroism I greatly admire, silent heroism, anonymous heroism, silent virtue, anonymous virtue. But given that it's so unusual, so rare for all the necessary circumstances to exist to produce a figure like Che who today has become a symbol for the world, a symbol that will grow it is a great honor and privilege that this figure was born during our revolution. And as proof of what I said earlier about Che's presence and force today, I could ask, could there be a better date, a better anniversary than this one to remember Che with all our conviction and deep feelings of appreciation and gratitude? Is there a better moment than this particular anniversary, when we are in the middle of the rectification process? What are we rectifying? We're rectifying all those things and there are many that strayed from the revolutionary spirit, from revolutionary work, revolutionary virtue, revolutionary effort, revolutionary responsibility, 
all those things that strayed from the spirit of solidarity among people. We're rectifying all the shoddiness and mediocrity that is precisely the negation of Che's ideas, his revolutionary thought, his style, his spirit, and his example. I really believe, and I say it with great satisfaction, that if Che were sitting in this chair, he would feel jubilant. He would be happy about what we are doing these days, just like he would have felt very unhappy during that unstable period, that disgraceful period of building socialism in which there began to prevail a series of ideas, mechanisms, bad habits, which would have caused Che to feel profound and terrible bitterness. For example, voluntary work, the brainchild of Che and one of the best things he left us during his stay in our country and his part in the revolution, was steadily on the decline. It became a formality almost. It would be done on the occasion of a special date, a Sunday. People would sometimes run around and do things in a disorganized way. The bureaucrats view, the technocrats view that voluntary work was not basic or essential gained more and more ground. The idea was that voluntary work was kind of silly, a waste of time, that problems had to be solved with overtime, with more and more overtime, and this while the regular workday was not even being used efficiently. We had fallen into the bog of bureaucracy, of overstaffing, of work norms that were out of date, the bog of deceit, of untruth. We'd fallen into a whole host of bad habits that Che would have been really appalled at. If Che had ever been told that one day, under the Cuban Revolution there would be enterprises prepared to steal to pretend they were profitable, Che would have been appalled. Or if he'd been told of enterprises that wanted to be profitable and give out prizes, bonuses, and I don't know what else, and they'd sell the materials allotted to them to build and charge as though they had built whatever it was, Che would have been appalled. And I'll tell you that this happened in the 15 municipalities in the capital of the Republic, in the 15 enterprises responsible for house repairs, and that's only one example. They'd appear as though what they'd produced was worth 8,000 pesos a year, and when the chaos was done away with, it turned out they were producing 4,000 pesos worth or less. So they were not profitable. They were only profitable when they stole. Che would have been appalled if he'd been told that enterprises existed that would cheat to fulfill and even surpass their production plan by pretending to have done January's work in December. Che would have been appalled if he'd been told that there were enterprises that fulfilled their production plan and then distributed prizes for having fulfilled it in value but not in stock, and that engaged in producing items that meant more value and refrained from producing others that yielded less profit, despite the fact that one item without the other was not worth anything. Che would have been appalled if he'd been told that production norms were so slack, so weak, so immoral that on certain occasions almost all the workers fulfilled them two or three times over. Che would have been appalled if he'd been told that money was becoming people's concern, their fundamental motivation. He who warned us so much against that would have been appalled. Work shifts were being shortened and millions of hours of overtime reported, the mentality of our workers was being corrupted and were increasingly being motivated by the pesos on their minds. Che would have been appalled for he knew that communism could never be attained by trekking along those worn capitalist paths and that to follow along those paths would mean eventually to forget all ideas of solidarity and even internationalism. To follow those paths would imply never developing a new human being and a new society. Che would have been appalled if he'd been told that a day would come when bonuses and more bonuses of all kinds would be paid, without these having anything to do with production. Were he to have seen a group of enterprises teeming with two-bit capitalists as we call them playing at capitalism, beginning to think and act like capitalists, forgetting about the country, the people, and high standards, because high standards just didn't matter, all they cared about was the money being earned thanks to the low norms, he would have been appalled. And were he to have seen that one day they would not just make manual work subject to production norms which has a certain logic to it, like cutting cane and doing many other manual and physical activities but even intellectual work, even radio and television work, and that here even a surgeon's work was likely to be subject to norms putting just anybody under the knife in order to double or triple his income I can truthfully say that Che would have been appalled, because none of those paths will ever lead us to communism. On the contrary, 
those paths lead to all the bad habits and the alienation of capitalism. Those paths, I repeat and Che knew it very well would never lead us to building real socialism, as a first and transitional stage to communism. Don't think that Che was naive, an idealist, or someone out of touch with reality. Che understood and took reality into consideration. But Che believed in human beings. And if we don't believe in human beings, if we think that they are incorrigible little animals, only capable of advancing if you feed them grass or tempt them with a carrot or whip them with a stick anybody who believes this, anybody convinced of this will never be a revolutionary, anybody who believes this, anybody convinced of this will never be a socialist, anybody who believes this, anybody convinced of this will never be a communist. Our revolution is an example of what faith in human beings means because our revolution started from scratch, from nothing. We did not have a single weapon, we did not have a penny, even those who started the struggle were unknown, and yet we confronted all that might. We confronted their hundreds of millions of pesos, we confronted the thousands of soldiers, and the revolution triumphed because we believed in humanity. Not only was victory made possible, but so was confronting the empire and getting this far, only a short way off from celebrating the 29th anniversary of the triumph of the revolution. How could we have done all this if we had not had faith in human beings? Che had great faith in human beings. Che was a realist and did not reject material incentives. He deemed them necessary during the transitional stage, while building socialism. But Che attached more importance more and more importance to the consciousness factor, to the moral factor. Nevertheless, it would be a caricature to believe that Che was unrealistic and unfamiliar with the reality of a society and a people who had just emerged from capitalism. But Che was mostly known as a person of action, a soldier, a leader, a military figure, a guerrilla, an exemplary person who always was the first in everything, who never asked others to do something that he himself would not do first, a model of someone who was righteous, honest, pure, courageous, and solidarized with his fellow humans. These are the virtues he possessed and the ones we remember him by. Che was a person of very profound thought, and he had the exceptional opportunity during the first years of the revolution to delve deeply into very important aspects of the building of socialism because, given his qualities, whenever someone was needed to do an important job, Che was always there. He really was a many-sided individual and whatever his assignment, he fulfilled it in a completely serious and responsible manner. He was in the National Institute of Agrarian Reform, INRA, and managed a few industries under its jurisdiction at a time when the main industries had not yet been nationalized and only a few factories had been taken over. He headed the National Bank, another of the responsibilities entrusted to him, and he also headed the Ministry of Industry when this agency was set up. Nearly all the factories had been nationalized by then and everything had to be organized, production had to be maintained, and Che took on the job, as he had taken on many others. He did so with total devotion, working day and night, Saturdays and Sundays, at all hours, and he really set out to solve far-reaching problems. It was then that he tackled the task of applying Marxist-Leninist principles to the organization of production, the way he understood it, the way he saw it. He spent years doing that, he spoke a lot, wrote a lot on all those subjects, and he really managed to develop an elaborate and very profound theory on the manner in which, in his opinion, socialism should be built leading to a communist society. Recently, all these ideas were compiled, and an economist wrote a book that was awarded a Casa de las Americas Prize. The author compiled, studied, and presented in a book the essence of Che's economic ideas, retrieved from many of his speeches and writings articles and speeches dealing with a subject so decisive in the building of socialism. The name of the book is Che's Economic Thought. So much has been done to recall his other qualities that this aspect, I think, has been largely ignored in our country. Che held truly profound, courageous, bold ideas, which were different from many paths already taken. In essence in essence, Che was radically opposed to using and developing capitalist economic laws and concepts in building socialism. 
he advocated something that I have often insisted on, building socialism and communism is not just a matter of producing and distributing wealth but is also a matter of education and consciousness. He was firmly opposed to using the former concepts, which have been transferred from capitalism to socialism, as instruments to build the new society. At a given moment some of Che's ideas were incorrectly interpreted and, what's more, incorrectly applied. Certainly no serious attempt was ever made to put them into practice, and there came a time when ideas diametrically opposed to Che's economic thought began to take over. This is not the occasion for going deeper into the subject. I'm essentially interested in expressing one idea, today, on the 20th anniversary of Che's death, today, in the midst of the profound rectification process we are all involved in, we fully understand that rectification does not mean extremism, that rectification cannot mean idealism, that rectification cannot imply for any reason whatsoever lack of realism, that rectification cannot even imply abrupt changes. As a beginning idea, rectification means, as I've said before, looking for new solutions to old problems and rectifying many negative tendencies that had been developing, it implies making more accurate use of the system and mechanisms we have now, the economic management and planning system which, as we said at the enterprises meeting, has been a horse, a lame nag with many sores that we were treating with mercurochrome and medicines, putting splints on one leg. In short, fixing up the nag, the horse. I said that the thing to do now was to go on using that horse, knowing its bad habits, the perils of that horse, how it kicked and bucked, and try to lead it on our path and not go wherever it wishes to take us. I've said, let us take up the reins. These are very serious, complicated matters, we can't afford to take shots in the dark here, and there's no place for adventures of any kind. The experience of so many years that quite a few of us have had the privilege of accumulating through a revolutionary process is worth something. And that's why we say now, we cannot fulfill the plan as to value, we must fulfill it as to goods produced. We demand this categorically, and anyone who does otherwise must be sacked, because there's no other choice. We maintain that all projects must be started and finished quickly so that there is never a repeat of what happened to us on account of the nags bucking and kicking, that business of doing the earth moving and putting up a few foundations because that was worth a lot and then not finishing the building because that was worth little, that tendency to say, I fulfilled my plan as to value but I didn't finish a single building, which made us bury hundreds of millions, billions, and we never finished anything. It took 14 years to build a hotel. 14 years wasting iron bars, sand, stone, cement, rubber, fuel, labor power before the country made a single penny from the hotel being used. 11 years to finish our hospital here in Pina del Rio. It's true that in the end it was finished and it was finished well. But things of this sort should never happen again. The mini brigades, which were destroyed for the sake of such mechanisms, are now rising again from their ashes like a phoenix and demonstrating the significance of that mass movement, the significance of that revolutionary path of solving the problems that the theoreticians, technocrats, those who do not believe in human beings, and those who believe in two-bit capitalism had stopped and dismantled. This was how they were leading us into critical situations. In the capital, where the mini-brigades emerged, it pains us to think that over 15 years ago we had found an excellent solution to such a vital problem, and yet they were destroyed in their peak. And so we didn't even have the labor power to build housing in the capital, and the problems kept piling up, tens of thousands of homes were propped up and were in danger of collapsing and killing people. Now the mini-brigades have been reborn and there are more than 20,000 mini-brigade members in the capital. They're not in contradiction with the NAG with the economic management and planning system, simply because the factory or workplace that sends them to the construction site pays them, but the state reimburses the factory or workplace for the salary of the mini-brigade member. The difference is that whereas the worker would normally work 5 or 6 hours, on the mini-brigade he or she works 10, 11, or 12 hours doing the job of 2 or 3 people, and the enterprise saves money. Our two-bit capitalist can't say his enterprise is being ruined. On the contrary, 
he can say, they're helping the enterprise. I'm doing the job with 30, 40 or 50 less people and spending less on salaries. He can say, I'm going to be profitable or at least lose less money, I'll distribute more prizes and bonuses since salary expenditure will be cut down. He organizes production better, he gets housing for his workers, who in turn are happier because they have new housing. He builds community projects such as special schools, polyclinics, child care centers for the children of working women, for the family, in short, so many extremely useful things we are doing now and the state is building them without spending an additional cent in salaries. That really is miraculous. We could ask the two-bit capitalists and profiteers who have blind faith in the mechanisms and concepts of capitalism, could you achieve such a miracle? Could you manage to build 20,000 housing units in the capital without spending a cent more on salaries? Could you build 50 child care centers in a year without spending a cent more on salary, when only five had been planned in five years and they weren't even built and 19,500 mothers were waiting to get their children a place, which never materialized? It can be seen in the capital today that one in eight workers can be mobilized, I'm sure. This is not necessary because there would not be enough materials to give tasks to 100,000 people working in Havana, each one doing the work of three. We're seeing impressive examples of feats of work, and this is achieved by mass methods, by revolutionary methods, by communist methods, combining the interests of people in need with the interests of factories and those of society as a whole. I don't want to become the judge of different theories, although I have my own theories and know what things I believe in and what things I don't and can't believe in. These questions are discussed frequently in the world today. And I only ask modestly, during this process of rectification and at this 20th anniversary, that Che's economic thought be made known, that it be known here, in Latin America, in the world, in the developed capitalist world, in the third world, and in the socialist world. Let it be known there, too. In the same way that we read many texts, of all varieties, and many manuals, in the socialist camp, Che's economic thought should be known. Let it be known. I don't say they have to adopt it, we don't have to get involved in that. Everyone must adopt the thought, the theory, the thesis they consider most appropriate, that which best suits them, as judged by each country. I absolutely respect the right of every country to apply the method or systems it considers appropriate, I respect it completely. I simply ask that in a cultured country, in a cultured world, in a world where ideas are discussed, Che's economic theories should be made known. I especially ask that our students of economics, of whom we have many and who read all kinds of pamphlets, manuals, theories about capitalist systems and capitalist laws, also begin to study Che's economic thought, so as to enrich their knowledge. It would be a sign of ignorance to believe there is only one way of doing things, arising from the concrete experience of a specific time and specific historical circumstances. What I ask for, what I limit myself to asking for, is a little more knowledge, consisting of knowing about other points of view, points of view as respected, as deserving, and as coherent as Che's point of view. I can't conceive that our future economists, that our future generations will act, live, and develop like another animal species, in this case like the mule, who has those blinkers only so that it can't see to either side, mules, furthermore, with the carrot dangling in front as their only motivation. No, I would like them to read, not only to intoxicate themselves with certain ideas, but also to look at other ones, analyze them, and think about them. Because if we were talking with Che and we said to him, look, all this has happened to us, all those things I was talking about before, what happened to us in construction, in agriculture, in industry, what happened to variety, work quality, and all that, Che would have said, it's as I said, it's as I said. He'd have said, it's as I warned, what's happening is exactly what I thought would happen, because that's simply the way it is. I want our people to be a people of ideas, of concepts. I want them to analyze those ideas, think about them, and, if they want, 
discuss them. I consider these things to be essential. It might be that some of Che's ideas are closely linked to the initial stages of the revolution, like the one concerning his belief that when a quota was surpassed, the salary received should not go above that received by those on the scale immediately above, because he wanted the worker to study, and he associated his concept with the idea that people with a very poor education and little technical expertise should study. Today our people are much better educated, more cultured. We could discuss whether now they should earn as much as the next level or more. We could discuss questions associated with our reality of a far more educated people, a people far better prepared technically, although we must never give up the idea of constantly improving ourselves technically and educationally. But many of Che's ideas are absolutely relevant today, ideas without which I am convinced communism cannot be built, like the idea that human beings should not be corrupted, that they should never be alienated, the idea that without a consciousness, simply producing wealth, socialism as a superior society could not be built, and communism could never be built. I think that many of Che's ideas many of his ideas, have great relevance today. Had we known, had we learned about Che's economic thought, we'd be a hundred times more alert, even to ride the horse, and whenever the horse wanted to turn right or left, wherever it wanted to turn although, mind you, here this was without a doubt a right-wing horse we should have pulled it up hard and got it back on the track, and whenever it refused to move, use the spurs hard. I think a writer, that is to say, an economist, a party cotter, an administrative cotter, armed with Che's ideas would be better equipped to lead the horse along the right track. Just being familiar with Che's thought, just knowing his ideas would enable them to say, I'm doing badly here, I'm doing badly there, that's a consequence of this or the other, provided that the system and mechanisms for building socialism and communism are really being developed and improved. I say this because it is my deepest conviction that if we ignore his thought it will be difficult to get very far, to achieve real socialism, really revolutionary socialism, socialism with socialists, socialism and communism with communists. I'm absolutely convinced that ignoring those ideas would be a crime. That's what I'm putting to you. We have enough experience to know how to do things, and there are extremely valuable principles of immense worth in Che's ideas and thought that simply go beyond the image that many people have of Che as a brave, heroic, pure man, of Che as a saint because of his virtues, as a martyr because of his selflessness and heroism. Che was also a revolutionary, a thinker, a person of doctrine, a person of great ideas, who was capable with great consistency of working out instruments and principles that are unquestionably essential to the revolutionary path. Capitalists are very happy when they hear people talk about rent, profit, interest, bonuses, super bonuses, when they hear about markets, supply and demand as elements that regulate production and promote quality, efficiency, and all those things. They say, that's my kind of talk, that's my philosophy, that's my doctrine, and the emphasis that socialism may place on them makes them happy, for they know these are essential aspects of capitalist theory, laws, and terms. We ourselves are being criticized by quite a few capitalists, they try to make people think that the Cuban revolutionaries are unrealistic, that the thing to do is go for all the allures of capitalism, and then they aim their guns at us for that reason. We'll see how far we get, even riding on the old nag full of sores, but correctly led, for as long as we don't have anything better than the old nag. We'll see how far we get in the rectification process with the steps we're taking now. That's why on this, the 20th anniversary, I'm making an appeal for our party members, our youth, our students, our economists to study and familiarize themselves with Che's political and economic thought. Che is a figure with enormous prestige. Che is a figure whose influence will grow. Needless to say, those who feel frustrated or who dare to fight Che's ideas or use certain terms to describe Che or depict him as naive, as someone who is out of touch with reality, do not deserve any revolutionary's respect. That's why we want our youth to have that instrument, to wield that weapon, even if for the time being it only serves to say, don't follow that mistaken path foreseen by Che, 
even if it only serves to increase our knowledge, even if it only serves to force us to meditate or to delve deeper into our revolutionary thought. I sincerely believe that more than the ceremony, more than formal activities, more than all the honors, what we do is really the best homage we can pay Che. The work spirit that is starting to appear in so many places and that is evident in so many examples in this province, those workers in vinyls who are working 12 and 14 hours building many dams, starting them and finishing them one right after the other, and building them at half what they otherwise would have cost, to the extent that could be said in comparison with other projects. Were we to use a capitalist term although Che opposed even using capitalist terms when analyzing questions of socialism were we to use the term profitability, we could say that those workers on the mini dam construction brigade working in vinyls are more than 100% profitable. Che devoted absolute, total, priority attention to accounting, to analyzing expenditures and costs, cent by cent. Che could not conceive of building socialism and running the economy without proper organization, efficient control, and strict accounting of every cent. Che could not conceive of development without an increase in labor productivity. He even studied mathematics to use mathematical formulas for economic checks and to measure the efficiency of the economy. What's more, Che even dreamed of computers being used in running the economy as a key factor to measure efficiency under socialism. And those workers I mentioned have made a contribution, for every peso spent they produce two, for every million pesos spent they produce two million. They and those working on the Guama Dam, those working on the canal, those working on the thruway to Pina del Rio, those who are going to work on the Potate Dam, those who have started to work on roads and waterworks in the city there are a number of groups of workers who are undertaking real feats with pride, honor, discipline, loyalty to work. They are working with great productivity. Fortunately, during these years we have trained a large number of people with a high degree of technical knowledge and experience, university graduates, and intermediate level technicians. How does this compare to what we had in the early years of the revolution? When Che headed the Ministry of Industry, how many engineers did the country have, how many technicians, designers, researchers, scientists? Now we have about 20 times the number we had then, perhaps more. If he had been able to draw on the collective experience of all the cotters that we have now, who knows what he could have accomplished. Let's look at the medical sector alone. Back then we had 3,000 doctors and now we have 28,000. Each year our 21 medical schools graduate as many doctors as the total number in the country at that time. What a privilege. What a power. What force? As of next year we'll be graduating more doctors than those who stayed in the country in the early years. Can we or can we not do what we set our minds to in the field of public health? And what doctors they are? They work in the countryside, in the mountains, or in Nicaragua, Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Vietnam, Kampuchea, or the end of the world. Those are the doctors trained by the revolution. I'm sure Che would be proud, not of the shoddy things that have been done with such a two-bit profiteering mentality, he'd be proud of the knowledge and technology our people have, of our teachers who went to Nicaragua and the 100,000 who offered to go. He'd be proud of our doctors willing to go anywhere in the world, of our technicians, of our hundreds of thousands of compatriots who have been on internationalist missions. I'm sure Che would be proud of that spirit just like we all are, but what we have built with our heads and hearts cannot be destroyed with our feet. That's the point, that and the fact that with all the resources we have built up, with all that force, we should be able to advance and take advantage of all the potential opened up by socialism and the revolution to get people to move ahead. I would like to know if the capitalists have people like those I mentioned. They are extraordinary internationalists and workers, you have to talk to them to see how they think and feel, to see how deeply they love their work, and this is not because they're workaholics but because they feel the need to make up for lost time, time lost during the revolution, time lost during almost 60 years of neocolonial republic, time lost during centuries of colonialism. We must regain this time. And hard work is the only way, 
not waiting 100 years to build 100 child care centers in the capital when we can really do it in two, not waiting 100 years to build 350 all over the country when we can do it in three, not waiting 100 years to solve the housing problem when we can do it in a few years, our stones, our sand, our materials, our cement, even with our oil and steel produced by our workers. As I said this afternoon at the hospital ceremony, the year 2000 is just around the corner. We must set ourselves ambitious goals for the year 2000, not for the year 3000 or 2100 or 2050, and if someone suggests that we should, we must reply, that may suit you but not us. We have the historic mission of building a new country, a new society, the historic mission of making a revolution and developing a country, those of us who have had the honor and privilege of not just promoting development but promoting socialist development and working for a more humane and advanced society. To those who encourage laziness and frivolity we will say, we will live longer than you, not just better than you, or like we would live if everyone were like you. We will live longer than you and be healthier than you because with your laziness you will be sedentary and obese, you will have heart problems, circulatory ailments, and all sorts of other things, because work doesn't harm your health, work promotes health, work safeguards health, and work created humanity. These men and women doing great things must become models. We could say that they're being true to the motto, we will be like Che. They are working like Che worked or as Che would have worked. When we were discussing where the ceremony should be held, there were many possible places. It could have been in Revolution Plaza in the capital, it could have been in a province, it could have been in one of the many workplaces or factories that the workers wanted to name after Che. We gave the matter some thought and recalled this new and important factory, the pride of Pina del Rio, the pride of the country and an example of what can be done with progress, study, education in this province, which in the past was so neglected and backward and now has workers capable of running such a complex and sophisticated factory. We need only say that the rooms where the circuits are printed must be ten times cleaner than an operating room to meet the required standard. It was necessary to do such complex work, with such quality and good equipment, and Pina del Rio residents are doing it marvelously. When we toured it we were deeply impressed and we talked with many comrades, members of the Central Committee, about what you were doing in the factory, in the machine industry, which is advancing at a rapid pace, what was being done in construction. We realized the great future of this factory as a manufacturer of components, of vanguard technology, which will have a major impact on development and productivity, on the automation of production processes. When we toured your first-rate factory and saw the ideas you had which are being put into practice, we realized it will become a huge complex of many thousands of workers, the pride of the province and the pride of the country. In the next five years more than 100 million pesos will be invested in it to make it a real giant. When we learned that the workers wanted to name it after Che because he was so concerned with electronics, computers, and mathematics, the leadership of the party decided that this was where the ceremony marking the 20th anniversary of Che's death should be held, and that the factory should be given the glorious and beloved name of Echo Beto Che Guevara. I know that its workers, its young workers, its dozens and dozens of engineers, its hundreds of technicians will do honor to that name and work as they should. This doesn't mean being here 14, 12, or 10 hours, for often on certain jobs 8 hours of work well done is a real feat. We've seen comrades, especially many women workers, doing micro-soldering, which is really difficult work that requires tremendous rigor and concentration. We've seen them, and it's hard to imagine how they can spend 8 hours doing that work and turn out up to 5,000 units daily. Comrades, don't think that we feel that the way to solve problems is to work 12 or 14 hours a day. There are jobs where you can't work 12 or 14 hours. In some, even 8 can be too much. One day we hope that not all workdays will be the same. We hope that in certain fields if we have enough personnel, and we will if we employ them efficiently we can have six-hour workdays. What I mean to say is that being true to Che's example and name also means using the workday with the right pace, being concerned about high standards, 
having people do various tasks, avoiding overstaffing, working in an organized manner, and developing consciousness. I'm sure that the workers of this factory will be worthy of Che's name, just as I'm sure that this province was deserving of hosting the anniversary and will continue to be deserving. If there is something left to say tonight it's that despite our problems, despite the fact that we have less hard currency than ever before, for reasons we have explained in the past, despite the drought, despite the intensification of the imperialist blockade, as I see our people respond, as I see more and more possibilities open up, I feel confident, I feel optimistic, and I am absolutely convinced that we will do everything we set our minds to. We'll do it with the people, with the masses, we'll do it with the principles, pride and honor of each and every one of our party members, workers, youth, peasants, and intellectuals. I can proudly say that we are giving Che well-deserved tribute and honor, and if he lives more than ever, so will our homeland. If he is an opponent of imperialism more powerful than ever, our homeland will also be more powerful than ever against imperialism and its rotten ideology. And if one day we chose the path of revolution, of socialist revolution, and of communism, the path of building communism, today we are prouder to have chosen that path because it is the only one that can give rise to others like Che and a people composed of millions of men and women capable of being like Che. As Marty said, whereas there are people without dignity, there are people who carry inside them the dignity of many people. We might add that there are people who carry inside them the dignity of the world, and one of those is Che. Chapter 9 Interview with Tomasz Borga 1992 In a 1992 interview with Nicaragua's Tomasz Borga, published in the book Face to Face with Fidel Castro, Ocean Press, 1993, Fidel Castro was asked why there had been a revival of interest in Che's writing in Cuba. The Cuban leader observed. We have always paid a lot of attention to Che's thinking in Cuba. I myself have kept his thinking increasingly in mind, ever since we began our process of rectification, long before all those problems arose in the socialist camp and perestroika appeared on the horizon. I remember that we were observing an anniversary of Che's death I think it was the 20th anniversary and I spoke at length about Che and all these matters. My admiration and fellow feeling for Che have grown as I have seen what has happened in the socialist camp, because he was categorically opposed to the use of capitalist methods for the construction of socialism. One of our comrades, an economist, gathered together all of the ideas Che set forth in this regard in his writings and speeches, and he compiled and arranged them. They are of enormous value and should be studied, because I think that the use of those capitalist methods and concepts had an alienating influence in the socialist countries. You were asking about what caused the failure of socialism in those countries. I think that Che had a prophetic vision when, as early as the first few years of the 1960s, he foresaw all of the drawbacks and consequences of the method that was being used to construct socialism in Eastern Europe. He said there was no need to resort to those methods and to that capitalist philosophy. At one time, we began to use economic planning and management methods that were copied from the European socialist experience. Those concepts began to prevail because of the enormous prestige the Soviet Union and the other socialist countries had in Cuba and because of the ideological mistakes we made in the first few years of the revolution. This created a culture favorable to the appearance and application in Cuba of the methods for the construction of socialism that were being applied in the Soviet Union and other socialist countries. I have always made a distinction between the Soviet Union and the other countries, because socialism wasn't built exclusively with those methods in the Soviet Union. I'm referring mainly to the smaller countries in the socialist camp, because the development programs in the Soviet Union were very powerful, and the main decisions that made the Soviet Union's great economic growth possible weren't associated with income yield capacity in the capitalist sense or any other such concepts. That philosophy was applied in our country. After 10 or 11 years, while we were waiting to see its results, so many deformations and deviations occurred that I had to stop and think and constantly remember Che and his premonition, his rejection of those methods for socialist construction. 
I think that what has happened in the socialist camp makes Che's economic thinking on the construction of socialism more timely than ever. When the process of rectification was begun, I encouraged the printing of those books on Che and spread Che's economic thinking but not for use as a manual, as something infallible, because you shouldn't take any school of political thought or the thinking of any theoretician or politician as something inflexible, as something dogmatic. All my life, I've been the enemy of dogma. We should keep the thinking of the most illustrious politicians and of the most outstanding revolutionaries from becoming dogma, for all thinking corresponds to a given moment, circumstances, the amount of available information, or experience. Thus, things that Lenin may have viewed at one time as correct formulas for dealing with a given circumstance may not be applicable in other, different circumstances or in different times. The ideas of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Che aren't dogma they are brilliant samples of talent and of political, social, and revolutionary vision created at a certain time. They are always applicable as long as you don't consider them immutable dogma, to do so would be to take them out of the scientific, political, revolutionary context and make them a matter of religion. I tried to spread Che's ideas widely when we saw that the Soviet Union and the rest of the socialist camp were taking a different path, that led them farther and farther away from Che's thinking, when they were heading toward ever greater use of the systems and mechanisms of capitalism. In their efforts to improve socialism, they were using larger and larger amounts of the poison that was killing socialism. That's one of the causes of what happened in the socialist camp. Chapter 10 on the return of Che's remains to Cuba. October 17, 1997 In July 1997 the remains of Che Guevara and his companeros killed in combat were discovered in Bolivia and returned to Cuba. Fidel Castro gave the following memorial speech in Santa Clara, Cuba. With profound emotion we experience one of those moments that will never again be repeated. We are not here to say farewell to Che and his heroic companeros. We are here to welcome them. I see Che and his men as reinforcements, as a movement of invincible combatants, which on this occasion not only includes Cubans, but also Latin Americans who came to fight with us and write new pages of history and glory. I also see Che as a moral giant who grows with each passing day, whose image, strength, and influence have multiplied throughout the earth. How can he fit beneath a memorial stone? How can he fit into this square? How can he fit into our beloved, but small, island? Only in the world that he dreamed of, which he lived and fought for, is there enough space for him. The greater the injustice, the greater the exploitation, the greater the inequality, the greater the unemployment, the greater the poverty, hunger and misery that prevail in human society, the greater his figure will be. The values he defended will appear more elevated in the face of growing imperialist power, hegemony, domination, and interventionism that deny the most sacred rights of humanity, particularly the rights of the weak, underdeveloped, and poor peoples in what were for centuries colonies of the West and sources of slave labor. His profound humanism will always stand in stark contrast to growing abuse, egotism, alienation, discrimination against indigenous peoples, ethnic minorities, women, and immigrants. It will stand against child labor and the sexual commodification of hundreds of thousands of children. It will stand against ignorance, disease, unemployment, and insecurity. His example as an upright, revolutionary, and principled man will be ever more outstanding, as long as corrupt politicians, demagogues, and hypocrites exist everywhere. Admiration for his personal bravery and revolutionary integrity will grow as long as the numbers of cowards, opportunists, and traitors on earth increase. While others flinch from their duty, the greater will be the respect for his iron will. The more people lacking integrity, the greater his sense of honor and dignity, the more skeptics there are, the greater his faith in humanity, the more pessimists there are, the greater his optimism, the more fear there is, the greater his daring, the more idlers there are who waste the products of the labor of others in luxury and leisure, the greater his austerity and his spirit of work and study. Che was a true communist and is today an example and a paradigm of the revolutionary and the communist. Che was a teacher who forged men and women like himself. 
consistent with his actions, he never failed to do what he preached, or demand of himself what he demanded of others. Whenever a volunteer was required for a difficult mission, he was the first in line, both in war and in peace. His great dreams depended on his willingness to give his life generously. Nothing was impossible for him, and he was capable of making the impossible possible. The invasion from the Sierra Maestra through vast and unprotected plains and the capture of the city of Santa Clara with just a few men are among those feats that show his amazing capabilities. His ideas on revolution in his own country and in the rest of Latin America, in spite of enormous difficulties, were possible. Had he made them a reality, perhaps today the world might be different. Vietnam proved it could fight against the interventionist forces of imperialism and defeat them. The Sandinistas triumphed against one of the most powerful puppet governments of the United States. The Salvadoran revolutionaries were just about to win victory. In southern Africa, apartheid was defeated in spite of the state possessing nuclear weapons. China, thanks to the heroic struggle of its workers and peasant farmers, is today one of the most promising countries in the world. Hong Kong was returned after 150 years of an occupation established through the Opium Wars. Not all historical eras or circumstances require the same methods and the same tactics. But nothing can stop the march of history, its objective laws are immutable. Che based himself on these social laws and had an absolute faith in humanity. Very often revolutionaries and those seeking profound social change do not have the privilege of seeing their dreams realized as quickly as they had hoped or desired, but sooner or later they are victorious. A combatant may die, but not their ideas. What was a man from the US government doing up there where Che was wounded and taken prisoner? How could they believe that by killing Che he would cease to exist as a combatant? Now, he is not in La Higuera, instead he is everywhere wherever there is a just cause to defend. Those who wanted to kill him, to make him disappear, were not able to understand that he would leave an indelible footprint in history and that his luminous prophet's gaze would transform him into a symbol for all the earth's poor in their millions upon millions. Young people, children, the elderly, men and women who have learned about him, honest people throughout the world, regardless of their social background, admire him. Che is taking up and winning more battles than ever. Thank you, Che, for your history, your life, and your example. Thank you for coming to fortify us in this difficult battle we are engaged in today to save the ideas you fought so hard for, to save the revolution, our country, and the achievements of socialism, where some of the great dreams you cherished have come true. To carry forward this heroic achievement, to defeat the imperialists' plans against Cuba, to resist the blockade, to achieve victory, we count on you. As you can see, this land is your land, these people are your people, and this revolution is your revolution. We continue to fly the socialist banner with honor and pride. Welcome, heroic companeros of the reinforcement. The trenches of ideas and justice that you defend together with our people will never be conquered by the enemy. And together we will continue to fight for a better world. Hasta la victoria siempre. Ever onward to victory. Chapter 11 An Extraordinary Personality Argentina 2003 Fidel Castro visited Argentina in May 2003 and spoke at the law school at the University of Buenos Aires. Initially scheduled to be in an auditorium, Fidel Castro spoke before tens of thousands of students and others who had gathered at the university. This is an excerpt of the May 26, 2003, speech at the university and is response to calls from the audience that he speak about Che Guevara, one of Argentina's most famous sons. I have been asked to speak about Che. I cannot speak at length here, it would not make sense under these circumstances, but I can say a few things. I spoke about him this morning in front of the statue of San Martín, and I will remember him always as one of the most extraordinary personalities I have ever met. Che did not join our troop as a soldier, he was a doctor. He was in Mexico by chance. He had been to Guatemala, and had traveled through many places in the Americas. He had been in mining areas, where the work is very hard. 
he had even been in the Amazon, working as a doctor in a leprosy hospital. I will discuss one of Che's characteristics, one of those that I admired the most, of the many that I much admired. Every weekend, Che tried to climb to the top of Popocatapetl, a volcano on the outskirts of Mexico City. He would get his gear together it is a very high mountain, capped with snow year-round start climbing, make a colossal effort, and never reach the top. His asthma always kept him from making it. The following week he would once again try to climb to the top of Popo, as he called it, and would not make it. But he would keep going back to try again, as if he could spend his entire life trying to climb Popocatapetl, even if he never reached the peak. This gives you an idea of his determination, his spiritual strength, his perseverance, which was one of the characteristics I most admired in him. The other was that whenever a volunteer was needed to carry out any particular task, back when we were still a very small group, Che was always the first person to step forward. As a doctor, he stayed with the sick and wounded. In certain circumstances, when we were in the open air and being pursued from different directions, the main force would have to keep moving, leaving a visible trail so that the doctor could stay behind with those he was carrying for somewhere nearby. There was a time when Che was the only doctor, until other doctors came forward to join us, so there he was. Since you are asking for anecdotes, I remember an action that was extremely hazardous for everyone involved. News of a landing on the north coast of the province had reached us where we were gathered in the mountains. We recalled the ordeals and suffering we went through in the first days after our own landing, and as an act of solidarity with those who had just landed, we decided to undertake a rather daring action. From a military point of view, it was not a wise decision, to attack a unit that was well entrenched on the coast. I will not go into the details. As a result of that battle, which lasted three hours we were really quite lucky and had managed to cut off communications but after three hours, during which, as usual, Che had shown exemplary conduct, a third of the participants in the fighting were either dead or wounded. This was highly unusual. So he, as a doctor, attended to the enemy's wounded. There were enemy soldiers who were not wounded, but there was a large number who were, and he attended to them along with our own comrades. You cannot imagine that man's sensitivity. I remember that one of our comrades was fatally wounded, and Che knew it. We had to get out of the area quickly, immediately, because we did not know when the first planes would start to arrive. Miraculously, none had showed up during the battle, although the first ones usually arrived within 20 minutes. Luckily, we had managed to wipe out their communications with a few well-aimed shots. We had gained some extra time, but we needed to attend to the wounded and withdraw right away. He told me about this later and I will never forget it. One of our comrades was inevitably going to die. He could not be moved. Sometimes when fighters are seriously wounded, they cannot be moved, and you simply have to trust in the fact that you have treated the enemies wounded, you may have taken a number of prisoners and you have always treated them with respect. There was never a single case, ever, of a prisoner taken in combat being mistreated or executed. We sometimes gave them our own medicines, which were extremely scarce. This policy, truly, contributed a great deal to our success in the war, because in any struggle, you must earn the respect of the enemy. In any struggle I will repeat it again those who defend a good cause must behave in such a way as would allow them to earn the respect of the enemy. On that occasion, we had to leave behind a number of wounded comrades who could not be evacuated, and some were very seriously wounded. What struck me most was what Che told me later, with great sadness, that when he realized this one companero had no hope of surviving, he bent down and kissed him on the forehead. These are some of the things I can tell you about Che as a man, as an extraordinary human being. He was, as well, an extraordinarily cultured man, a man of great talent. I have already spoken of his persistence, his determination. After the triumph of the revolution, he was more than willing to accept any task assigned to him. He was director of the National Bank of Cuba, 
where a true revolutionary was needed at that moment and at any other moment, of course but the revolution had just triumphed, and its resources were very scant since the country's reserves had been stolen. Our enemies joked about it, they always make jokes, and we make jokes as well. According to this particular joke, which had a political intent, I announced one day, we need an economist, and Che raised his hand, but it turned out he had misheard me. He thought I'd said we needed a communist, and that is why he ended up being chosen. Well, Che was a revolutionary, a communist, and an excellent economist. Being an excellent economist depends on what you believe should be done by the person in charge of a sphere of the country's economy, in this case the National Bank of Cuba, and Che did it as both a communist and an economist. It is not that he had a degree, but rather that he had read a lot and observed a lot. It was Che who promoted the idea of voluntary work in our country, he himself went out to do voluntary work every Sunday. One day he would do farm work, another day he would test out new machinery, another day he would do construction work. He left us this legacy of a practice that millions of Cubans came to adopt, following his example. He left us so many memories, and that is why I say that he is one of the most noble, extraordinary, and selfless people I have ever met. This would be of no significance if I did not believe that there are millions and millions and millions of people like him among the masses. Glossary Acevedo, Rogelio Served as a member of the commission to perpetuate the memory of Commander Ecobedo Guevara. Currently a member of the Central Committee. Acuna, Juan Vitalio, Joaquim, 1925-67. Veteran of the Cuban Revolutionary War. Member of the Central Committee. A leading member of Guevara's detachment in Bolivia, after April 17, 1967, he led the column separated from the main unit. Killed in an ambush on August 31, 1967. Almeida, Juan, 1927. Participant in the 1953 Moncada attack and subsequently imprisoned. A Granma expeditionary and commander in the rebel army. Currently a member of the Central Committee and Political Bureau of the Cuban Communist Party. Headed the commission to perpetuate the memory of Commander Ecobedo Guevara. Arbenz, Jacobo, 1914-71. Democratically elected President of Guatemala, 1951-54. Overthrown by a CIA-backed coup in 1954. Barrientos, René, 1919-69. A Bolivian general and leader of the November 1964 military coup. President from July 1966 until his death in a helicopter crash. Known for his authoritarian tendencies, his special relations with the rural sector through what was known as the Military Peasant Pact, and his pro-us positions. Batista, Fulgencio, 1901-73. An army sergeant who seized control of the Cuban government in 1934. Left office in 1944, and on March 10, 1952, led a military coup which overthrew the government of Carlos Prio Socaraz. Ruled as dictator until January 1, 1959, when he fled Cuba. Bay of Pigs. C. Playa Geron. Bolivar, Simon, 1783-1830. Led an armed rebellion that helped win independence from Spain for much of Latin America, known as the Liberator. Bunk Bider, Haiti Tamira, Tanya, 1937-67. Born in Argentina and raised in the German Democratic Republic. Traveled to Cuba as a translator in 1961. Went to Bolivia as an underground combatant to infiltrate the higher echelons of the Bolivian government. Forced to join the guerrilla force after she was identified. Assigned to the rear guard, she was killed in an ambush on August 31, 1967. Camano, Francisco, 1932-73. A colonel in the Dominican Republic Armed Forces. A central figure in the April 1965 Constitutional Revolution, leading the resistance to invading U.S. troops. Subsequently went into exile in Cuba. 
led a guerrilla expedition to the Dominican Republic in 1973, but was captured shortly after and murdered by government troops. Castro, Fidel, 1926. See pages 11-12. Castro, Raul, 1931. A participant in the 1953 Moncada attack and subsequently imprisoned. A Granma expeditionary and commander of the Rebel Army's Second Eastern Front. Minister of the Cuban Armed Forces from 1959 until the present, and Vice Premier 1959-76. Second Secretary of the Cuban Communist Party since 1965. First Vice President of the Council of State and Council of Ministers from 1976 to February 2008 when he replaced Fidel Castro as President. Central Planning Board Founded in March 1960 as the state institution responsible for coordinating the Cuban economy. Cienfuegos, Camillo, 1932-59 A member of the Granma Expedition Commander of the Antonio Masio Column No. 2. Became a commander of the Rebel Army in January 1959. Killed in a plane accident on October 28, 1959. Debray, Regis. French left-wing intellectual who participated in preparations for guerrilla warfare in Bolivia. Met with Che Guevara in March 1967, who entrusted him with several overseas missions. Captured in Bolivia on April 20, 1967, and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Pardoned in 1970, he later became a prominent figure in the French Socialist Party. Granma The cabin cruiser used by revolutionaries to travel from Mexico to Cuba, November, December 1956. Taken as the name of the daily newspaper of the Cuban Communist Party in 1965. Guevara, Echo Bedoche, 1928-67. See pages 7-9. Guevara, Moises, 1939-67. A Bolivian miners' leader. Left the Bolivian Communist Party and joined the rival party led by Oscar Zamora. Left that group and joined Guevara's guerrilla column. Killed in an ambush on August 31, 1967. Hernandez, Melba, 1922. A lawyer who participated in the 1953 Moncada attack and was subsequently imprisoned. A member of the national leadership of the July 26th movement and a leader of the underground movement. Subsequently joined the rebel army in the Sierra Maestra. Founder and president of committee in solidarity with Vietnam and the peoples of Indochina. A member of Central Committee of Communist Party of Cuba. INRA. See National Institute of Agrarian Reform. July 26 Movement. Founded in 1955 by Fidel Castro and other revolutionaries, and the leading organization in the Cuban Revolution. Fused with two other groups in 1961 to form what would eventually become the Cuban Communist Party. Col. Jorge. Leader of Bolivian Communist Party. Replaced Monje as General Secretary in December 1967. Lumumba, Patrice, 1925-61. Founder and President of the Congolese National Movement. First Prime Minister of the Congo after independence from Belgium in June 1960. Overthrown and imprisoned three months later in a Usbak coup. Murdered by his captors in February 1961. Masio, Antonio. 1845 to 96 prominent military leader and strategist in the three cuban independence wars opposed the 1878 treaty that ended the first war led a march from the east to the west of the island in 1895 to 96 killed in battle march alita 1934 member of july 26th movement underground Subsequently joined Guevara's rebel army column. Married Che Guevara in 1959. Marty, Jose, 1853-95. Cuban national hero. Noted poet, writer, speaker, and journalist. 
founded the Cuban Revolutionary Party in 1892 to fight Spanish rule and oppose U.S. plans. Launched the 1895 Independence War. Killed in battle. Massetti, Jorge Ricardo, 1929-64. The first Latin American journalist to interview Fidel Castro and Che Guevara in the Sierra Maestra. Founder and first director of the Prensa Latina News Agency. Killed in combat on April 21, 1964, in Argentina. Mottos, Huber, 1919. Commander in the Rebel Army. Attempted to organize a counter-revolutionary rebellion in Camagüey province in October 1959. Arrested and imprisoned until 1979. Mela, Julio Antonio, 1903-29. A leader of the university reform movement in 1923. A founding leader of first Cuban Communist Party in 1925. Assassinated in Mexico by agents of Cuba's Machado dictatorship. Moncada Garrison. A former army garrison in Santiago de Cuba. Attacked by Fidel Castro and over 100 revolutionaries on July 26, 1953. Dozens of revolutionaries captured in the attack were subsequently assassinated. Castro was captured and imprisoned. The attack has come to mark the beginning of revolutionary struggle against Batista. Monje, Mario. General Secretary of the Bolivian Communist Party until December 1967, subsequently a leading member of its Central Committee. Met with Che Guevara in Bolivia on December 31, 1966 and told him that the political leadership of the struggle belonged to the leader of the Bolivian Communist Party as long as the revolution took place on Bolivian soil, an argument not accepted by Che. From that moment, a split occurred between the PCB and the guerrilla force. Montaigne Aropsa, Jesus, 1923-99 Born in Nueva Gerona on the Isle of Pines. A leader of the 1953 attack on the Moncada garrison, after which he was arrested and tried. Exiled to Mexico, he joined the Granma expedition. Taken prisoner on December 12, 1956, he remained in prison until after the triumph of the revolution. National Institute of Agrarian Reform, INRA. Created on May 17, 1959, to implement the agrarian reform law. Also coordinated Cuban factory production until the formation of the Ministry of Industry in 1961. Dissolved in 1976. Ovando, Alfredo, 1918-82. A Bolivian general who helped lead the November 1964 coup. Bolivian president from 1965-66 and 1969-70. As army commander he led the military campaign against Che Guevara. Peredu, Coco, 1938-67. Member of the Bolivian Communist Party who joined Guevara's guerrilla detachment. Killed on September 26, 1967. Peredu, Inti, 1937-69. Member of the Bolivian Communist Party. A survivor of Guevara's guerrilla detachment, he continued guerrilla activity. Assassinated in La Paz, on September 9, 1969. Playa Giron. Beach near the Bay of Pigs where the last of 1,500 mercenary troops invading Cuba surrendered on April 19, 1961. Cubans use this name to refer to the entire battle. Prado, Gary. Bolivian captain and head of the Ranger unit that captured Guevara. He later became a general and wrote his memoir, How I Captured Che. Rebel Army. The armed force of the July 26 movement in the Revolutionary War against Batista. Became the Revolutionary Armed Forces in 1959. Reyes, Simon. Leader of Bolivian Communist Party and Mine Workers Union. Later became General Secretary of the Party. Rojas, Honorado. A Bolivian peasant visited by the guerrillas. Led the army to the ambush site where Joaquim's group was annihilated. Executed in reprisal by the guerrillas in 1969. Sanchez, Antonio, Marcos, 
1927-67. A veteran of the Cuban Revolutionary War and a member of the Central Committee. A member of Guevara's guerrilla detachment in Bolivia. Killed in ambush on June 2, 1967. Sown me a lot, Gaston Emil. Minister of Defense and head of the army in the Congo People's Republic, the rebel government set up 1964 in Stanleyville by followers of Lumumba, which was defeated by Belgian troops and foreign mercenaries. Assisted by Che Guevara and Cuban internationalist fighters. Valdez, Ramiro, 1932. Participated in the attack on the Moncada garrison, after which he was arrested and tried. Exiled to Mexico, he became a member of the Granma expedition. When Che Guevara went to lead column number 8 in Minas del Frio he became head of column number 4. Currently a commander of the revolution. Zamora, Oscar. Led a split from the Bolivian Communist Party in 1965. General Secretary of the rival Communist Party. Zayas, Alfonso. Member of the Commission to Perpetuate the Memory of Commander Ecobedo Guevara. A member of the Central Committee for many years. Zentino, Joaquim. Bolivian Colonel and Commander of the 8th Division that fought Guevara's detachment.